Cool. And I do think we're live. I see one, two, three, four uh, ticks. And yes, we are good to go. Um, I'm quickly going to fire up the uh, Twitch on the side here. Just yeah, me as well. So I can um, see it all. Hello and good morning. Uh, yes. It's running live. Let me switch into mod mode. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, oh, I need to plug in my light. Okay. We've got all these things ready. Yeah, this is a little bit earlier than normal for us for streaming. Um, <laughs> a little bit. We normally start at 11, <laughs> but uh, uh, welcome, uh, Ganesh. Uh, Ganesh. Happy to morning. see you here as a nice earlier joiner. Um, yes, so for those that are joining us today, um, what we're going to be doing is we have, and that's why I'm wearing the nice little Ask Me t-shirt from uh, uh, one of our summits, um, is we are doing a four-hour long Q&A stream similar to the office hours and similar to the AMA that we are running. Yeah. Um, in as per usual per week. The reason for this is that we had our um, dev day yesterday on modern application development and the office hour sessions had a very large number of people with a very large number of questions and we knew that we weren't going to be able to get all, to all of them. So today's session is all about answering the questions and what we're going to be doing is we'll have different uh, developer advocates drop into the stream um, during today. So we're going to start now and we're going to continue for the next four hours, I believe. Four or five. I can't remember exactly how long we should. But also, we'll we'll take a look at how, how many questions come in up yeah. um, during that time. So, Darko, you definitely have at least one question ready, I believe. I do. But and I, just I think. Wanna... Yeah, I just want to first welcome all the people who have joined, and oh. if, they're, if they have not joined for the, if this is the first time you're seeing us oh, on yes. Twitch, um, I think it would be cool oh, that sorry, we introduce. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> We're used to doing this stream, so we kind of don't don't introduce ourselves because we have mm -hmm. a fixed time slot every Friday. But uh, since there might be uh, some new people here, um, just to introduce ourselves, um, my name is Darko. Uh, I'm a developer advocate uh, at AWS. Uh, you may have seen both of us yesterday during the dev day. Um, we were uh, number one on the Q&A, but we also had uh, uh, a few talks each. So, uh, yeah, I'm based in Berlin. I'm originally from Serbia. I've uh, been working for AWS for, for five years now. Yeah, so um, oh, wow. a long time. Kogos, introduce yourself. Yes. Awesome. I am known as not Darko. Um, <laughs> people actually confuse us on a regular basis, even oh, inside yeah. our own teams. It's, it's, it's quite entertaining. Um, and I am also a developer advocate, and I have been with AWS uh, about almost oh, it'll be two years in January. Um, two years. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so I've been here for a while. And uh, also, before that, uh, software developer as well as uh, what DevOps. And we can dig into that at some future point again. I always put it in quotes because, yes, I was not only a DevOps engineer. I also had the title of DevOps team lead at one point. Um, so longer discussion that we might touch on today, but we will see. Cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I am based out of Cape Town, all the way down cool. to South Africa, which is why um, I had to get an aircon installed because summer is hitting us and my office is not uh, insulated. Oh, wow. There we go. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, yeah, so summer is coming up. Uh, uh, luckily for me in Berlin, we're getting winter in. So um, I'm, I'm very um, grateful for that because <laughs> <laughs> in the summer for me, especially doing streams, especially in front of these lights in front of me, it's not the best experience in the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so by the way, just to ask the chat, uh, if you guys uh, can comment on the audio setup, because uh, I, I, I think we are okay. We have not changed anything since yesterday. So, yeah. uh, but do let us know if, if you if you hear some differences between Cobus's sound and uh, Cobus's sound and my sound as well. So, and also uh, because this is a long ass stream, coffee. Uh, I've actually brewed oh. a pot of coffee for myself, um, and I am, I'm gonna here. I'm gonna pour it like ASMR here. So, see, okay. Oh, oh, nice. Oh, mm, nice. Mm, oh, that mm, sound. Mm, 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 mm. So uh, here is the first beverage, a nice cup of tea. Here is tea. the second beverage a tech uh, summit uh, cup of coffee which i'll probably drink first uh -huh. and then i have a big ass bottle of sparkly water ready because oh, yeah. i found that i couldn't bring my coffee machine into my office um uh -huh. the reason is that um when the process of modernizing our house and we actually have a new uh, well it's not that new but newish plug standard it looks like the european um hex that you get on the chargers do you know the oh, really? two pin yeah it's our, our one has got a third one in the top middle which is a uh, ground Oh, it's like like, the, like, the, like the Italian one, right? It, I think Italians have mm. the, the middle one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, but in any case, so the thing is, I realized that none of my multi plugs in my room have that plug, so I couldn't bring my coffee machine in here. So I'm very dependent on that. But yeah. Um, uh, I went full on hipster mode when, when it comes to my coffee. I've, um, I've ground my coffee manually with a hand grinder and uh, made it in this, um, well, 
coffee uh, mocha thing, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. All right. Well, the so, thing is, remember, you do have to drop two tears in there because it has to be a, 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 of joy, obviously. Okay. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> but cool. it, it is good. It's good, it's good coffee, um, for sure. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tyler Tail Kerr, uh, for confirming the audio is good. And I think let's dig into the questions. Um, yeah. So actually, let, let me try to find a question because so here's the thing, how, how it happened, a little sneak peek behind yesterday. So um, you who have attended the Dev Day yesterday um, have basically... Um, bombarded the questions in the Q and A section um, of the of the of the actual presentation, and those questions were collected, and then we got those questions presented later on, <laughs> in the hope that we're going to answer them all during the Q and A. The thing is, during the Q and A, so many people showed up at the Q and A that uh, uh, we got um, a lot of folks ans asking questions directly there, so we couldn't answer them all, right? Mm. So. Um, Right now, I'm going to try to go through a list of questions we had yesterday. But that being said, feel feel free to ask us any questions um, during the stream. And also, because this is going to be a long stream, feel free to jump off and jump, come back come back later on. Um, it's it, it's going to last until uh, 1 p.m. CEST, which is um, you know, four hours from now. So it uh, uh, should, be, should be a marathon uh, type thing we're going to uh, do it. So uh, just to kind of set the stage here, um, I've delivered two sessions yesterday. Uh, one session was on topic of AWS developer tools or a deep dive on AWS developer tools. And the other topic was on uh, CDK or infrastructure as code. So um, um, I'm mostly uh, confident talking about those things, but we're going to try to answer most of the questions um, um, you all had during the, during the entire event. So stand by. All right, let's... Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. And just quickly then on that, so my one yesterday was on cost optimization for um, your container clusters. If you're using ECS with EC2 hosts or if you were using AWS Fargate. So, yeah. um, and basically uh, all the fun things around how to, um, sorry, I just had an echo there that threw me off, um, around how you can use spot instances and also how to use spot while not um, losing your service if for whatever reason the spot instances are terminated because that's how spot operates. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's a, that's a very that's a that's a very interesting talk. I mean, it doesn't have the the flashiest name of them, but it is definitely very important uh, that you mm. can optimize your cost because one of the one of the talking points of uh, of yesterday's session was actually um, let me try to do something here it was actually uh, ooh, can I can I make this was does this work it doesn't work yes ah. <laughs> <laughs> able to change the slides back, yeah. So it says it, it, you cannot see it here, but it says reduced cost. So cost optimization yes. is very important in, in in your modern application mm -hmm. that you actually reduce the cost of, of running your application. So yeah. anyway, um, let's kind of go through a bunch of questions we had, um, and 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 we'll try to elaborate it. We'll try to be entertaining. Uh, and again, feel free to ask questions. And you know, before we start, I see that Vijay uh, here has a question. Um, um, first of all, I'm sorry. Uh, he says, hi, I lost my job. I'm, I'm really sorry that happened. Yeah. Um, uh, if I want to pursue a career in the DevOps ecosystem, hmm, DevOps, um, uh, what should be my learning cur curve? For Vijay, my first question to you is like, what, what is, what, what did you do before? Well, before you lost your job, uh, was it in this, in, in, in the same technology sphere or what, um, um, you know, getting, getting a feel of what you are currently doing and what you know, may be able to tell us, hey, maybe you should focus on that or that. Right? Because uh, saying mm. an AWS DevOps ecosystem is uh, uh, is a lot. <laughs> a lot of things can be part of DevOps <laughs> or, or the DevOps working, uh, working mm. principles. I mean, and while we're doing that is what I do want to do is I'll throw out this link quickly for him is that we do have a campaign running at the moment around getting certified, which uh, we have got all the training materials for the um, cloud practitioner or the certified yeah. cloud practitioner exam available as well as a mock exam. So um, there's a lot of resources available that you can um, start off with by looking at uh, that link that I just posted yeah. over there. Certification yeah. is definitely one thing that can help you move forward because not just because of certifications. Yeah, certificates are great and, and you can show, demonstrate that you have knowledge and all that stuff. But uh, preparing for a certification is something that, at least for me, when I was doing my certification was so great because you get to learn so many things, um, especially all of us live in our little bubble, especially with tech, you know. I just work with a set amount of technology and that's it. And uh, everything above that is something I don't touch. And when you learn for a certification, 
something like this, it helps you touch more things. So um, it helps broaden your spectrum. Okay. Uh, so, um, Vijay, do let us know throughout the chat um, if, if you want. Um, we'll be happy to comment on things. Cool. All right. Okay. Um, uh, let's start with the questions. Let's start with the questions. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me see. Okay, first question. Okay, I, I, I uh, let me talk first about, about my presentation because I think it makes sense for me to talk about my presentation first. So, I, I will just kind of give you a, a... Because I'm going to be answering those questions first. So, just to give you a... a, a a, a really short um, overview of what I did. It was a talk about database developer tools. The title was Deep Dive into Developer Tools. The title was a bit misleading because um, you cannot deep dive into all AWS developer tools in 30 minutes. So it was a more focus around the, um, the tooling uh, that can help you build better applications on AWS. So tooling such as uh, AWS Toolkit for, for your um, text editor, uh, and for example, um, AWS Power Tools for Lambda for making observability better, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and one of the questions I got the most, it's weirdly enough, um, I got questions both, I got that question both on, on, on during the setup, and I got the question after through LinkedIn and Twitter is like, what color scheme are you using on Vim? Uh, so uh, to te to, <laughs> to set those things apart, I actually I, I, I publicly made my uh, NeoVim uh, dot files available. So if you are interested in my NeoVim dot files and how I configured my Vim, uh, it's all available just there. So um, <laughs> you can check it out. So and that is one thing. Okay, so uh, let's go through the questions. Um, the, the, the first question I got was, what tools were you showing in the demo? So uh, my demo was actually focused around showing the AWS Toolkit um, on, AWS, on, on uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code. So the AWS Toolkit is a, is, a, is a lovely set of tools and utilities, or just basically a plugin for your, for your uh, IDE, in this case, a text editor, um, to, to kind of um, augment it to work better with AWS. So it gives you the ability to... Um, um, I don't know, show CloudFormation stacks or show CDK um, outlines or uh, even debug. Well, the thing I actually demonstrated is like debugging a Lambda functions or Lambda serverless applications. So uh, AWS Toolkit is a great tool that can help you basically work um, much easier with uh, with AWS you know, from, from building step functions and to, to debugging Lambda functions. Um, I also showed Cloud9. Cloud9 is the online ID of choice. So that is a very, very cool. Um, so, uh, and also what did I show? I, I did show uh, AWS Power Tools for Lambda. Those tools I'll, I played around with. And yeah, I, dem I, 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 I gave a glimpse of Code Guru, and that's about it. Cool. Um, just quickly taking a question off this one here before we dive into, I think your one is just quickly, um, yes, uh, Garuna M6, this is definitely the right place to ask questions. This is a general Q&A. &A. Uh, primarily yeah. to help with the overflow from yesterday. So we're going to be running through some questions from yesterday. So I think Darko's got the first question ready for that. But do post your question in the chat, and then we'll get to it. We are here for the next four hours. Um, so please, throw questions at us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so um, one second. Let me try to find... Yeah, I'm also quickly trying to load my sheet with the questions. Um, um, well, there's a lot of questions coming in. I mean, we're going to be oh, trying yeah. to answer most of them. Uh, you know... Well, at least the interesting ones. So, uh, if if you if you have asked a question and your question has not been answered, let us know. Uh, so, uh, one of the questions I got also regarding Power Tools for um, Lambda is that uh, is it available for JavaScript? Um, um, uh, currently, there's a there's a there's a focus on expanding it to different languages. Currently, Power Tools for Lambda are only available for Python. So, your Lambda functions written in Python. Um, but there's an, a currently uh, working on to expanding it to uh, Java, .NET, and JavaScript, and all the things. So um, again, there's a lot of tools that are open source on AWS. You can contribute yourself to this one, absolutely. Uh, but also, you can um, you can um, well just follow along with the roadmap and see see if it if it comes in. All right, <laughs> there was a there was a question. Um, about the things is, this is more mostly a joke because I showed the I showed Pascal Turbo Pascal in one of my screenshots. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> and somebody nice. asked like when is Turbo Pascal support in AWS Lambda? Um, mm. actually now this is a weird thing. Thanks to Lambda layers, you can create custom runtimes. You can literally implement Turbo Pascal in Lambda. And I believe somebody did already. So if I recall correctly, um 
somebody actually created um, a, a custom runtime that uh, enables you to run Pascal. Uh, so let me just have, see if I can find it here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in essence, I mean, the answer here is like, there, I don't think there's ever going to be an official support so for Turbo Pascal. Uh, uh, for for uh, AWS Lambda, but uh, I am sure that you can implement any language you want. So uh, that is that is that is quite possible, right? So um, because of and, and and just just to mention here, custom custom layers or custom Lambda runtimes are, are give mm. you the ability to in, in implement language support into Lambda functions. Well, whichever language you want. Now, is it good to write a Lambda function in Pascal? I'm not sure. I don't think is um, it would be the the you know the most optimum way to run your Lambda functions, but mm -hmm. you definitely can. I've seen people you implement C and um, uh, even C plus plus into Lambda functions, which you know, hey, you can do it. But <laughs> should you? Mm, not sure. Uh, lol code for Lambda. There we go. Yeah, somebody implemented a lol code for Lambda. Oh um, yeah. Uh, there's a there's a few languages out there that I would love to see in Lambda functions. Um, um, there's the one which is complicated, um, the Brain F uh, language. Have you seen yeah. that one? Yeah, that, yeah, that one is actually quite a fun one. <laughs> but it's, it's actually not super difficult. I mean, it is mm. when you look at it, uh, but it's it's it makes sense, right? Uh, it it's it's just moving pointers left, left and right. Um, but uh, you can you if if you if you if you've seen a programming language called Malbolge. Malbolge is a super esoteric uh, programming language which. Uh, mutate itself as it executes so you actually need a pr uh, you need a software to write a hello world like application for malbolge because it's so complex because the language mutates midway it's running or something like that <laughs> mm. is that that's the one that, that re-encrypts the whole time so you have yes, to keep exactly. encrypting yeah. it yes yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it is a nightmare uh, <laughs> yeah it's fun um uh, i'm gonna uh, pop a question on the screen we're starting to get some questions here awesome no. um cool oh wow this is a nice long one so um, amplify question around uh, a build that uses a static site uh, with Gatsby mm -hmm. um, and a CMS, and then when um, they kick off a build, Amplify cancels the build because there are no code changes. Um, because I can't look inside the CMS to see the changes. Is there a way to force Amplify to build every time we send a webhook? Um, I know we can, in the Amplify console, you can definitely do a build, but I'm trying to think now. So it actually looks, depending on what your source is, um, if your source is a zip file, I'm not sure how the CMS does it. Does it actually create a zip file um, or does it do something uh, based off of that? Um, uh, when it comes to a zip file, I'm, I, 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 my assumption is that the, uh, Amplify actually checks the, uh, the hash or MD5 hash of the, of the file to see has it changed or not. Um, and then it kicks off a build. If, if it's a Git repository, it checks if there's a newer commit, right? Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, I, mean, it, I mean, it will not do it unless there's a code change. So, um, and, and uh, my question here is like, um, uh, if there's no code change, what are you trying to build, right? So um, I'm, I'm assuming data is sitting inside the CMS and then they pull that out um, with some kind of bold step that actually then processes this. Okay. So I'm expecting some custom build, but please give us a little bit more info on what yeah. the build steps look like, um, because there could be a case that you might rather want to use code build directly instead of using um, yeah. um, Amplifies console for that. There are ways, once again, to get around that. For example, code build job does the build, pushes a code change um, to uh, Amplify, or build in a step that literally just increments the version in a text file or something like that. Yeah. There are a yeah, couple exactly. of ways to do it, but that would be my suggestion, right? If, if there's a, mm. if there's a file, if there's an artifact sitting in a repository somewhere or a, or a zip file, doesn't matter. Uh, just pump bump up the version number uh, on, on on that file. Just change something on it so so that uh, so that uh, Amplify will detect that there has been some change. Again, it will mm. probably just do a hash uh, of of the thing, and yeah, it will it will detect that something has changed. <laughs> I see that Julian is uh, sharing a Commodore 64 layer. Ooh, Ooh that's nice. I, need to, I, I would love to see that. So again, somebody build a focus. Somebody, <laughs> somebody build a somebody build a Commodore 64 Lambda layer. Mm. Uh, Lovely. No, I, can, uh, I, can, I can see you dropping uh, from the stream for technical reasons <laughs> to go play with it. <laughs> Building out my basic applications. Now I want to. Uh, let me try to. Uh, I can. Uh, I can copy. Uh, I can open, open it here. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. uh, I want to see. Is it, is this just just basic? Um, 
I would say just basic is one. Yeah, it's basic. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to so, uh, just jump on to the next you question. Do, oh, you do, you do, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll grab this next question. Um, so basically the question is around being a Delphi developer for 16 plus years now and want to move into the JavaScript, Angular, Node.js uh, space. So for that, part of that is um, obviously learning to um, code that specific code language, um, which is JavaScript, and then using the framework Angular and uh, Node. Um, so recommendation there is definitely go take a look at this. A lot of free material in terms of how to learn JavaScript. Um, I know just offhand free code camp has got a lot of YouTube videos on that. And I think also sites where you can demo and play around with it. Definitely, definitely do that. And then also what I recommend, and I'm just going to scroll up to the link for you over here is go have a look at um, that link. Uh, which is bit.ly slash get AWS certified. We currently have got a campaign where we've made all the training material available for the cloud practitioner um, certification, which is the entry level one, and also a mock test. So that'll help you get uh, started with some of the basics. Then as a second level to that, keep an eye out for one of our awesome days, uh, sorry, our, yeah, our awesome days, which is uh, the introduction to the cloud. So you can understand the basic concepts, how it differs from on-prem, et cetera. Um, so that's definitely how I would start. Yeah, there, there's so many, so many, so many different um, options out there. I mean, uh, we offer a lot of free training. Uh, one of the things that we proud ourselves is, is that we try to give a lot of examples out there. So, uh, Brett Gould, uh, if you check out AWS samples on GitHub, you will see a lot of code samples of building applications on AWS. So, um, and uh, as as you as you are a very experienced developer, uh, just by looking at some code will give you the idea how things are done so uh, that is definitely one of the things that you can you can you can check out so um uh, there's been a few questions here uh as well i'm gonna try to answer them all so cool. um uh, i think uh, uh, go ahead let's quickly go because i see the garuna gave us some details so let's quickly yes. continue yeah. with that one wrap it up and then move on to other because i see there's uh, quite a few then coming in okay so i have a lot cool. of functions here we go Hide behind this. Yes. <laughs> Love the wall wall text. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have a lambda function which is assigned a custom task. The upper bound mm -hmm. for running the lambda is fifteen minutes, while the task is slightly longer than the upper bound of max running time. For now, I can, for now I can optimize it a bit, but tomorrow if custom task fetches more data, then it will surely fail. Is there a fix for that? Number two, is there a flavor mm -hmm. of lambda which can optimally customize the memory automatically based on a function? I'm a student, so apology if I'm vague anywhere. Um, do you? Okay, go. Go. <laughs> I was going to say let's let's start with the second part and talk about um, the uh, lambda power tuning. Um, talk from yeah. yesterday from a Alex. I don't know if you mentioned it in your talk at all. Um, uh, I didn't. The I open didn't, no. the open source library um, that he did. Uh, let me quickly get the link. But basically, what it is, it's a um, uh, it's a lambda application that you deploy, and then what it does, it actually runs your lambda functions. You give it a list of which ones to run, and it takes all the different sizes of lambda memory that you can pick because there is a point I think about one point is it one point seven gigs or or three point one where you start getting more C, virtual CPUs under the hood. Um, um. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's 1.7 uh, gig. But in case there's a point, then what happens is that 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 package will actually run your lambda with all of those different memory points, and then show you in a graph which is the optimal amount of memory. Because interestingly enough, sometimes it's worthwhile giving more memory to get more performance and process quicker. Because then in total you pay less. Because remember, lambda is processed in 100 milliseconds. Um, and then while I get that link quickly, uh, Docker, the first part around a Lambda that is running longer than 15 minutes. We had a discussion on this earlier this week, I believe. Yeah, so um, Lambda is running longer than 15 minutes. Um, uh, Garuna, I, I, would, I would advise you here to maybe rethink, is the is a Lambda function right for you in this case? Because a Lambda that runs 15 minutes is very expensive, right? So uh, it is quite costly. Now, uh, if, when you take like a 15 minute, let, let me just move this so we can see each other's faces. So if you, mm. if you were, if you are running a task that needs to execute for 15 minutes, my my understanding is that this task is not something that needs to be uh, triggered in a millisecond latency, you know, uh, boundary. So it can be it can take a bit longer to execute. When I say longer, I mean just seconds longer. 
Uh, so uh, using something like containers, in this case, like Fargate, ECS with Fargate, or just triggering a task on, on Fargate would be better because number one, it's much cheaper than running a Lambda function for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Number two, there is no limit how long it can run, but it will still be serverless per se because you don't have to worry about uh, uh, provisioning infrastructure or anything like that. You can run a container somewhere in the in the black mist mm -hmm. of the cloud um, and, and it would work. Mm -hmm. my, my, that would be my my suggestion to you on this on this topic absolutely so cool try to just avoid lambda on, functions want to pop it up here quickly so this is what and i'll pop the link down in the chat as well for everyone um what it looks like is uh there we go is this so what you can see over here is the red line is the total execution time but the blue line represents the total cost because if you execute faster you pay less because you're yeah. running for a shorter period of time you can see over there the in this first example it's there at uh, 1.5 gig where in the second example you can see over there that's the sweet spot and also think about maybe breaking your Lambda function into multiple calls where the first one gets all the data ready to be processed, then pop it onto something like SQS, which is a queue, and then have other Lambda functions process off of that queue because then they can each grab a message, process it, etc. So definitely take a look at that and figure out um, how that works. Cool. Okay, let us see. We have got a lot more questions over here. Let's go back up again. Um, uh, let's start with be frosty quickly. Uh, yes, we had this conversation um, as well. I remember now. Um, mm -hmm. One other thought uh, like in the post production workflow and finding the best keywords to attach to the metadata of the images. Um, so I'm assuming here the question is so, firstly, recognition is a service that allows you to extract metadata out of images. So if I upload an image with an API call, I can get back there's a person in it, there's a lamp pole, there's a car, there's a etc. those kind of things in there. So it sounds like what you're planning to do is that you want to process your images through recognition to get that metadata um, and then using that uh, determine what, what keywords to attach to the actual images when you publish them. So the nice part there is you can actually set up a workflow where when you upload the image to Amazon S3, um, uh, you can get the um, image to, as soon as it's uploaded, it raises an SNS notification, and then that SNS notification can be um, sent to an SQS queue. Um, and what that does is, and there, there are ways in the console you can set this up with very little effort, um, because then once it's on the queue, you go and design a, a, a Lambda function that then can take that information um, and actually then make the call to yeah. uh, recognition, which should be one API call, and then it gets the, uh, the actual request uh, back. And then what it could do is, because it knows the S3 file name as well as the uh, metadata, it can actually attach that as an extra file next to the thing, or there are a couple of ways you can actually attach that metadata. One thing to mention here that um, there's a second part of the BFROSS question is that the photos are big uh, and that uh, recognition cannot handle more than 15 megabytes um, of yes. this. So um, one of the things that um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's gonna, there are going to be improvements to, to, to service 360 images. Um, one thing that I could I could advise you to do, be frosty, and this is a this is just a, a one of the workflows workflow features you can introduce here is that instead of pu pushing the big images directly to recognition, because number one, recognition does not need to process large images. It it can just uh, it can just you can you can resize the images. Now you don't have to do it yourself. You can do it in an automated fashion. Uh, um, you can do it in an automated fashion with uh, with um, with tools such as like you know lambda functions maybe just resizing the images to something small creating basically thumbnails not even thumbnails like something slightly larger than mm -hmm. thumbnails and then using that as 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 a as a as as uh, to pass it on into 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 machine learning into recognition and having that uh, uh, return your tags and then you can tag the large image later on <clears throat> so okay uh the clever look here up um so we have okay, a, we, we have a, we, okay we have a thing yeah. from uh from uh, uh, uh from uh, what is it calf calf on twitch calf on twitch um how is pair programming experience in cloud nine could you do a small demo so we're we were actually trying to do that in the background i have i have a cloud nine environment running and i've tried to share it with cobus um cobus i've sent you the, the username and password um and you are trying to log in and yes but i need the uh, actual aws account as well because remember i need to yeah, log yeah, into the, the account okay. first yeah yeah account ID first mm -hmm. so just quickly while docker does that how it works is that you would set up inside your aws account you first create another im user um yeah. 
and then give that IAM user the um, permission to actually use uh, Cloud9. Um, and I think there's an extra step that Arc will just cover now. We actually yeah. share it as well. And then uh, let me just open this one up. Cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, basically Cloud9 in this case, uh, for those of you who do not know, Cloud9 is our online uh, browser-based IDE. Uh, it's, it's in essence running in an EC2 instance. Um, on AWS. So actually, let me share a screen here. I'm going to pop my window thing. Is that it? That's it. Cool. You got so it there. You can see that this is just an ID. And, and, and as you can see here, it's running on an EC2 instance. Um, there's a proper uh, Linux box underneath, right? Uh, as HTAP installed this on there. But you can basically. Um, do anything in the browser and what's great about it because it, it inherits your permissions based off uh, of um, of your IAM user so I have specific set of uh, permissions I have here and and you can see Cobus came online Cobus just joined here and then I can see that mm -hmm. there's a C here Cobus logged in and if Cobus uh, uh, I'm if I'm currently on this uh, CDK application here uh, I can see that Cobus's cursor is moving yeah, yeah there you go and it's 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 in real time. So see, look, mano hands. Uh, <laughs> so we can we can basically we can basically and I can, if if I like if if Kobus selects some text, I, I will see that which text has he has he selected has he selected. Has yeah. he selected. So um, like it's 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 Let's quite quickly. Uh, Bottom two lines. There we, go. That, there we go. That's what I've got selected. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is it is it is it is um it is very cool. Uh, I think. Uh, Especially when you when you have to work remotely with people and you mm -hmm. unfortunately cannot sit in the office with with the folks you work with and and all that stuff, um, uh, having the ability to look at the same screen in a way or look at the same code mm -hmm. sometimes is very very useful. Now that's not the whole uh, uh, the holy benefit of of of, of AWS uh, Cloud Nine. There's additional tools in here. I mean, just the fact that it's a it's a ID or a development environment that you can just move around no matter what you're running on, right? Uh, makes a lot of sense, <laughs> especially mm. if, you, if you're switching laptops and, and all those things. And uh, if you missed my talk, one of the things, one of the features uh, it has on on, on 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 this thing is that you can actually connect through, to it through um, through uh, Systems Manager. So by default, because this is using an EC2 instance, uh, you need uh, SSH permissions to access it. Well, actually, no. Mm. Um, it needs port 22 open towards AWS to AWS service ports, which is fine. But sometimes people would like to, you know, uh, button it up a bit more. So the way to do that is basically just to uh, run it through Systems Manager. So Systems Manager can actually uh, tunnel your connection mm. to it. So no, no, no port 2022 need to be open. But yeah, cool. that's a that's a quick demo of pair programming, even though we didn't build anything. Mm. But yeah. <laughs> and also, just want to highlight one other benefit here is that especially if you're on low bandwidth situations, this is awesome because you open up um, Cloud9 on both sides, and then you can um, have a conversation with audio only. Because um, then I can go literally, hey, have a look over there, and you highlight yeah. a bit of code and have that yeah. conversation. So definitely take a look at this and figure yeah, out. Also, um, there's, yeah. there's a there's a there's a chat window here. So if I say you know hello, mm. go this. Um, uh, it, you will see. You can see that I've. This mm -hmm. is the. This is the same uh, editor I use for my for my screenshots. And uh, so you can see that I've, I've played with this uh, a while ago, and I've shared it with some other people. So uh, you can, you can do it that way as well. So um, it is yeah. it is it is possible to do it uh, in in such a way. So uh, yeah. and I can also go cool. here and see which which file Cobus has open and where's Co where's Cobus's focus right now. So you know. <laughs> So if Cobus opens a file, I just click open active file and just bam, and it's currently Cobus is. I can see that he's typing on, on a browser, and I can see what uh, what is he opening there. <laughs> There's no oh, links link available, uh, yeah, no <laughs> but it is very cool. Um, yeah. Excellent. So uh, cool. we okay. have, we have somebody joining us. Uh, yes, ooh. let's quickly get through the screen and then let us add. Pa! Hi, Sohan. Hello. Hey. Sohan. Is my audio coming through clearly? It yes, is. it's quite loud though. Oh, thank God. It's quite loud oh. though, uh, but oh, it is yeah. coming through quick. Okay. Clearly. Maybe just yeah. to, to take it down a notch. Um, so StreamYard always does something with my audio. I don't know why. <laughs> One yeah, of the things I, I do know, with StreamYard, StreamYard has like audio processing. I disable audio processing on StreamYard yeah. because it, it, it used to, uh, you know, twist my, my audio a bit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, let's quickly kick things off, um, and I think we can actually throw this next question directly at Soan before we get but, to the legendary Rob question. Yeah. 
Oh, so introduce yourself. Yes, Sohan. Oh, Tell us who okay. you are and what are you doing here. Who are you? <laughs> thank, thank you, Darko. I need more coffee. <laughs> hey, folks. My name is Sohan. I work as a dev advocate in the AWS team. Uh, I'm in the same team with Darko and Kobus, and I'm based out of the Netherlands. So I'm in charge of the Benelux region, which is Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. So I can actually take this question. I've been in the dev relations space for, I think, seven years now. So it's a good question, Bokjo. And um, so there's a lot to unpack. So essentially, okay, so there are two things, right? Uh, one is you need to know tech. Of course, you need to be passionate about working with developers. Um, you need to be able to sort of understand tech and explain it well. Uh, I also think to non-job um, description-y type um, traits of a good dev advocate is, uh, is slightly human, is I think you, you need empathy and honesty. All right, you need empathy to identify with developers in order to, you know, see the, their journey, see the problems they're going through and sort of really help with the product you're advocating about. And of course, you need honesty. At the end of the day, we're not a marketing team. We don't go out and say, hey, this is the greatest service in the history of all services. Uh, we just go out and, you know, sort of say, hey, this is what you can do. This is how you do something and this is how it works. So I think that also really helps. I, so, I think yeah. the point about honesty and is very important because one of the things you will hear from us is us being very critical about AWS services. Right? Mm. So we want to make those services better. And you especially see that on Twitter where we bash some service that it's not the best in the world or this can be better. But uh, we try to get those changes fixed. One of the things that I, I must say that I, because I've been working at AWS for five years, right? And one process or one part of the AWS uh, developer advocacy team that I love so you come up with a problem. You say, uh, we have like a, this thing where we submit, um, how, how we call it, like uh, uh, service. Now, how do we call it? Like when, 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 when people come to us with uh, service issues. Um, spec rec? No? Not a spec rec. No, no, no. Some, basically, it's like a, like a feedback, customer feedback on services. Oh, right? Somebody comes mm -hmm. to us and says, hey, uh, your web interface change is horrible, right? One thing you have to do here, or we do, is like there needs to be an action to that. I cannot just take that feedback today. Okay, yes. Uh, one of the actions that I need to set up is basically, okay, let me get that information to the right person. And uh, we are trying to actively fix those things, right? If you come to us and say, hey, I think this is bad. I think this can be improved. One of the action items we do is we address it. We just don't put it in a box and say, oh, I got some information from you. We actually try to chase down the people and give them that inf them feedback directly. So trying to amplify your uh, your voice in AWS, but so how how does one become become one become one um, or how does one become a developer advocate? Because you've yeah. been doing it for longer than both Coase and I together. That is true. Um, I think obviously most dev advocates I met have a background in some sort of software development. Uh, it could mm. be like a solution architect, a software developer, because you need to. At the end of the day, you are you know handling with a lot of code. You're dealing with a lot of tech. Um, I think a good way to sort of do this, uh, at least in the pre-COVID world, was to go out, host meetups. Uh, but even now you can, you know, uh, host Twitch streams, you can write yeah. blog posts, you can write on Dev.2. Uh, one thing I always tell people is, and because people ask me this question, is don't do something for the sake of it, right? Like you might love using TikTok, but but if someone tells you, hey, you need to write a blog and you don't like it, don't force yourself. You can always find a way to find an audience for dev content on, say, TikTok. Uh, or if you like writing, maybe, you know, you get deep into like uh, your own blog or medium.com or whatever. So find something that you really like and, and write about it, or do something about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Putting yourself out there, right? Because, um, and I think this is, this is, okay, so folks, if you are, if both people in chat and, and you guys, if you've been logged mm -hmm. in IT, then I have, I've been, my initial uh, um, experiences in IT, when I started IT, uh, back in the old days of 2007, um, uh, one of the things I've noticed back then is that people were really protective on their, of their knowledge. Like people were like, I'm not yep. sharing what I know. And even my teacher back then is like, I told him, oh, I want to I wanna make this blog where I'm going to write how I do things. He's like, be careful about sharing your knowledge. And that was a thing back then. And I'm not sure if that was like, you know. It's still a thing. It, 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 well, but, but yeah, but I think today that has switched a bit, switched a bit right? I see that mm -hmm. a lot of people are sharing more and more just because sharing your knowledge is, is you're treating a thing like open source, right? You, you get people to help you be better at things, but you also help 
other people improve themselves. And I think that's a great way to put your name and face out there uh, and potentially someday be a developer advocate for something. And I think I see a lot more companies hiring developer advocates sure. and, and asking for developer advocates because um, selling a product is no longer just about, hey, this is the flashiest thing we have, but you're trying to appeal to all the people who are going to be using it and building it and maintaining it. So. Mm. Now, also, I've, I've seen that in the local market as well, where people think that the secret source is the ability to provision infrastructure and actually set up a server. But yeah. Um, actually, uh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. On that topic, <laughs> I, I want to just add this because Bokyo is coming from a region. Bokyo is, Bokyo is from Macedonia, uh, Macedonia. Uh, and um, uh, I come from from the same region and I know those kind of people. I work with those kind of people. And uh, I, one, one company I work for, and I know this was a joke. And I, I know the guy and I love him and he's fine. But I, when I joined the company, I asked him like, so what's my process? When will I become a senior engineer? He's like, when I die. <laughs> so, <laughs> that meant like, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, let me just quickly check here. Um, yeah. <laughs> give you, give you, can I put that on screen, Darko? Yeah, is it, uh, okay, can, this is actually, okay. I saw this recently, which is I... I was hilarious. It's a good interview question. So that's the fastest way you can become a senior developer. Senior developer. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, um, um, I also had that when I was young. I wanted when do I get the senior? Because I want the title. I want the title. And now yeah. it's it's a thing. It's important until you get to it and then pass it. And then you realize it's all about what can I offer people? What can we solve together? Then the title. But it's hard when you haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and. And I think sharing knowledge is very important between us. And, and you'll see one of our jobs is just to share knowledge. We share mm -hmm. our experiences and knowledge and with you. And we keep yeah. on learning every day, right? And we share what we learn from other people. So that's a great you know, mm. path towards being a developer advocate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. I just want to answer a quick question here from Danny T mm -hmm. because he asked, asked it a while ago. Is Fargate included in the free tier? I believe so. Uh, Fargate has a free tier offering of something, something, something. Um, I will, I will get you that information. But Kobus, you can, you can, or or hmm. or, or Sohan, you can uh, get this one. Okay, cool. So, question is around: We have a number of services using lambdas, uh, although we prefer to uh, refer to them as lambda functions. Um, our app is currently possessing data in a Mongo d database, and the idea that we're moving to Postgres. I'm thinking of having the app publish changes and have the data write to both DBs till we are confident or to the move. Ah, yes. Advice around swapping out the database with as little book downtime as possible. Um, has anybody um, done the whole double writing, double checking before? So want to check? I mean, no. I've, I've, I've dabbled with this, so I'm happy to take it. Okay, go ahead. I have not done it. Cool. But just, uh, Danny, there is the, uh, Danny T, there is no free tier in Fargate, unfortunately. Mm. Fargate doesn't support free, free tier. Yeah. Um, so, Rob, um, this one is fun because basically your idea here of writing to both and then checking with both is definitely the right way. So how you go about it is first you have to figure out how do I import my data from MongoDB into Postgres? Because that'll be the first challenge. It's like because you're working with documents versus normalized data. Uh, in a relational database. So first figure out that process, then import. And then what you do is you do exactly what you're talking about now is when you set up your system to, I would start with the reads first, because normally you can't use a system if you can't read da data out of it. And you build the database um, layer for, or the data layer to connect to the Postgres one and actually read the data. And then in your service call, what you can do is you make the two calls. And obviously at that point, you're returning a an object or some bit of code or a code representation of the data. Do a comparison between the two when you've done the read from both sides and make sure that it's the same. Coffee is done. Oh. Um, Somebody's commenting on my cup, so that's why I'm showing it up. Okay. Thank you, Stelly. Um, and then what you do is, what you can do is put logging in there that tells you which of these methods have actually um, not made a mistake or made a mistake. Because what you want at the end of the day is you want to make sure that um, the, there's parity between them. And then once you've got the reads done, go over to the rights and do it similar. And just, just do that right to both sides. Keep it going like that. And then what you do is when it gets to the day where you're happy with, you've done all the checks and make, made sure that this is working, then you schedule your downtime, switch off the system for a, a short, uh, however long it takes to do that migration. And you can do migration planning beforehand to see how um, fast you can get it to plan around that. Um, or you can try and do it in real time, which is a little bit more risky and you need to focus on a little bit more. But that's how you would approach it. And then what you do is you switch it over in the code with a feature flag, preferably. Um, and now you deal with it. Um, 
but it is a tricky one. Definitely go read up on Charity Mages. Uh, she did quite a lot of this in uh, Parse before she joined, uh, started Honeycomb, um, where they did parallel runs of this. So she will have some tips as well. Okay. Like, I've, I've never done this. I've never had a chance to, like, play around with some, like, migration in this size, but I think, I think it's very important. One of the things mm. that you pointed out is, like, you, I mean, you just write two things, write parallel to different things, but you don't read parallel from different things. You read from one source, right? No, no. You, what you do is you, you, the one is the primary, that's the source of truth that you read from. But at exactly, the same time, yeah. you read from whatever your new data source is and then compare. You still send oh, back the, okay. the source of truth always until mm -hmm. you are happy. Ah, okay, okay, that's okay, how okay. you get parity. Because remember, when you think of the function level, I've got a function that needs to return some data. Yeah. Return two sets of the data or in the function itself, do that check and say, listen, are they the same or not? And if they're not, um, then you know you'd have to fix that code still. Because that's how you can get it running without any... Uh, without breaking the system got it got it got it okay cool mm. um all right so uh we see a comment from steli that um that that he says that i look older <laughs> First you're time making somebody... me happy yeah. <laughs> there is just to put it in context almost a decade difference between the two of us so thank yeah. you very much for that i will appreciate this on my get off my lawn day later this year <laughs> So what, how old are you? I mean, if you if, oh. if, if you don't me asking, you look very young. So uh, oh okay, I'm uh, 33. Oh okay, so you're yeah. just one year older. Than oh, okay. I'm gonna yeah. chase you both off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, kids, go back to school. Your parents know you're here. Yeah, Kobus are like, oh, in my day with computers, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, literally Kobus. in my day when I started, we had relational databases and flat files. That was the database options. <laughs> there was no Git. Wow. There was no cloud. Just saying. I, I always like. I always go by what was the first Windows. Uh, well, okay, I come from a Windows world, but what was the first Windows Server version you worked on actively? And for me, it was two thousand and three, right? Um, and that mm. was like, and that was after two thousand and eight. So, uh, but I've never worked with NT, for example. I've not even had a chance to work with it. Or, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Linux. My Linux experience came way after. So, mm. for all people out there who are who have big, uh, who have started with Windows, right? And you think that you cannot change to Linux at all? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. <laughs> I was. If a, you believe in yourself. If you believe, you like, look, <laughs> look, I, I have this. See, oh, I, wow. I, 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 I am a Windows person. I've, I've started with Windows, but I have Linux as well. So I've moved on to Linux. And, uh, and what? Be very careful because when Docker does this, you get uh, Windows. <laughs> you get, you get WSL two. You get WSL two. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I need to reach out to Hayden about that joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I yeah, remember when I was in school. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. I was in school and uh, it, it was a thing to like go for like computer class. I was quite young. And you start off with something simple like HTML and you play like games on the side like Dangerous Dave. And suddenly yeah. they throw in like Windows NT server. And I'm like in seventh grade. Right? What? What is this stuff? Like, why am I doing this here? So. Yeah. I have used Windows NT though, a little bit. We have we had Windows NT in school, um, but uh, never actively used it. I, I had yeah. Windows NT installed, but never had to, never had to maintain it uh, myself. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah. apparently, Windows NT for its time was like the bee's knees, yeah. as they call it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember running Windows 2000 as my desktop for quite a while because it, <sighs> at that point, in terms of what I did, was it was better than I can't remember. It was 98 or me or Windows ME, um, yeah. but. 2000 was just more stable and more features was a lot of fun. Yeah, we, we, Windows 2000 was built on, on, on NT technology, right? So it's mm. basically what Windows XP is. Uh, well, that's, that's, a, that's why Windows 2000 and Windows ME mm. existed at the same time. Windows ME yeah. was built on Windows 98 uh, or on DOS. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so for, for um, backwards compatibility or something. And then it was a failure, right? So, so they basically mm. moved on to NT. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Vista, but I, mean, I, um, I was a fan of Vista as well. Yeah. So just quickly on the tattoo side, the other fun one that I've seen is a tattoo. And it's one of those, like, I would love to get a tattoo of these kind of things, but I don't want to copy someone, is that they um, tattooed the, the classic fork bomb um, on their uh, arm as well. <laughs> I, uh, one, one of the first things that people I worked for was in security, and he had the S -A -S -S -H -A hash of, uh, the, of the number zero or something like that tattooed on his back or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, but, um, Folks, please feel free, feel free to ask us questions mm -hmm. in the chat um, uh, regarding the technical co uh, contents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sohan, what was your talk about yesterday? Oh, uh, mine was a little, 
I'd say very niche, but it was offline first and real time in web apps using GraphQL. Okay. So to be honest, I, I like the content and, and shout out to my colleagues Seb for, you know, like, like uh, whipping up the demo and stuff. So essentially for real time, a lot of people have used web sockets for the longest time, but, and, and GraphQL has subscriptions and now Amplify has this thing called a data store. So you can actually write to some, to a local data store which takes care of a lot of things, including conflict resolution, auto merging, and a lot of that. So it was a deep dive into all of that stuff. Okay, okay, that's a very interesting topic. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. it's it's super niche, but I thought it was interesting because if you're working on some of that stuff, I thought there will that there is insights there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mind you, this thing, the Dev Day, is a very technical topic, right? It's it's yeah. a talk, it's a it's a session of talks we do on 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 highly technical topics. So it's not an introduction to X or Y, or Z. It's a it's let's deep dive on 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 on, on whatever Sohan said. <laughs> like yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> That's kind of a thing. Um, do you have any interesting questions from the people regarding your talk? Maybe you can regurgitate it. Uh, and one of the things that we found that is like it's it's okay always good to kind of repeat the questions mm -hmm. people ask you. So for the sake of folks listening here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the question we got asked the most: Will this presentation be available on? <laughs> no, yes. it will. It will. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> So uh, one interesting question, which was actually a question for Seb stock, which I don't know the answer to, but someone asked me this uh, later is if you, incognito, if you're using multiple federation providers, can you merge the two? Like if I log in and say I decide to log in through Facebook one day and then through like uh, log in with Amazon the next day, yeah. can I merge those identities into like a single user? Okay. I don't know the answer. So I, I was in fact, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, my gut feel there would be yes, but you'll have to add some custom code. Yeah. Um, the reason being is that part of that OAuth flow is that you do get access to the email address associated with the uh, third party provider. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's been, a, it's been a few years, apologies, like literally a few years. Um, and then you can compare the two because I've done this on other systems as well. And I've, I, I remember poking on, but like, I, honestly, this is like many years ago. So I'm fairly certain you can do it, but you will have to do some additional processing behind the scenes with Cognito to line things up, I think. Oh, there's something, a comment Arkin just made on sign up trigger. There's a, uh, when mm -hmm. you use Cognito ah. and so when somebody signs up, you can have a trigger. Uh, that's the beauty of Cognito. And I have a friend, mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, mm -hmm. one of the user group members, uh, in, in, or actually user group leader from Montenegro. He did a whole blog post on, on how he did, oh, no, no, he didn't do a blog post, but he was telling me about how he did a lot of magic with Cognito and, and tr events and triggers and, and those things because you can do a lot of things uh, based off of those. Basically, trigger land the function to do. Ah, that good, to know. good to know. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So there's a there's a question here from uh, from Bokyo again. Uh, Bokyo, what is your opinion on AI ops and together with AWS on the, for the future? So um, I've heard this question before. It's uh, somebody mm -hmm. uh, likes to insert AI or things into DevOps. So it's like Dev ML ops, Dev uh, Sec ops, Dev Sec ML ops, Dev AI ML ops, right? Um, now my question here is um, to you, Bokyo, is um, are you talking about introducing artificial intelligence to help help you with operations, um, or are you talking about operations on AI services or workloads or whatever? Right, because those are mm -hmm. two different things. There is DevOps in machine learning workflows, right? So machine learning is mm -hmm. still code, so you can need to process it. But if you're talking about um, automating operations with AI, first one, okay, op op okay, operating. Um, um, automating operations with AI. All right. Yes. So, my thought on this is that um, there will be a lot of augmentation, and when I say augmentation, I mean um, there will be things that are gonna um, uh, they're gonna be services that are gonna help you run operations with AI. Um, hmm. I don't think there's gonna be a service that's gonna operate things based off of AI. Um, that may be a bit difficult to kind of wrangle, uh, but uh, uh, you know, having having things that will automate some things, maybe detect uh, or be smarter about detecting events or reacting to it, could exist. Mm -hmm. right? So, I didn't know of the well, service yet, but yeah, there are there are already services like that um, on AWS um, that are acting certain things. So on the um, the one is on the security front, there are some of our services that do the anomaly detection based on previous yeah. um, activity that uses 
the accounts activity for machine learning, it's that um, it's not inspector. It'll take me a few minutes just to remember um, the actual service name. But then also we have got the uh, cost optimizer. Um, there's a, a new section in it where it actually uses machine learning um, and use data sets that we've gathered. I think I don't know how many million data sets um, based on so it takes into account. Do you have spikes over the weekend or certain weekdays and things like that? And using that as part of it actually does that detection and tells you, well, this is the right sizing of the instance that you need based on past um, um, usage on your account, based on data sets that we've seen with other um, usage patterns in EC2. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, I, and, and like, if, if you want to look like uh, AI or ML being part of operations or DevOps is that there is um, uh, there is the what is it called the uh, uh, code code guru right code guru helps you mm. use AI to basically uh, proofread your code so it's like autocorrect for your code where it just has a look at your code and says uh, hey you know uh, is it is it uh, you know is it better could be better and those kind of things right? so that that was mm. kind of a thing uh, yeah all right um, there's a Fun one from Stiggs, um, Stiggs Wastikin around Firebase versus Amplify. Um, and I think the way to approach this question is not because in general, we don't uh, prefer doing like side by side comparisons because that kind of feels like you get into a, a fist fight in the mud. Trying yeah. to, Ooh, that one's crap because of this. It's literally not the way how we approach this. Um, but what I can say in terms of is that uh, Firebase, I believe, is quite a bit older uh, than Amplify. So just from that perspective, I'm assuming there are more people that um, or people that have been using it for longer than they have for Amplify. Um, now, obviously, Amplify is more than just a database. So it's it's a little bit also apples and oranges. Um, the reason is that Amplify is a framework that helps you build um, applications from a task-based uh, view. So I want to create an API. I want to create a front end. I want to create a static site. So it focuses on that with, and it's got a very rich um, uh, framework and CLI. So when you go in the CLI and you say, create me an Amplify app, it takes you through this little text wizard that asks you, what are you trying to build? What kind of backend are you trying to build? What kind of persistence, etc." cetera? Um, so it really, it's not just a database slash event store. Um, it's an entire framework of many things in it. Um, and also with Amplify, you can build, um, like I said, APIs, you can build um, front-end applications, Vue, JavaScript, uh, oh, sorry, Vue, React, uh, Angular. Angular, yeah. You can even do mobile apps. It actually integrates the AWS SDK into your applications and makes certain tasks like syncing data from the the mobile app into uh, whatever persistence you have in the background, like one or two lines of code. It wraps that abstraction away from you quite nicely. And on the mobile side, it does iOS, Android, and we recently um, put the Flutter um, version in preview. So you can play oh. with a lot of things. So it's, yeah, we yeah. just um, you read up on that. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, I also think I also think Amplify. So I haven't used Firebase much, just FI, but Amplify comes with a lot of best practices sort of built into it, right? So, like Kogu said, there is a setup wizard which, and you have to just choose the options, and it takes care of a lot of the best practices of web and mobile development straight out of the box. So you don't have to do all of that extra stuff. I think that's a great feature as well. Yeah, and I haven't, I haven't had a chance for, to to check out Firebase, but um, yeah, Amplify is kind of like. Mm -hmm. Check it out. I mean, you make the comparison. That that's what we, you know, the best tool is the one that you can use the best. So, <laughs> um, so there's a comment or a basically a request from Yedor. Uh, I just want to address this. Uh, Yedor uh, basically asked us if we can address an issue with Amplify Incognito um, about some sensitive information. So Yedor, we're going to be looking into that and we're going to try to get that information to the right people. Luckily, there is a issue already open on on, on GitHub, so we're going to try to to push that thing a bit more. So uh, uh, I've taken mm. that as a as a note uh, for myself. Let me just copy paste it somewhere. I want to make sure that I have a note for me. Um, cool, uh, excellent. So um, one more. Uh, what question? Kion, Kion, are you guys excited for the new changes in Lambda? Um, uh, no more logging to CloudWatch. Uh, Kion, are you talking about the uh, uh, oh the, the extensions, the Lambda extensions? Mm. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I must say that's a pretty great feature. Uh, Lambda extensions basically give you the ability to to uh, uh, to implement uh, third-party tooling into your Lambda functions, such as clock, uh, logging ability to, uh, with well with 
Datadog with uh, Dynatrace. You can do uh, credential management with um, uh, Vault, uh, with uh, app mm. config directly. So you create these extensions that plug into your Lambda function and provide you some additional functionality, which was quite difficult before. So I must say that's a, that's a mm. really, really neat feature. Cool. We have another friend joining us. Ooh. Boom. Welcome, This is Steve. becoming a party. Yes, it is. That's, oh. that's what we signed up for today. So uh, welcome to you, Steve. And this time on the third time, I'll remember it. Steve, introduce yourself quickly. Um, See, so yeah, I've now had my third copy. I'm ready to go. Yeah, so I'm on the developer relations team based out of the UK, which is why I just joined, because I don't do anything before 9 a.m. So um, apart from like run around with my kids, you know, and try and get everyone out the door so that I can do stuff like this. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm on the team in the UK, uh, focus a little bit on, I don't know, security serverless, talk a little bit about everything. Mm. So yeah, happy to meet everyone and answer your questions. Yeah. Maybe you can, maybe oh, you can tell us, Steve, about your talk yesterday or talks. What did you do? Yeah, so I did two talks at the Dev Day yesterday. The first was on um, the title, I'm paraphrasing, the title was something like scaling cloud security automation or something. So this was focused on how to uh, automate uh, so your, your security operations across uh, your AWS environments. So uh, that was the first talk. And then the second talk was on uh, least privilege. So identity management and the principle of least privilege. Uh, okay as well so two kind of security focused talks now uh because this uh stream here is oh we have kobus back um uh <laughs> kobus why don't you introduce yourself kobus why don't you introduce yourself <laughs> <laughs> who are you what Sorry, are you I, here? <laughs> I, I had a phone call and i just almost threw my phone because it's one of those automatic robocalls hi would you like to i'm like Bleh. Do you get those things in 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 in, in south africa I, it's, I, I it's, it's it's new ish it's oh, okay. um just quick segue into this. We've gone through the interesting phone call, calling, selling product things for a while now where initially it was from blocked numbers. So basically it turned into if you saw a number that says blocked, you would never answer because you knew it was going to be spam. Then they yeah. realized that, that doesn't work. So then they went into let's start using random other numbers. Um, and then some people started using um, there's an app. I can't remember what it's called. Um, around that tells you, oh, this is that number. So then they started rotating all of the numbers. Then they realized that in general, people were starting, it, it was a very low hit rate. And then they went into robocalling. So now we literally get automated messages and you could always hear because there's a delay before the recording starts playing. So you're like, uh, me. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So cool. Steve, over. sorry. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Steve, about your sessions, um, uh, because this is a session, this is a stream about us ask, answering questions from the audience. Um, but sometimes people can be shy and don't be shy audience ask us questions mm. please um but also you can um feel free to uh, ask us anything about yesterday or whatever but steve maybe you can tell us uh, one of the interesting questions you got regarding your sessions yesterday and uh, maybe an answer to that question uh yeah so i i was actually on the office hours yesterday for one of the tracks which one of my okay. sessions was in but not the other one so um but um uh, i guess well, one of, it is an interesting question. It surprised me. Maybe it meant I didn't do a great job at, uh, at, at the talk, but uh, I use EventBridge a lot in in the security automation uh, part. And one of the questions I got was like, what is EventBridge? Why is EventBridge so important to kind of security automation? So yeah. I think I thought that was quite interesting because, and it's worth touching on because I think EventBridge is one of the coolest services we have. You know, you can think about it from an application integration perspective. You can think about it, as, you know, loosely coupled microservices and asynchronous, you know, uh, processing of jobs and that kind of stuff, which is great. Uh, but in the security world, it's great because you want to be able to react to events. And that is ultimately what EventBridge allows you to do is bring events into the bus and then react to them. Um, so for the context of people who didn't see the session, I did a demo where I took a so AWS Security Hub is a service where you can collate um, all of your security findings across multiple different AWS services. So things like guard duty alerts, et cetera, come into there. Um, in Security Hub, it has this ability to configure what's called a custom action. And this is like a human initiated remediation or a human initiated action. Yeah. So imagine your SecOps engineer is sitting there in Security Hub, they see a finding, they can select it and then trigger that action. What that does okay. is it sends an event to CloudWatch events, is what it says, but for those on the stream, CloudWatch events and EventBridge, exactly the same thing. Yeah. So you can use them kind of interchangeably. Um, so uh, those events, when a, when a SecOps engineer or whoever's in Security Hub triggers that event, it goes to EventBridge. 
Um, okay. And then you can define rules and triggers to go and do it. So it's a really kind of cool way to integrate, uh, you know, some of your security findings and some actions to other AWS services. In this case, I was uh, uh, triggering a Lambda function that isolated an EC2 instance that was oh, um, okay. causing suspicious mm -hmm. activity, um, put in a security group with no access. And basically, uh, an event is being dropped into the event bridge, and then um, based off the event, uh, I guess you create a rule, right, or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So event bridge allows you to do well two things. It, so in this context, it's a it, it's a rule with uh, a pattern. Of, I forget the terminology. Filter pattern or pattern. It's basically pattern, a okay. pattern matching on the JSON, right? So the, yeah. the JSON event comes in, and you define this this pattern that you want your event to match to, um, and then. And then on the other side of EventBridge, you can also do scheduled events. So you can use like a cron type syntax to schedule these triggers. But in this case, we're actually taking an event and matching the pattern and then triggering a Lambda. In this okay. case, I'm triggering a Lambda. You could send that data to a fire hose. Mm -hmm. um, you could send it to uh, uh, CloudWatch logs or something. You could um, just dump it in S3 through fire hose, for example. You could send it to uh, Elasticsearch or something yeah. uh, for a further analysis. So it's not just about triggering serverless functions. It's about doing something with that event and, and triggering something. Can a, can a step function be triggered from a, or a step function? Yeah? Can, can a state machine be triggered from event bridge? Um, it's a good question. I need yeah. to double check. I haven't done that personally. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but yeah it's yeah. a good question. You, you should be able to, um, event bridge can go directly to Lambda function. Lambda function can then um, do the triggering for you. So I can expect that to be you can always do things with Lambda, right? Yeah. I mean, La Lambda, <laughs> Lambda the is the, uh, what's it called? The Prattly Patty of uh, coding because it's so lightweight. Uh, you yeah. can just stick it in everywhere to fix any problem almost. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks. Yeah, but I think you meant natively. I'll have, to, I'll have a look into that and, mm. and update yeah. shortly. Yeah. But I, I, you can definitely get events. So there's one thing about EventBridge, right? So it has a default event bus. And without you doing anything, all of your events are going to this event bus from tons of AWS yep. services, right? So no. um, events from step functions are going into that event bus and you can create rules on, uh, and filters on them, which is great. Okay. Um, you can also, if a service isn't directly supported and sends broadcast events to, event, to your default event bus, you can pick up on CloudTrail events, Yeah. which is kind of cool. So okay. it extends to everything that CloudTrail supports. Um, and uh, so on that side of it, there's a ton of support. And we also have this partner integrations. There's a bunch of partner tools that uh, like PagerDuty and people like that that, that integrate with event yeah. as well. Um, they can send but I think you're talking about on the other side of it, can you trigger a, can you actually kick off a state machine yeah. based on an event? And that's what I need to confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me actually answer a question because there's a question here from uh, Lunatic. Um, and this is a question about architecture mostly. Um, so I'm going to cover you guys a bit up a bit. So you need to peek. Uh, uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> like that. Uh, so, um, the question from Lunatic. Uh, I'm from Mar Romania. Uh, the closest domain, or basically the region, is Frankfurt, Germany, 12,000 uh, 1,200 kilometers. Uh, because of this, I get some milliseconds of latency added to in the Lambda function response because of the geographic trip. I can see in the AWS dashboard the Lambda execution executes in five to ten milliseconds, but the actual response I get with the round trip is 130 milliseconds. I'm also using DynamoDB with a query execution running uh, for again 10 to 20 milliseconds, but the end response is 130 plus milliseconds. Is there a, w a way to mitigate this? So, how would you guys mitigate a 130 millisecond response from Romania? Um, let me hide this a bit, if so, we can see you all. <laughs> um, so, I think it depends on the application and what you're doing with the Lambda function. Is it dynamic? Is it some grabbing some static content, there's probably some maybe yeah. patterns you could look at, you know, is it something you could serve via CDN? Um, Lambda at the edge as well is another solution if you need to do something a bit more dynamic. I don't know, I need to look at the edge locations and how close we get to Romania. There, there, there's there's the an edge, I'm, I'm not sure there's a, there's no edge, edge location in Romania, but the closest one is in Budapest, so, and, and Bulgaria as well, so. Right. Yeah, so so things like Lam looking at Lambda at the edge and, and is, is one solution. I don't know what other, other ideas people have. Well, content delivery networks. So, I mean, um, Lunatic in this case, uh, CDN, like using AWS CloudFront, will definitely increase your la latency. Uh, well, I'm sorry, decrease your latency to static content. Um, and using Lambda at Edge, basically bringing Lambda closer closer to you could help. But um, uh, 
one of the things you can also troubleshoot is like uh, by by implementing it with x-ray right x-ray that can help you trace your lambda function you can actually see if there's a latency somewhere in the lambda function right is it just the network latency between you and the lambda function uh, or actually your application or is there some additional latency being uh, being set up within your application. So to, to do that, uh, AWS X-Ray is a great service that can help you do some tracing on a Lambda function for sale. So yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, just to answer your question, by the way, you can trigger a step function in state machine. You can, as a okay. Target of very leverage. good. Yeah. So the docs uh, tell me anyway. Very so. good, <laughs> very good, very good. Um, so and regarding EventBridge, uh, there's a question from uh, I'll just call you Stiggs was taken. Stiggs was taken. Um, yeah. <laughs> Would it be fair to say EventBridge is more convenient uh, SNS as it's uh, already tightly integrated with many AWS services? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. Very, I would say a very, it, very I'm loud. Not, yes. I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure about no, the pricing. They solve different problems, right? They solve different, they're very different services. One's an event bus and one's a pop sub. So like if you're yeah. doing mobile push notifications, you're not going to be using Event exactly, right? Vembridge. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, but in terms of, but yeah, I think if you're thinking about application integration and loosely coupling services and using it for that kind of use case, then Eventbridge is definitely yeah. probably the optimal service. Yeah, it's not a pub pub sub service. That's the thing. <laughs> but can you can you do a pub sub with? Uh, you can technically do it in a way uh, with Eventbridge, right? So you can have. Um, you cannot subscribe to a topic, but you can set up rules to kind of specific. But yeah, you shouldn't do it that way, right? So you can, yeah, you can actually a target. I'm just look at the docs in front of me here because I was looking at that step functions thing. Um, w one of the targets that can be invoked is published into an SNS topic, right? Yeah. So if the rules match, you could publish an SNS topic, and then you could have subscribers such as mobile devices to that um, to that topic. So you can use it in that workflow, but not to do that. Yeah, for sure. No, okay, yeah, that, that could work. Yeah. Um, all right, so. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a familiar face in the, in the yeah. Yeah. comments. She's yeah. actually going to be Marcia. joining us a little bit later for this. Yeah, so tune in later for uh, Marcia being a part of this as well. So let's actually, um, so so Han, you mentioned your talk was, um, what, is it, what is the name of your talk? It's the the thing with um, Identity Federation, right? Huh? That was Seb. Offline first. Oh no, that was Seb's talk. I did one on ah, okay. offline first and real okay. time uh, using GraphQL. Questions here from that talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're putting me on the spot. Uh, so, <laughs> the, 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 the... Okay, there's no questions directly related to this this talk. Uh, hmm. All right. Let me trace. Let me see. Um, okay, this is an Amplify question. Is there a, is there a way to use C Sharp and Amplify? Um, yes. So yes, actually, we did get this question yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, there is there is support for .NET backends in Amplify right now. Okay. So if you are using C Sharp and you have a backend, and you know you can use that right mm. now. I think the question though that we got was in the context of Unity 3D, because mm. the person clarified yes. later saying, hey, you know, we have something on Unity 3D. Uh, Amplify doesn't support Unity 3D right now, but there is an AWS SDK for Unity 3D, which uh, connects with some of the typical AWS services that you might use. Mm. So again, it depends on what your use case really is. So mm. maybe you can use the Amplify for .NET backend, or if you just want to connect to like an S3 or something using your Unity mm. project, you can do that with the AWS SDK for yep. Unity. No, okay. I can actually comment on this because I've actually worked on a game that's in Steam that uses the AWS SDK. Um, and um, the, in the, what you're saying is correct. So you can't directly use Amplify inside the game, but what you can do is you can build your own, um, let's say, additional API that you want to use from within the game code and actually make calls towards that. So use Amplify to build things um, and set up, for example, authentication, or, and you can handle that then all in your Amplify application. And then from your game, you just call directly into that API like you would any other API um, that you can use for gaming. Got it. OK. But did you like? Did you use like the AWS uh, SDK for like um, the, the 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 game engine? The, was it Lumber, Lumberyard or? Oh. Uh, no, no, no. We just the raw. So um, we we built in integration into uh, an S3 bucket to dump some stats for us. Ah, um, okay. This was many years ago. So this was um, I think Lumberyard didn't exist then. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. What game did you build, Kobus? This is news to me. 
Ooh, it's one of those that uh, you can ask me offline. Um, it's, ah. uh, it, it was an interesting project. It was a, I helped out over weekends. Um, so it wasn't even a paid job. It was literally like I went in and helped them with some of the automation, some of the uh, code bug changes, things. It was a port from a classic Nintendo game to a PC version of it. And um, it was interesting for a number of reasons. One is going from a square screen into widescreen aspect. Mm, okay. um, yeah, and also game development is a lot different to actual normal code development. It's very, very, very different. But it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll tell you offline about the game. It's one of those. I'm not 100 sure how if I'm allowed to say that I work worked on it. I've got it in some places mentioned, but not too publicly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, let's actually address the question from uh, Ganesh. Um, Ganesh asks. Uh, let me just cover you guys up. Oh no. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I missed the local development tools talk. I need to go back and watch it. Was another. Okay. So it was it was my talk, and you were watching Chris's talk. Chris had a great talk mm -hmm. about microservices. Um, so, any high-level thoughts on where were we going with SAM, CDK, etc.? Um, do you mean the, the development path of those things? Where are they going? Um, if if that's so, um, I can only comment that when it comes to like those applications, I mean, we're trying to make them um, easier to use. One of the things you will notice about uh, SAM is that SAM is a transformation on top of AWS CloudFormation that just makes it easier to, for you to write serverless applications, um, while CDK is just enables people. It enables people who are who have experience in coding languages well in, in uh, additional uh, uh, additional languages uh, like python and java and c sharp and whatnot uh, enables those people to write infrastructure code so i think it's more towards enablement and towards the more uh, democratization for the lack of a better term of of, uh, of infrastructure code so because let's face it it's very difficult to do anything concrete on AWS without infrastructure code. And I am very biased, uh, but uh, I, I see that nothing can be done on scale without those kind of things, right? Uh, and just quickly on that, um, I just saw here in our internal chats um, confirmation that we are sharing the on-demand versions of the videos today with all the customers. So if you attended yesterday, please keep an eye on your email. Yeah. You will receive it during the course of the day. Obviously, we can't send out uh, all of the emails in one batch. They yeah. they slowly trickle out, but keep an eye on your inbox. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so guys, um, um, Steve and so on, is there something you would like to address um, on the on the on yesterday's talk something that you would like to follow up on i mean you, we all recorded these talks uh, get a few days back uh, or a few weeks back or maybe just mm. a, a couple of days before but um uh is there something you would like to uh, like a, an addendum to your talks and that you would like to add hmm sorry I was on mute yeah steve go ahead Okay, just one thing. I mean, I did a talk on least privilege. We didn't touch on it when I did when I was just talking a second ago. So, um, which was basically around how users should only have privileges for short-lived periods of time to do only the things that they should be doing. Okay. Um, both users and systems, right? So it was really a talk about how to use assume role effectively in IAM to assume roles um, rather than give permissions directly to users or groups. Um, so just to kind of extend that, because we only had 30 minutes in the talk, I would say one thing to add is that, and there was a question about this actually, I think, um, yesterday, is how can we, you know, that what I, the demo that I did was in a single account, but actually a pattern we see across many larger organizations is that their users will be in a central account and they will assume role in another account. So they may have like a staging account, a dev account, a prod account. So that doesn't just work within the context of that one account. That worked across account as well, I guess, would be like an addendum to add. And that's a pattern that's very popular in our kind of enterprise and large scale customers. You're on mute? I'm on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even the, the, the sorry, StreamYard mute, it's my button mute here. Uh, mm. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> um, all right, um, Sohan, is there anything you would like to add to your um, offline offline talk? Yeah, so I didn't get a chance to do as much a deep dive into conflict resolution and how that actually works, okay. uh, which is very interesting. I'll probably need like like diagrams to say this one says this, but you know I'll, I'll try and explain it. Um, essentially, there is some 
there is conflict resolution that will occur when you're doing real-time apps, right? So if you're doing like say a Google Docs type thing where multiple people are actually operating on the same document at, this, at the same time, uh, how do you actually resolve conflicts? And what happens if one of those people goes offline, the other remains online, but the offline person makes some changes and then appears online. And this could happen in areas where there's like low network or um, maybe you've lost connectivity or your Wi-Fi drops or whatever. So, or ships. Essentially, Oh yeah, or ships, of course, yeah, yeah, or, or you're in a metro, you're going through, whatever. So that can happen. Now, there are a few ways that you can do conflict resolution. Um, what, uh, one of the ways you can actually do it is, or rather there are three ways, right? So there is something called um, auto merge, which is what I spoke about in the talk. There's something called optimistic currency, which okay. is basically when like an incoming mutation is uh, detected to have a version that differs from the actual version of the object. Uh, the conflict handler basically just says, hey, I'm rejecting the incoming request. So you're just choosing like the optimistic version and saying, okay, um, I'm assuming what I have is the best version and I'm rejecting the other one. There is also a feature where you can defer the conflict resolution to a Lambda function, which I think is pretty cool. So you're essentially saying, hey, there is a conflict. Maybe I can set up a bunch of rules in like a Lambda function. Uh, resolve it and then send it back to actually, you know, uh, detect or rather to make that conflict resolution cool. So I thought that was like an interesting way. I spoke about uh, a lot about the auto merge feature and how that works, which is basically say there is uh, user Kobus and Daco. You know what? I'm not going to use two of your names because people are already confused. I'll say Kobus <laughs> and Steven. <laughs> so Kobus and Steven, like Kobus makes a change. Both are online. Uh, Steven gets the latest update. Steven makes a change. Kobus gets the latest update. Now, suppose Steven goes offline and he makes a change and uh, he makes two changes, right? He changes someone's age in like a record. Daco, oh God, Kobus. <laughs> <laughs> well played. I must say, well played, well played. I was, I was reading your names anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got me there. Okay, so, um, and I've lost my train of thought. Thank you. Oh my if God. You're making two changes. <laughs> You were saying if, uh, if Steve goes offline yes. and makes two changes. Yeah, and, uh, and then Kobus is still online, is making a change, and then Steven comes back online. There is something called auto merge that happens. So basically what happens is um, Kobus' version is taken as the next as the actual version that is that everyone gets because he was online and Steven wasn't. And how this works is using something called a monotonic counter. So every change, there is a counter that is incremented automatically by Amplify, by the data stored in Amplify. So I know that sounded a lot very confusing. So I'll just watch my talk on demand, I guess, to make more sense of it. But yeah, that, that's the gist of how things work. I mean, that's very, I think that's very important, right? You know, conflict resolution mm -hmm. on offline applications is, for me, it's very complex, right? When you think about it, if I would build it myself, like I really wouldn't know how to do it. Like how well, yeah. how would you handle those things? And yeah. I think well, that's where the complexity comes in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I think the the challenge there normally is like if it's a conflicting change is the big one because I mean so, if you look at two different changes, if I change first name and you change last name, then those aren't conflicting changes. So you can just merge them in. Yeah. It's the when we change the same field and we do have timestamps because remember because you're offline, even a timestamp doesn't mean it was the correct time because correct. the yeah. system could have been skewed or something like that. Um, and I think yeah. the, the the most fun um, example of this that I um, know of was at a Dev Days uh, open space actually discussion. And Darko, we spoke about this a while back on one of our other uh, sessions where uh, the one person started asking questions about, let's say you are working on an error gap system that only is able to sync every six to nine months and started describing and then randomly someone else in the audience or in that group specifically would be like, which submarine system did you work on? And we're like... Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I did work with a customer who who did a lot of um, um, so they have ships, like let's call it that way. So they have ships, and they can sync their data once a couple of weeks. So basically, mm -hmm. the, the, they don't have satellite communication, at least not with with AWS. So they can only once they come into port, that's where they sync all their data. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's like. Yeah. Uh, Again, a very much uh, an air gap system or a water yeah. gap or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, the, the talk had something interesting about some, something like this with scale, right? So say, you know, you have a ton of ships, each of whom can sync whenever. Now, all of them are making these different ships changes. Oh, ships, my God. Yeah. Sink. <laughs> <laughs> Could have phrased that a little better. Yeah. <laughs> 
What are you okay. thinking about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, there are. Um, it, it's called a, again. Pardon the pun, but delta sync in the sense that the base table isn't updated every time. There is another table which actually keeps track of all the changes. So then if someone comes online, you compare the timestamps of when they came online to their last sync okay. and then just update the rest of the table post the, the last update, right? So you're not actually downloading the entire database again. So you can achieve scale through something like this. Okay. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, okay, so a few more questions here uh, from Ganesh. Are folks adopting the Metadata 2 service? Um, just wondering as it was going to yes. add a lot more security. Mm. I haven't um, checked yeah. it out, but yeah. So basically what it boils down to is you now need to generate a token before you can get the additional information out of a Metadata service um, um, and the additional capabilities in it. Um, and I've seen some people play with it, but um, I actually don't have any hard numbers on whether or not people are actually using it yet or not. So just for those not familiar, the, the metadata service is a HTTP service that's deployed on each EC2 host that you can do, and it's got a fixed IP. So on the, that mis machine, if you make a call against that IP, you can get a lot of interesting information about the instance. For example, the AMI that was used to spin it up, the security groups, the IAM roles, um, networking information, like a whole host of things. And we've released a second version of that, which, because uh, previously you could just make the call command and get that information. Where now there is a, a step where you actually have to generate the token first, and once you have the token, you can actually make that call. Okay. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think the reason it was updated and why it was supposed to be more secure is that you touched briefly, but the IAM roles and the access keys are accessible via that metadata mm -hmm. service. So if you have an EC2 instance role that's attached to your mm -hmm. instance, um, that is how the AWS SDK gets the credentials to do what it needs to do. Mm. Now, of course, least privilege, you should be using least privilege in your EC2 instance roles. Um, but mm. the, the risk was that things like um, uh, SSRF attacks and things like this were potentially open if you're using things like reverse proxies and they were incorrectly mm. configured, people were able to access that metadata service from outside yeah. of your instance, basically, which is um, which was a misconfiguration thing, I guess, but it was a it was a potential vulnerability in the attack surface that was mm. could have been present without you knowing uh, or clearly knowing. So um, what we did is you have to request this token, and specifically this token to request it, you have to use a, a put method, um, and that's important because most uh, reverse proxies and WAFs don't allow put methods, so they can't come in from outside of the instance, and also it, the Instance metadata service two doesn't allow the doesn't accept anything with the X forwarded for HTTP header, okay. which if you use a reverse proxy, you will have the X forwarded for header of where the request was forwarded from, the IP address of where the request was forwarded from. So the metadata service blocks those requests as well. So by making you have to do this put request first to get the token, adds in additional layer of security. So if you're using the metadata service, you should probably upgrade because it's yeah. more so secure and it saves yeah. you any risk of misconfiguration, causing you a, a hiccup. But do least privilege on your IAM roles as well. So for all the uh, all the uh, EC2 users out there, metadata is definitely the a better metadata two upgrade is is better is the better better approach when it comes to security for sure. Hmm. Um, okay, uh, we are at the one and a half hour mark uh, in this stream. So in a minute, this is going to be the longest stream we ran. Uh, <laughs> so I just no, no, we've done one thirty one. We did? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so just I let me do a recap. It. Let me do a recap for all the people who are joining, uh, who have not been here since the start. Um, this is a stream where we, um, basically, this is a four hour long mega stream. We're going to be streaming this uh, for the next two and a half hours. So until 1 p.m. Central European time. Um, and this is a stream, basically a follow up on yesterday's modern application dev day. So if you missed it, yesterday we had a modern application dev day online, which was a, which was a virtual conference where we had 12 sessions across three tracks where we talked about uh, deep dive technical topics regarding modern application development. So we have a few of us here who have spoken during the session and we're going to go ahead and answer questions from you in the chat. So feel free to ask us any questions in the chat. And also we have a, a range of questions from yesterday we're going to try to address today. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in any of this, please, um, um, please follow along. <laughs> um, excellent. So uh, all right. Um, let's actually uh, address a few questions that have came in to the to the well to the audience here. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. I'm so going to drop off, folks. I have a webinar, but I will join back. Thank at you, Sohan. And see, see you around. around. Yeah. See you all, all right. around. Bye, Sohan. Bye. Okay. Um, there's a question from Lev. Uh, Lev has claimed Cloud9 can be used for pre pair programming. Um, uh, maybe Lev, you missed the beginning of the set of the of the of the, of the event. Kobus uh, and I actually demoed uh, Cloud9. Uh, mm. Uh, live, yes, it can. So you can do pair programming with with two people or multiple people within the same editor. Kobus, are you connected still to the? Um, um, give me a second to confirm. Yeah, so I can I, we can, we can show this to you if possible. But um, so this is how a Cloud9 editor looks like. I'm currently logged in. I have shared this uh, environment uh, with Kobus, so Kobus have permit has permissions to access it. Uh, if he joins here, you will see like a pop-up on this uh, right-hand corner. And there we go. Kobus has joined. Uh, and you see the letter C here. And uh, Kobus is now typing the text while I have my hands here, right? <laughs> Change to Java. Yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is a great tool to kind of onboard folks, uh, onboard people to... And that's your question, actually. Can you onboard people to your uh, environment or, or development team using Cloud9? I think that's a great way to do this because you can uh, basically... <laughs> uh, wait, I have a question from somebody coming in here. Um, so uh, uh, <laughs> you have a really nice collaborating tool, collaboration tool here uh, that can help you basically... Um, well, have, have a common development, development environment across... Um, all the folks in your team. So with all the tooling, with all the all the all the things, and it's not just about having a single development environment. Especially if you're working on multiple projects, I find it very useful to have a environment per project because I just have all the things installed there, and I can just throw it away if I don't need it anymore. So I think this is a, this is a very very neat feature and uh, worthwhile. So yeah. All right. Uh, uh, this have not open source. Um, you can self host. No. 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 Um, I do believe Cloud9 can connect to other instances or not. Oh, you... uh, yes, yes, you can. You can. Yes. Um, hmm. Okay, so uh, lost algorithm, the question here popping up. Uh, you can actually um, um, install Cloud9 on whatever, right? So if you have a server at home, if you have an instance, if you have something that can be reached through the grasp of the internet, uh, Cloud9 can actually set up that locally. So that's a way to do it. Mm. A lot of people don't do that. Uh, I have not actually seen somebody do that, but I'm uh, not saying that it's bad. It's just that I've not fiddled around with it. I think there are some requirements that you need to fill out, but uh, you can set, a, set it up locally, so for sure. And there's more and information. To... supports Cloud9 as well, doesn't it? So yes. I can yeah. like, spin up consistent development environments. Exactly, exactly. Or different members mm. of my team or different groups. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the whole point, right? And one of the things that I've been doing is, especially because I have a bunch of laptops and, and workstations, I'm a big fan of Vim and I like my configuration with me and all that stuff. But sometimes when I want something that just, just works out of the box uh, and I want to have it uh, like consistent across whatever I work, I just spin up a Cloud9 environment and I'm sure that that will work for me, uh, even if I log on Windows or Linux or, or, or Mac OS or, or whatever has a browser on it. So I've seen somebody log in. Who was it? Somebody logged in through Cloud9 on their Tesla. So, like, mm. you can use the Tesla window, <laughs> Tesla, mm. Tesla screen, and just... That was Randall. Randall. That was Randall. Randall. That's, right. a, that's a very, yeah, a Randall thing. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, quick question here. So, this one that we have is, which environment, Windows or Linux, would be better to set up as a local developer environment, and what's the best way to set up a local developer environment? So, uh, when you look at the way... I'd, I don't want to phrase it quite as the way the world is moving, um, but... A lot of software is developed on Linux. Um, so you want to be able to run some form of Linux uh, to actually to run the software. It doesn't mean you have yeah. to develop on Linux. Um, but you want your code to be able to run on Linux. I mean, um, especially with containers, because containers are super popular. Um, a lot of the stuff, uh, and that there is containers for Windows, and uh, they are different. But mostly people use uh, Linux-based containers, which means that you need um, some kind of interface where you can probably work with Docker and Linux-based tooling. Um, so the good news there is that you've got a lot of choices nowadays because if you go, and let me just quickly open up a screen here, um, and there we go, share this one. So this is my second machine over here that I use for my streaming and things, um, and it is Windows, but I have got Windows subsystem for Linux. So if I go um, just quickly, one of Docker's commands, he loves NeoFetch, you can see over here that I'm actually running uh, Ubuntu 
on this machine. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm also playing around a little bit with uh, Kali Linux at the moment, uh, which is the security distribution um, of Linux. We've got a lot of pre tools in. So um, here I've got a full Linux environment that I can play with. If you're using uh, Mac OS, um, the Mac OS subsystem is it's a Unix based. It's not Linux. Be very clear about it. it's Unix based, not necessarily exactly the same. There are subtle differences there. But I mean, pick the one that works for you and go ahead and um, uh, what you have and start playing with it. Yeah. Uh, one caveat, though, is Windows Subsystem for Linux does have some interesting caveats here and there, but nothing too much. But definitely go read up on the caveats. Um, I think, Docker, you had experience with this. Maybe tell us uh, a little bit. Yeah, my, my, my problem with Windows for subs Windows Subsystem for Linux, while it's amazing, especially the version 2, version 1 was, um, eh, uh, it was had issues with writing to disk. It was slow. It was not, not, not that good, but it was better than anything you had. Um, uh, my problem is, uh, especially when you're, if you're running an AMD processor, uh, uh, nested uh, virtualization doesn't work with Ryzen um, yet. So they have an, it's patched, but in, the, in an insider build of Windows, unless you're running an insider build of Windows, it will not work for you. So like if you want to run QMU, QA, QA, QMU, 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 virtualization KVM on, <laughs> on Windows Subsystem for Linux, uh, uh, it will not work. Uh, I, I like it. I mean, it works just great. I mean, I, I run even graphical applications on my WSL. Uh, works amazing. So um, if you're running Windows for some reason, um, I run it for games, right, and streaming. Um, it's it's just great. Um, I think the, the answer here to, to Brett would be, um, I would say that in this day and age, whatever you are most comfortable with is the best way. And also... Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to develop .NET applications, use Windows, right? I, I mean, you can develop .NET on Linux, right? That's no problem. But I would I would highly advise that you do it on Windows because um, there's tooling better suited around it. And I, I would say that this we tend to fall into a, this pitfall when it comes to development. Um, we want to use all the tools that people other people use because they're cool or whatnot. Use the tool that does your job the best, right? Mm -hmm. If you find a tool that just works with your work you don't want you don't want to you don't want to try to um you know jump over hurdles in your application development you want to just have thing that does just works so that's yeah, my knowledge works for you. i think that's good advice i think there's some good tooling available as well if you look at like sam local for example and some of the cli with sam yeah. that has a really nice um way to invoke stuff locally but one of the features it has is and i've hit this a few times where i use mac os and I have a dependency that's working locally in my Python code, and then I go to package it for Lambda, and it doesn't work because yeah. the dependency was compiled on uh, Mac OS and not on Amazon Linux. So, uh, like Sam, Sam has a really nice function where you can actually package using a container, yeah. and it actually spins up a container that runs the same execution environment as Lambda. It stores mm -hmm. all your dependencies from your requirements.txt, and then packages them up to load to to Lambda, which is really nice because you actually can develop anywhere, but package your application in an environment that looks similar. So the tooling is becoming more kind of friendly to develop where you're comfortable, I would say. Exactly. I think like mm -hmm. thanks to containers, we have all those things available wherever we we can. We can, right? So we don't have to worry about too much about, you know, which OS you're running right now. And again, things have been changed. Things have things have things have changed in the last five years. If you would ask me five years ago, I would probably say use Linux or Mac OS, but um Windows is good now when it comes to those things. Um, okay. Um, let me answer a quick question here from Max Payne Life. Um, Max Payne asked, um, uh, has anybody used DC2 to, to play Steam games? I want to play Among Us, but I'm mostly on Mac OS. I have. Um, it's possible. Um, Max Payne Life, I would just advise you that you'll be close to a data center. Otherwise, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> there's this thing called on Steam, there's, th there's this thing called Steam Remote where you can basically mm -hmm. remote play your games. Uh, so you can run Steam on your desktop or EC2 mm -hmm. and just stream them through the internet to wherever, right? Um, go ahead. There's a big fun one over here. So if you do do this, and like I did, you had a, because this gaming machine I actually had in another room at one point, and because yep. I was thinking I could do everything off my Mac. I've got a big screen here, let me do that. So I yep. put it over there. and. Um, it was fine until it stopped working after a reboot. And I'm like, okay. and the, the, it stopped working because there was no mouse cursor. No matter what I did, there was no mouse cursor on Windows. I even reinstalled Windows. And yeah. learned afterwards that if you don't have a mouse plugged into Windows, there will be no mouse cursor if you connect to it locally or remotely. So yeah. 
Leave him out Okay, okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, um, I've, I've, I've did Steam, Steam Remote Play on at home uh, by having a PC on the other room. Well, actually, PC here, and then uh, I have the Steam... Uh, I'm not sure if it's here. I have the Steam link. Uh -huh. Steam used to sell a link. It's like a little box that would just basically stream your Steam setup somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, works great. Um, but uh, if you do it on an EC2, uh, uh, <laughs> be careful. You just have to be closer mm -hmm. to, to, to where you want to play with. Right? Yeah. So that, that's my comment on that. <clears throat> there's some cool tech out there. I don't really know if it's used for games, but there's some. It's an acquisition uh, Amazon made, actually, of a company called Nice DCV. It's a okay. protocol that's used in the high performance computing space quite a lot. So uh, it's, it's amazing. I used to work with our industrial customers quite a lot in the UK. And the big challenge is like you need a big beefy machine locally to do CAD CAM type work because okay. the, the response time on the visualization just in the rendering just isn't good enough. Um, but nice DCV actually pretty much 99% of the time solves that problem and actually somehow compresses stuff enough to give you a really usable experience remotely. I think it's been pretty popular during this pandemic yeah. actually for yeah. those industries. Um, um i don't know if it's been used for games but it um but it's worth maybe looking at maybe yep. you can set up a nice dcv client um uh, for gaming and you may be able to get that same kind of level of low latency from a gaming gpu yeah. server on ec2 to your local client and that's an interesting point so like um as being i mean i'm not sure about you guys but my experience so far as a developer sysadmin was like i need a terminal and i need remote desktop and a, and a text editor that's all i need for my for my compute needs uh, well in 2020 i need a laptop or something that i can stream from but uh, uh before it was just i need something that works like you know i can i can run my entire business off you know like a a 10 year old um, lenovo laptop right or even well, this is older but uh but my wife is a graphics designer she does 3d art and um, so for her to do something, I gave her like, oh, I'll just buy you a MacBook. And we got a MacBook. And boy, that doesn't work. <laughs> like doing like 3D art and like um, uh, something on a, on a like proper sculpting and, and, and rendering and blender and whatnot. It, it doesn't work on a MacBook. I mean, not at least on the mid-range MacBooks. So um, <laughs> we have to, I had to end, end up and okay, okay. I ended up uh, basically... Um, getting her like a big old beefy laptop to do that but one thing i'm thinking and this is something that um, you, you mentioned steve like using ec2 instances or using um, services on aws to like do rendering is very convenient now right back in the old days people used to render uh, uh used to uh, rent like render farms for these things but now you can spin up an ec2 instance in a couple of you know minutes and then render, render your project instead of wasting like a week on it at home <laughs> you know banging yeah. your laptop you can do it on EC2. Yeah, there's some um, great case studies. Um, even like, not even a new thing. Like, uh, I remember when I joined AWS like seven years ago, there was a case study at reInvent. I forget the company's name. They were a film studio in California. Yeah. And they were, they built integration into their tools that they could build these, uh, you know, these complex video uh, green screen setups or whatever locally. Okay. And then they would be able to just press a button and it would spin up a render farm on EC2 to go and do all the rendering for them um and they were able to deliver stuff so much quicker and at so much lower cost because they were just paying for that render time and turning stuff off exactly them. exactly exactly so like i'm probably using I'm, spot as well actually i think yeah yeah exactly and, the, and why not like yeah. I, I i have a friend like he he has a, um, a design studio and he does like 3d and 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 web design and whatnot and he went off and purchased like this big old workstation so they can render something and it literally takes them two weeks to render something like it takes them two weeks to render like a video and i'm like man why don't you just do that like there are services out there where you can pay a couple of bucks uh, you know i'm not sure how much that costs like but it, instead of two weeks you're going to render it for a day and i'm not sure it's not going to cost like hundreds of euros right so um it is it is uh, and he paid for that workstation like a couple of thousands of euros to make it work but it still takes so much time and effort so right there and are we tools. have AppStream as well i just reminded myself of AppStream. AppStream uh, yeah. aware of Amazon AppStream. it used to be a, a service where we would it's actually AppStream 2.0 because the service was rebuilt yeah. a few years back uh initially it was um Forget what its initial. Went. I think it was actually targeted at like um, mobile apps. So having mobile yeah. apps across like legacy devices, so you just stream the pixels. Yeah. Um, but they rebuilt the platform, and it's you can now use it for kind of you know kind of Citrixy like way. I don't know if they would yeah. if that's yeah, the yeah. right way to compare it, but like you can stream apps. <laughs> um, yeah. 
but they also have a GPU option as well, I believe. So yeah, yeah. that was also reasonably popular in the customers I was working with a few years ago. And that's also one of the street, one of the, one of the services people don't usually uh, kind of talk about. But Atrium is really like I remember once somebody asked me, "Oh, I want to set up Citrix because I can. I want to stream like um, 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 what is it called, uh, Microsoft Office to my customers." I'm like, just use AppStream. Like, it, and I in front of in front of that lady, I just took my laptop and set up AppStream like right right then and there, right. and it just works right. Uh, it was AppStream 1.0 back then, I believe, uh, still. Uh, but uh, right. uh, you basically can, in a couple of clicks, get a, a GPU-enabled application to do those things for you. Yeah, so I had a customer that I was working with that had a, a they, interesting company. They had a software solution. They sold to like 50 or 60 large, the largest kind of manufacturing, like CAD CAM design, okay. and, and mechanical engineer companies in the world. I forget the specific sectors a few years back. But... They were trying to make their application SaaS, and of course, like if you need this high GPU power, making it a software as a service in your browser is like questionable, right? You yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thing on Lambda and serverless, right? You need this GPU power. So they actually used AppStream APIs to wrap their SaaS platform. So basically, oh. they had their legacy, and this is quite a popular pattern actually for people taking legacy apps yeah. and SaaSifying them, is they take the legacy app running on EC2 AppStream, and then they wrap the the basically the window yeah. in a browser. So now yeah. they've got a multi-tenant SaaS version of their product that just runs on a shared kind of EC2 backend. It's really cool. That, that's very cool. Without having to re-engineer it or innovate in some way, you know, in terms of actually delivering it in a client side. Yeah, that's that's also like there was a question yesterday. Uh, was it yesterday or a few? Uh, I think it was yesterday. Somebody asked like uh, when it comes to like uh, moving stuff to the cloud, like oh, how much, should I spend time to like uh, re-engineer my stuff or do I just lift and shift right? Or should nobody lift and shift? And I think this case, what you said, like that's a lift and shift example. And um, even though it's not just a lift and shift in a traditional sense where you move your EC2 instance or you move your service to AWS, but this is like lifting and shifting your application to a SaaS model. And the reason to yeah. do that is like time to market. It's much, much faster. I have a big bugbear around that whole, like that whole thing winds me up a bit because uh, yeah. I'm going to have a bit of a rant now. But like, right. I think industry, like legacy technology yeah. industry, um, the old guard, let's call them, have convinced a lot of people that you need to yeah. re-architect and refactor apps to move them to the cloud, which is completely false. You know, me yeah. and you both know that you can lift and shift, you can run on EC2, you can use EC2 and EBS as a minimum requirement if you need to, and get pretty much the same as what you, you know, the same if not better than you can get from most on-premises uh, setups. But I find that industry is kind of convinced. I get a lot of customers talk to me and go, well, I'd love to use the, the AWS, but I need to refactor my app or I need to make it cloud native. And this is just not yeah. the case. You know, you can definitely take a more gradual approach and, you know, to that. Um, so yeah, don't, don't uh, be sucked into some of the kind of, uh, I don't know, fud out there about, uh, about that stuff. You can most definitely, we have customers that are running what would be maybe traditionally virtualized applications in AWS as their first step into the cloud and that's completely yeah. acceptable and feasible and works well for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I agree, I agree. And there's no need for like, sometimes it's it's just perfectly fine to to lift and shift. Uh, again, if, if your if your task is to, um, to um, uh, if, your, if your goal is time to market, to, to move faster to the cloud, lifting and shifting is perfectly fine. I mean, you can definitely, uh, definitely move later on, right? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Cool. Yeah, um, and there's patterns for that as well. We spoke about that yesterday in the dev day. You know, there's patterns for taking that single application, then breaking it off, and maybe moving to microservices with like using ALB and doing layer seven routing for specific paths and stuff like that. So there's there's patterns for for migrating, and we've got tons of documentation and experience on that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Jay plus C plus M, who I think is someone that I used to work with about 10 years ago. Oh. Um, I don't know, I don't have access to put it on the screen, but in, uh, I don't know if you've got broadcaster access here, but. Uh, yes, I uh, do. Uh, which one is it? Uh... Uh, a three part question. Uh -huh. Okay, I got it. Uh -huh. the wave. Yeah. Go. Um, yeah, so over what time scale do you see the serverless becoming the norm? I think this is Jonathan, by the way. Hello, mm -hmm. good to see you here. <laughs> uh, the alias is uh, uh, something I remember. Uh, so uh, a three-part question, over what time scale do you see serverless becoming the norm in AppDev? What are the biggest challenges you see customers experience that stop them going all in? And what can we do to help pave the way inside orgs that aren't ready? Got, I don't know what are your thoughts on that, Darko. You 
Well, so so my, my, my thoughts here are about when it comes to uh, serverless applications. Hey, welcome back, Obus. Um, my thoughts on, uh, on serverless applications is uh, that they are the norm right now. I mean, you know, especially when we talk about the cloud. And serverless is a lot more than just Lambda functions, right? So people tend to have this tunnel vision is like my serverless application needs to be Lambda. Um, serverless is an operating model. So if you're using some fully managed services from AWS, such as, you know, even code tools or Cognito, or if you're using some of our security tools and, and, and management tools, a lot of those fully managed things that you don't have to worry about are already serverless, right? In, in your eyes, you don't have to provision things that they on, work on demand and those kind of things. Um, I see a lot more people, you know, adopting it. And I think um, if you have the ability, you should definitely... Uh, you should definitely um, uh, adopt those kind of things, right? So, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. there are different opinions of that. Um, while I am, I'm coming from a traditional background. Uh, I still like my servers and all that stuff. I, I would not build an application now that is not serverless. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And I think to your second part of your question about what can we do to help pave the way inside dogs that aren't ready? I think it is a lot like that's what we do a lot every day as our role as evangelists. We so we used to be called, you know, and we are kind of evangelizing or advocating for modern application development techniques to our customers and to our colleagues and and what have you. So um, yeah. I think um, I think you need to be mindful that not everything is a kind of clean cut, rosy yeah. environment where Absolutely. you can just go and build a greenfield serverless environment. You have to be respectful of the, the customer situation. Um, and it's not always going to be like, oh, yeah, sure, you can just move that whole thing to serverless because there's right. dependencies. There's maybe business, there's time to market, there's time to do that. You know, there may be lots of tightly coupled services and it may not right now be the right thing to do from a business perspective um, right. or even over the long term because there might be a plan to rebuild the application down the future or re you know, change the direction. So I think you need to be mindful that not everything's going to go to serverless and just you can earn a lot of credibility and trust from the clients, I think and that you're probably talking about internal clients you know, and the organizations you're working in mm -hmm. um, by doing so. So, so yeah, and, and I think what's stopping them going all in, um, there's a few things, really cool technical features that have been added to Lambda uh, specifically. I know you're saying, I know serverless isn't just Lambda, but I think there's some stuff in the compute space which has been really impactful. Uh, obviously, extending the function time out from five to 15 minutes, a year or two ago is a really big one. Um, adding a support for EFS, so you yeah. can bring bigger packages to Lambda now as well. You can use that, actually have a POSIX compliant file system. We actually had the question yesterday on our open office hours of why can't I just use S3? Uh, where, why do I need EFS, can't I use S3? Well, having a file system means you can actually bring bigger packages now. You can load your right. dependencies and stuff onto that file system. So that solves a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then Lambda extensions, which we launched last week, which is just allows you to really, get, you know, you spoke about this earlier in the stream. I don't know if, uh, Mm. I'm sure everyone wasn't here, but Lambda extension is super powerful for integrating with like traceability and observability tools and stuff like that, security tools, getting secrets in a secure and consistent way from uh, Vault and uh, Secrets Manager and things like yeah. that. App Config, I think there's an extension for that. Um, so, so the tooling has come a long way in terms of enabling applications that weren't available before as well. And, and I think the problem mm. is that's moving so fast that quite often people are busy with their day jobs. They don't realize how far it's come as well. So I think keeping yourself yeah. educated, keeping on top of the blogs, the news and stuff is yeah. really important so that you can but I mean, handle those objections effectively. So just one quick thing that you touched on there is the fact that not all projects will be greenfield. Let's start from scratch and build things Absolutely. is actually true for probably 99% of projects. And the, the, the point of my career when I found that I became super valuable in literary is it was a case of I didn't do interviews anymore. I went for a lunch, I went for a coffee, and then people would hire me. That was literally a discussion around what are you trying to do was because I was really good at taking existing applications and modifying them. Whether it's moving to a new database or automating them or just doing config management, it's that is probably one of the biggest things. Because remember, a lot of people view this a legacy system is bad. We don't want to touch yeah. legacy system, it's old. But the real definition of a legacy system is a system that works well enough that it doesn't need to be changed and it's making the company money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is probably the number one career advice that I can give you is don't always try and chase the shiny. Um, and yes, modernize. By no means, I'm not saying don't modernize, but understand there is a massive value in firstly, working with the legacy services and the integration points because you don't want to keep building new things. And there are sometimes weird ways you need to take um, do this integration, but it's for a business reason. Because remember, you're there to provide business value, not write code. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
on that note, gentlemen, I'm just going to go get some water. I'm just going to drop off, off, off the screen right sure. now and be back in mm. a couple of minutes. Okay? Cool. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, yeah, that's a good point, uh, Kai, was just touch, touch on what you were saying yeah. there. I think the um, I had actually worked with a customer. Funnily enough, it was the first customer that I met my first week that I joined AWS in 2013. And they'd had a consultancy in to help them with this application and moving it to like a more, actually, it was more of a migration just to lift and shift to the cloud. And uh, they actually chose not to migrate it because the outcome of the consultancy was that it was so tightly coupled. There was too many dependencies on like legacy Oracle databases and, and stuff um, that they actually said it's going to cost us too much money and too much time to to move this application uh, to the cloud. Um, we're going to spin up a team that's going to be single threaded on rebuilding the whole application in the cloud native way. It's kind mm. of interesting. So they like it's not always about lifting and shifting stuff as well it's about thinking about you know that's a problem it's easy for us as you know to stand on a on a dev day and in the perfect environment run our demo mm. but when we speak to customers in the real world you know sometimes the business you know benefit of doing mm. something doesn't weigh up you know if you can actually go and rebuild or so refactor and uh, uh, and we host sometimes works but sometimes just starting from fresh is a good idea as well Mm. No, definitely. Um, I mean, I've had, had that quite often as well. It's like literally, obviously, rewriting an entire system does come with a risk um, because you are assuming that you're able to document and understand all the behavior of the system. Um, and a good example of this is that I know some um, there's some customers that are still running mainframe systems in the background. They actually integrated their modern systems into the mainframe. And the reason for this is that it's a super complex um, system that calculates interest and future values of um, uh, things. and because of that, not all of that is documented, but they know that system does work. So it's better for the business for continuity to keep that mainframe running and actually have mainframe developers still adding a little bit of features to it and while they start and build the second system, but it'll take years to actually extract all of that logic and things out. Um, so it's software development is fun. It's interesting. It's uh, um, yeah. but you, you've got a bit of, so the first part is every problem is actually a, a per, per people problem. It's not a technical problem because we can throw tech at it all day. Um, but the most fun I had recently was the archaeology aspect of it is where you go through what happened in the past and understanding the decisions that were made within the constraints that they were made, because it's very easy to just walk in and say, oh, this is a bad code because you're not doing it. Um, and I think a lot of people do that. Where Let's go back and understand first what was happening because People don't make bad mistakes because they wake up one morning saying, today I'm going to screw over people and make this stupid choice in code. Um, you make it based on what you thought was the best thing at that time, um, which is interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, let's quickly look at some questions. There's a couple of ones here. Um, there's a bit of chatter around lift and shift. Um, I don't know if you covered the lift and shift um, during... I think it's actually kind of off the back of this discussion around saying uh, the question before where we were talking a little bit about stuff. But I think it's a little bit of, I don't know if there's many questions there looking through the chat. I think it's more of a kind of acknowledgement of some of the things, you know, lift and shift. Mm. I think Ganesh makes a good point. You know, sometimes there's a compelling event in your business, data center closure, lease running out on a building. And that's sometimes where we see a, a trigger for a, a hard kind of lift and shift as well. Mm. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's a fair point. We see that quite often as well. Cool. Um, um, for those that have joined us in the last um, few minutes, uh, I just want to check. Oh, it's actually not all, all on the hour. Let's wait for the hour to do before I do that little segment again, because we normally have people on the hour joining again. Um, what I think we can do is we can take a look at some more of the questions that we had yesterday, because there were quite a number um, of ones that came up during the session. Um, let me just have a look here quickly. Um, so. Steve, here's one from your session, which is the principles of least um, privilege. Um, the question was, could you demonstrate how to create and manage multiple organization accounts? For example, I want my developers to work at different projects and unaware of each other. They should not see each other's servers and any services. Yeah, and I think actually it's a good point. Is that it's actually a, well, I, I suppose you should always ask why do they not need to see each other's things or right? uh, mm. seeing stuff is normally normally not much of a risk uh but if they can't action on stuff <laughs> that's typically okay but um but from a from an account organization perspective there's a few reasons why you would potentially operate in that model anyway where you'd have a different account per microservice or a different account per, per application in your in your um in your business but aws account this is what i'm talking about mm. um the um the the 
a good practice is to have an individual account for uh, each application, but also an individual workload, let's call it, and, it, and an, each, each, and an individual account for each environment as well. So development and prod would be separate. Now, this is really important part of kind of account structure. Um, there's a really interesting uh, reason why I've had a lot of customers sometimes say, well, we just use one account for prod dev and staging and we use IAM permissions to make sure that people can't touch stuff. That's that's OK. That can work. It can get pretty busy and pretty complex in your IAM configs, to be quite frank. Um, I think a better option is to have centralized identity and then you would assume role in your dev account. So you, you're deliberately taking the task of assuming a specific role in a specific account because then you know that you're mm -hmm. you, you, there's the kind of psychological effort of doing that as well add to you know you know that you've just moved into that account you have to oh i don't have permission to i don't know i can't see prod here so now i need to kind of come back out and assume we're on a different account so that mm. makes you think differently about what you do from a risk perspective i guess you, you know, things you would do in prod maybe you shouldn't access prod at all to be quite frank uh, but things you do in in, in dev and staging may be different so mm. having different accounts is important from that perspective um it's also important um Interestingly, this is an interesting use case that someone showed me. Uh, hello, welcome back. Hello. Uh, that someone uh, mentioned to me about three or four years ago, and I hadn't really picked up on it uh, to be completely transparent. Is AWS has, uh, if you thrash an AWS API, you can get throttled, right? So if you're putting too much stuff on the EC2 control plane, mm. for example, you know, querying the list instances too many times, you can get throttled. That, that's, that's there for good reason, right? Um, but let's say I write a bad bit of code in dev that queries the EC2 list API too much or queries S3 get object too much. And all of a sudden my prod application stops working because it's in the same AWS account and my account's been throttled. Yep. And this Brilliant. was the kind of trigger for me when I heard this, I was like, right, you definitely need to run dev and prod in separate accounts. Yeah. Like that is the one reason, if any, that should stop you doing it separately. It's like, you don't want a bad piece of code in dev mm. to impact prod. Um, and that's a good example, I think, of why. So, um, so yeah, you should definitely isolate your uh, developers in different accounts. They should have I am uh, permissions to assume I am roles only for the things that they're working on. There's actually another really cool feature of I am. Uh, you can actually use condition keys to do something called attribute-based access control or tag-based access control. Yeah. Um, so what this means is this is a little bit complex to explain. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a little bit complex to explain without a screen, but ultimately, if a you can say in the conditions that you can only take this action on this resource if your tag is the same as the resource. Okay. So if I've assumed a role with the tag of Project X, I can only do stop instance on instances that have a tag of Project X. Yeah. This is really powerful mm -hmm. because it scales really well. You tag your users with attributes, and then they can just access the stuff they need to access throughout your account. Exactly. And what's even cooler is a lot of our identity providers like uh, Ping and Oxer and stuff, they allow you to pass attributes through when you do single sign-on into AWS. So you, you use single sign-on, you assume the role via that third-party identity provider, and then with that, you pass attributes from Ping yeah. or Okta or whatever into your role that you're... It's a bit weird because you can't ever see that you've got those tags on the role because the role isn't actually tagged. But as you assume that role, you inherit those tags. So you can actually do this all the way from third party identity provider through to action on resource. And that's a really powerful way to kind of make sure that at the user space, you're tagging people with the right attributes. And then when it comes to what they do in the cloud, they just dynamically have permissions to do what they can and can't do based on how they're tagged. Uh, uh, there's a talk I did on this at the EMEA summit online uh, called, and there's some, if you search for, I'll put one in the chat, but at reInvent, mm. um, uh, da, 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 what's the lady's name? I forgot her name now. Uh, da, 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 no. Uh, anyway, there's someone on the a product man, uh, head of software development, Bridget Johnson. Bridget Johnson. She did a great talk on this exact same topic: how you can scale permissions management with attribute-based access control. They call it. Okay. So search for ABAC AWS reinvent mm -hmm. or reinforce. There's some great talks there from Bridget on on that topic with handheld demos on how you can set that up. Interesting about the attribute uh, attribute based uh, access control, right? So, uh, you know, I, I was like, when I was growing up, my always thing was like RBAC, role based access control. But attribute is something that's relatively new. And I think that's, as you said, it's a very, very flexible. Um, mm. Or it gives you the ability to uh, have, I would say, relatively dynamic 
permissions instead of assigning specific roles. You know, because you, we usually, usually used to box uh, people or or roles into roles, right? And uh, that would be relatively rigid because you would have to have somebody update the roles or give that role specific additional permissions. But if you do things with attributes, it's in my in my head, it's very dynamic and very flexible, right? And as you say, scale. Yeah, and there's a bit of a caveat just to put this in the real world a, a little bit is that not all services are supported today for attribute or tag based access control. Um, they, this come in, a lot of them are working. I know a lot of the teams are working on it. So, but yeah. there are some cases where you have to kind of do attribute based access control yeah. in a in a bit of a hackier way. So, yeah. a, a, a kind of workaround for that for anyone looking at this is you can do things like let's take a lambda function for example, invoking a lambda function. I don't believe it may do now, but I don't believe it supported. Yeah. Tag based access mm. control conditions. So you can do things like you can actually use conditions to say you can only trigger a lambda function if the name of the lambda function is the same as your yeah. tag, for that's example. Good. So that that's may good. be a, like kind of like that's a way to kind of hack it. It's a bit, it's not perfect because you don't have a tag on the lambda function that you can change as easily, but you can do it using names as well if you if you need to as well. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's actually um, just answer a few things here in the chat. Let me look at this thing. First of all, uh, Savio, good day, twins. Hello, hi. Uh, <laughs> we are, in fact, not twins, but uh, well, we tend to confuse The irony people. is that I am actually an identical twin, right? This is a fun thing, right? Oh, yeah. I Steve actually have an identical a, twin. Yeah, identical twin. It <laughs> works for... And it works for... You, your, your brother works for Microsoft, right? So <laughs> that's yeah, a yeah. very interesting yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> love that um and a question from bram 91 do you also take questions here or only on twitter so bram you need to send your questions in a mail uh send it to p of no, you can ask here of course <laughs> also you just asked the question so i guess we can make ask, take questions so yeah uh, go yeah. ahead <laughs> um all right so Lost algorithm, this is the question. Uh, is this a loaded question, sir? Um, how do you feel, folks feel about multi-cloud and hybrid development setup deployments moving forward? Uh, that's the Roman salute, right? Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Kobus, go ahead. You can, you can, we can I've, answer this question. I, I can start with this because I've got very strong opinions with this because I've dealt with this a couple of times before joining at AWS. So, okay. um, before joining, I mainly built system on, on AWS, but I also built some on some of the other cloud providers. And I was on a project or two where the how we want to go multi-cloud because we don't want to worry about getting locked in. Um, and it is challenging for a very large number of reasons and also frustrating and also inefficient. Um, because the big challenge is that when you think of cloud, um, think of AWS, think of all the yeah. services, think about the complexity of how and the amount of knowledge you need to operate on it. Now double it because it's not like one cloud is exactly the same as the other cloud. So you have to yeah. then learn two clouds. Developers don't like that. So that's that's a lot of work. Then if you think about it, okay, now that I've learned these two clouds, they are different. Which means like if I want to build something, now I want to go like let's say I want to use um, SQS that yeah. might not be available on or similar enough thing on something else. So I now go build my own system on top of this. So I waste a lot of time because I can't get uh, feature parity between the different clouds and that wastes a lot of time as well. And then also at the end of the day, when you think about it, like things like volume discount, when you start using more in the one cloud versus another cloud is um, you only get a bit of the discount both sides instead of like a larger discount if you stick with one. There's a whole list of reasons, but it also boils down to you're building for something that you might never ever need in the future. Um, yeah. So what I always say is pick a cloud, go with that cloud, build on it. Um, and then if you are concerned about getting, um, wanting to move at some point, put a small workload on that other one. Just make sure that you're comfortable. We've tested it out. We've got an idea of what it looks like, how it works, and do that. Because, I mean, it's I've seen so many people build their own queuing systems because, no, we can't use hosted queues um, yeah. on the cloud provider because what if they change it? It's like, no, no, don't. Please don't. Please don't. And this is where the, where the topic of, of vendor lock-in uh, comes into question is... Um, um, it's it's uh, and this is a a weird non-answer, but it's not vendor lock and it's cost of transition, right? Um, vendor lock in seems very much like you can never move away. You can always move away. It doesn't matter. Like yeah. you can, you can, and you've moved away many times from different technologies. I bet, right? I I hope you have. If you have not, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but uh, it's a cost of transition. So you have to calculate how much will it cost you to transition from from vendor A to vendor B. And uh, is that more costly than maintaining uh, skill set, tooling, and different frameworks, platforms across multiple of them just so you can avoid a potential uh, 
migration in the future. So uh, that is a uh, that is, that is that is the point here, right? So um, hybrid setup. The added cost to that TCO, by the way, just on that point you made, Darko, yeah. is the the upfront training for two providers. And like Kobe said, developers don't like that. That's true. Yeah. But let's say they let's say they did like it. Like it's still wasting time. You're still not releasing software. You're still focusing on stuff that is potentially. And actually, what we see from talking to customers and working with customers is, uh, we see customers talking about this topic. Of course, it's a pretty hot topic. Yeah. But most of them actually go at least ninety percent down one provider. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. If not one hundred percent, most of the time. Yeah. So a lot of upfront investment is almost wasted on the risk that you may move, which may happen in the future, may not. But as you said, make a really good point, the cost of move is typically less than the cost of time wasted and lack of innovation and yeah. operational overhead. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. Out. I fully agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, so Steve, there's a question. Have you uh, have you addressed this from J plus C plus M? Uh, um, no, I haven't. I can touch on it quickly okay, so the, let, let about the session yesterday. So, yeah, so in the session yesterday, uh, uh, I was talking about RBAC. I've now just confused everyone by talking about ABAC, which is almost like the next evolution of that. Uh, so um, the actually in the in an ABAC world, you wouldn't have a dev role and an admin role. You'd have a single role. Yeah. Uh, and then you would say if the tag of the user assuming this role, because the tags get inherited when you assume that role, not in AWS. Uh, you can actually. The tags can be inherited if you assume that role in AWS, but not in the console, only if you use the CLI, the API okay. to assume role. Um, quite somewhat annoyingly. So, um, but yeah, you basically would set the tags, say dev on the on the on the IDP, wherever you, you know your source of your user is. They would assume the role. You would then have a role that was just called like Lambda permissions or whatever it was, um, EC2 permissions, and then the condition would say. Um, do this or do that based on the a dev and admin is probably not a good example but i'm talking like project x project y you wouldn't need yeah, a role yeah. for each project you would just need mm -hmm. like a role for a project team member or project developer let's say um and you would dynamically assign all that so you would get rid of having like tons and tons of roles you would the tag assignment would solve a lot of that for you yeah mm -hmm. okay okay fair point thank you thanks Tim. um Ed, um bram uh, oh no! Yes. Sorry. Okay. So now we'll go to just quickly a lost algorithm. Please do throw these questions to us. We want yeah. to discuss things like this. The, the it, it's fun like digging into these things where you have strong opinions. I, I absolutely love these kind of questions. So please keep them coming. Yeah. Um, and Doc, you were about to throw something on the I, screen. I, about I, was, I was just ab about to uh, uh, Bram's question here about serverless computing. Um, uh, they're encountering some limits with the technology. So Bram, um, let me um, let me sound very arrogant here, but. There are not limits with technology. There are limits with your account. Uh, so, uh, mm. one thousand concurrency limit is the default limit on Lambda. So, and it can be increased to hundreds of thousands. So, if you want to run a hundreds of thousands of concurrent Lambda functions, put your little asterisk up with justification. Yeah, with justification. Yeah, you have to tell us why do you need to do that because otherwise, um, you know. You may incur a lot of costs with a lot of limits because running a hundreds of thousands of lambdas functions at once can be pricey. Uh, so yeah, um, you can actually increase it. The default is one thousand, absolutely, but you can you can actually request this. Uh, and uh, is and the follow up this list, uh, follow up to this is don't go for serverless due to limits and try something else. No, um, again, see if you can tweak the limits. And and again, uh, there's been a question before uh, from uh, from somebody else. Um, uh, about using uh, Lambda functions in a specific use case, and that was like a bad use case because the Lambda was running for 15 minutes. That's a bad mm. case use case for mm. Lambdas, right? Uh, in this case, I'm not sure how long these Lambda functions are executing, uh, or uh, but I would say that uh, it's very difficult to get a fan out with something else uh, rather than with Lambda functions at such a scale, if, especially if you need more than a thousand at mm. once. That would be my, my opinion on this. But I mean, to, to answer the question specifically, you're referring to doing some kind of logging pipeline that uh, processes um, the logs as they come in, I'm assuming. So what I would suggest here is look at a different service. Like, for example, use something like Kinesis um, Firehose, mm -hmm. which is a service built to ingest events at large scale. So have those events come in, and then it persists them either directly to S3, or if you want to persist yep. this, to, for example, to uh, a redshift database, it can do S3, then redshift. But then what you can do is that 
as those logs come in, Firehose takes care of putting it in the S3 bucket for you. Then S3, yeah. when the file is created, raises a, an SNS notification, and you can pop that on the queue. And behind the queue, you can have a bunch of Lambda um, functions that will then process data off that queue as quickly as they can. Because that could right. be a way to not hit this, oh, I'm hitting the 1,000 concurrency. Obviously, if you start needing to scale that out, then there are some interesting ways. Because let's say it is a concurrency issue, and there's no way for you to make it shorter or better. You can have the same function code, deploy it. And this is not a good idea, but this is a way to hack it around, is create five or 10 copies of that Lambda with different names, have them all listen on um, the queue or work out a way to fan it out on queues. But there are a lot of ways you can approach this other than just saying, um, let's do something else. Yeah. I think there's a, yeah, we don't obviously have all the specifics on the on the challenge you're trying to solve here with login, but there's, you could also say Firehose, so a couple of things depends if you have to do real-time analytics on the stream as yeah. it comes in kinesis analytics would allow you to do basic sql on the log stream as it comes in before yeah. it goes into firehose um you could you may just want to do some analytics or data warehouse kind of bi type stuff on the logs um so you may want to pump them firehose into elastic search or uh, or from s3 use athena to query them um you may could you could even possibly put the logs into cloudwatch logs and then just use yeah. Cloudwatch log filters to pick up on the patterns which allow you to basically trigger an event only when a pattern is matched on those logs in CloudWatch logs, which is another interesting way. So it's, yeah, I don't know what, what you're doing with the logs, I guess, is the point. But there's various mm. things you could potentially do instead of doing a thousand concurrent yeah. lambdas. And this is also a fair point, because um, when Kobus mentioned that, uh, yes, you can we can increase your limits, but with an explanation. Um, I used to work in premium support and customers would come to us, hey, please increase my EC2 limit to 10,000 EC2 instances. The first thing premium support would do, like, wait, what? Why? And mm. uh, the goal is that let's try to optimize what you're doing. You, not let's not if we can try, not brute forcing your you know solution. Let's try to do it. So people will ask you. So why do you want ten thousand concurrent executions of a lambda function? Um, maybe there's a better way to do it. Because I mean, our mm. end goal is to make you well architected, right? And uh, and brute forcing things is not well architected per se. So, uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, Slipdexic. Hi. Uh, good morning. Um, oh, troubleshooting questions. API Gateway Lambda. Let's try to oh. troubleshoot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Please send it our way. Please send it our way. Um, mm. Yeah. So while well, that is happening, and um, I would like to answer one question I have from uh, from yesterday, if I can find it here on my little uh, uh, spreadsheet. I had a few questions regarding my uh, CDK talk. Uh, where is it? Uh, da, da, da. No, that's not, is it this one? Yes, it's this one. Um, people ask me how how can you run the how can you run CDK inside of a container? You can. I mean, that's a very <laughs> direct question. It's a very simple answer. You can run CDK in a container as long as you can install the CDK binary, which is just an npm package. You can run CDK in mm -hmm. a container. So if you're doing some automation inside of a container. Um, it's very easy to 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 do those things, right? Um, there's also a question if there was a question if code uh, because I was doing a demo on CDK pipelines, which is a really neat uh, library for CDK that allows you to build pipelines in multiple accounts and yeah, CI CD pipelines, multiple accounts and deploy your application code to different places at the same time. Really cool. Uh, the question was like, is GitLab and GitHub supported? Um, it can only build AWS resources, so it can only provision uh, AWS code pipeline for the pipeline itself, but it can actually use um, any commit repository that is supported by code pipeline. So you can use GitHub. In my case, I actually use GitHub, but you can also use Bitbucket as well, and you can use even your own GitHub enterprise hosted thing. So that's one thing as well. Um, hmm. And quickly, just before we go on to the next question, I do see we've had a bit of a spike in users yeah. that are joining us. So firstly, welcome. Uh, we're going to do a round of introductions again quickly just to get people up to speed. But today's stream, and this is a four-hour stream, we just went past the two-hour mark, is to help with questions from yesterday's dev day. Um, if you missed that, um, we are making the videos available on demand. Um, yeah. And uh, there will be ways to do it, but we can get into how to access that later. So the point of this session today is to answer technical questions about yeah. yesterday's presentations, but also if you have general AWS questions. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to do a round of introductions again quickly. So we can start with Steve. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, two hours in. I've only been here an hour and 20 minutes, so I'm... Uh... You know, a bit, a bit, a bit lazy. You guys are hardcore. Um, 
So I'm on our uh, developer relations team with uh, these two guys that are not both called Darko, and uh, <laughs> and I'm based in the UK. So I, uh, you know, been around AWS for a little while, focus on a bit of everything, architecture and security, a bit of serverless stuff. So far away. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, my name is Darko. Uh, I am definitely not Kobus. Uh, so, uh, Kobus, well, I'm a, I work also like Steve and Kobus. I work as a developer advocate at AWS. Been with AWS for five years now almost. Um, so, I'm not. Steve has been longer here. Uh, and Steve and I had a very similar path. Steve, you used to be a TAM at one point, right? Or no? Uh, no, I was a solutions architect. Okay, 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 okay. So, I was yeah. also a solutions architect, same as Steve. Uh, Steve um, um, and. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm based in Berlin, Germany, uh, but I'm originally from Serbia. Uh, so yeah, and uh, Kubus. I am. Uh, so my name is actually Kubus. I'm not just Darko's clone or a uh, deep fake of Darko. Uh, we mm -hmm. get this quite often. Um, and I'm also a developer advocate. Um, I have been with AWS almost two years now, coming January. Um, and I am based out of Cape Town, all the way down in South Africa. So uh, I'll be your Southern Hemisphere representative for uh, the session. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, cool. So you you are you are the only person that's approaching summer uh, between all of us. So <laughs> that, that statement applies. We've got winter, which we okay, according there, to European no standards winter. do not. We, you you don't have winter. You uh, unless it's snowing in negative <laughs> degrees. Uh. But anyway, Steve, do you have like snow in London? It's uh, it's not a common occurrence that you have snow in London, right? Uh, we we typically get a couple of showers of snow, like a day or two. In... Okay. Actually, it's, it seems to be getting later, like uh, January, February time frame when it gets kind of coldest. So yeah, yeah we don't we don't yeah, get tons yeah. of snow. We we if in a bad year we may get like I don't know if, at least down south here a few like three or four inches maybe. Yeah. Worst case, okay. I went to Finland. Uh, no, not Finland. Uh, to Oslo, uh, yeah. in January like a few years back for yeah. a, a conference there with Adrian and a few of the guys from the Nordic team. My God, it was like. They just get on with life. When we have snow here, everything shuts down. No one goes out. Like people, everyone works from home. It's like a pandemic. Uh, so yeah, yeah. You know, they just walking around. Trains are running. Everything's fine. But that's a fair point. Like so, um, just to answer this thing, uh, I lose. You live in Dublin, right? And for me, uh, the amount of rain you receive in Ireland is is ridiculous compared to where I come from, right? But people just get on with it. Like, mm. and I, I just adopt the rain as like rain is just it's gonna happen it's not no longer oh it's raining i cannot go outside it's raining just ride your bicycle that's it you put on raincoats and just go <laughs> so. yeah, but snow and ice is the next thing in, in uk and ireland i'm sure ireland as well yeah, snow yeah. just kind of freezes everything, everything up, up yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does, yeah it does. i can't imagine what it'd be like if it snowed in south africa later uh <laughs> well we do get some themselves. snow in in the winter and it's one of those like but only in the mountains usually <laughs> getting it like in general on the ground is not common people queue and actually drive for two hours to go play in the snow because it's that uncommon <laughs> yeah so there's only like some weekends it's not even like oh winter's got gonna have snow it's like okay we actually had some proper snow let's go play yeah well okay yeah. um mm -hmm. all right so slip let's finally address your question we apologize for the delay uh, this is the so-called um, uh, sidetracking uh, stream. We like to sidetrack a lot. Um, we have a random four hundred. By the way, I, I think he's one of our UK friends, Daryl. Ah, okay. I'm like randomly ah. picking up usernames. Yeah, Daryl. There we go. Darryl, there we go. Darryl, Darryl, I know, from, from our cloud security events and other stuff around the AWS community. Hey, Daryl. Hello, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. Um, so, Daryl, uh, we have a random four hundred error when invoking a Lambda function via RESTful API Gateway. X-ray just shows an error at stage. We're basically testing an app using browser stack. Uh, there are no throttling issues, and Lambda functions are .NET Core 2.1. Hmm. <laughs> um, I really don't know what to say here. Uh, unless something, I mean, is the 400 error coming from the Lambda function itself? Uh, is your Lambda function able to throw a 400 error? Or is that uh, error coming from the API gateway itself? Um, so. I mean, I would assume that it's coming from an API gateway in this case, uh, but um, I'm, I, I, I don't have enough experience with, with, with troubleshooting mm. this, to be honest, too much. Uh, just quickly, a couple of additional points you can give us to help. Um, is it uh, a 404? Is it just what type of 400 error? Because there are quite a few there, and that could help yeah. give us some hints as to what you're dealing with. That normally means it can't find something um, when you're making the call. Uh, so it could be that API gateway might not be configured to send the request based on the path and the request you're making to the Lambda function. Um, 
And also, you mentioned, uh, where is it here, browser stack. I actually don't know browser stack, so that could be an abstraction on top of API gateway and Lambda functions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think four, 400 is a bad request, right? So is there a transformation on API gateway or something that's transforming the data in some way that the server doesn't like? I, I don't know. Yeah, something yeah. like that because yeah. maybe yeah, maybe things maybe worth looking at. The transformate if you're transforming the input or something, maybe it's messing up the request. Yeah. Okay. Browser stack is 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 you okay? Browser stack is a testing service that emulates particular browsers, right? And uh, uh, Daryl, does this error come from a specific browser type or from a specific request, or is does it come from all things randomly at the same time, right? Um. Okay, well, we get more information on that. Uh, I just want to address a, a question here from Bram, uh, Bram because it's a, it's, a, it's a question we have the answer for. Um, so the question here is a CDK, uh, of course. Uh, a lot of CloudFormation templates. Uh, there are a lot of CDK templates, so it gets a mix and match. Um, uh, so basically, split between both CDK and CloudFormation in the terms of deploying their infrastructure. Any helpful tools to help with migration or just re re rewriting all the JSON code? Um, so... Well, bam! There is a new feature coming out. Well, it's a new feature. It's a, it's a way that you can migrate your existing CloudFormation stuff to CDK. So I have not played around with this too much, and that's one of the things that I am gonna check out. But do check out from uh, do check out this great blog post from my colleague Adam. Uh, it is um, it is basically explaining you how you can migrate existing CloudFormation to CDK. So this will help you out that a lot. And people were asking about this <laughs> quite a bunch, so it, it's 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 a really great way uh, to do it. And I would advise you to stick to one um, one type of deployments because it will just make your life easier and tooling and all this stuff. So yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what else? <laughs> Sorry about the noise. Um, That's okay. We are getting we're one That's hour out from a lunchtime nap, so the three-year-old I can hear is running up and down the corridor and fighting that already. And I know Steve's <laughs> dealt with this before. Yeah, well, I, I'm, yeah. my Fridays and Thursdays are good because all my kids are at childcare and school, so oh. it's very quiet in my house. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We are lucky. We've got uh, nannies that play with them, look after them, but um, that does also mean play with them um, running down the corridor, and we've got wooden floors, so it is a nice <laughs> amplification. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have this noise cancelling. I have a I have a I live in an apartment building with a like bunch of neighbors and uh, it's an old building in Germany they call it the Altbau. It's like an old hundred year old building and it's been renovated so everything's kind of lifted up from the walls and the flooring and it's kind of a bit um, raised. So when my when when kids run above in the uh, neighbor's apartment, it's very audible. <laughs> oh wow! <well. laughs> in the morning, I can hear them yeah. like, running out. So yeah, I must um, say my weirdest. Sorry, just quickly on this one. Weirdest flat thing that I had with way back when I was renting a flat um, was my neighbor upstairs. Don't ask me why, between 1 and 3 a.m., yeah. moved furniture. And it wasn't like you can see them doing, so, like, let's say I'm recording and I need to move stuff now at a specific time. It wasn't that kind of, it was random things. You could literally, it was different patterns every time. It's just like weird. In Germany, it's against yeah, we the law. And their kids, the, the, there's a thing that was before we had children. There's a, in the UK, there's like a certain time age group, I forget which age group, where they, they teach the kids how to play the recorder for like nativity play at Christmas wow. or something, right? And uh, has that happened there as well, right? So the, <laughs> the we had this family where this kid was learning recorder and, uh, oh my God, it was just like all afternoon long. As soon as they got home from school, there was just this awful sound of this kid, this poor kid trying to play the recorder. It's like mm. it went on for like two or three weeks. <laughs> No, yeah, uh, no, no, I actually didn't do that. I mean, I did music at, at school as well. So I did the recorder for probably eight, nine years, multiple ones, the different wow. sized ones as well. Um, I haven't touched instruments for a while, but actually played quite a number of them as, and some brass instruments as well. But uh, yeah, when you start learning... Years, it, it sounded a bit better than this kid. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. This no, 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 year old who <laughs> just picked it up. <laughs> but I mean, if, if you want to have fun, go look on YouTube. There's a video. Search for um, Recorder Titanic. Um, it's it's a joke video, but it's bad. basically someone playing My Heart Will Go On, yeah, but badly, it was, it was badly. And then also these weird heartbreak soppy scenes that of himself doing it. It's yeah. obviously a joke, but it's a, it's a bit rough. But yeah. <laughs> um, in Germany, doing things after 10 p.m. on a week work day uh, is illegal. So, like, they can get the police here to, well, 
give you a fine if you're doing those kind of things. Oh wow! On a, on a Sunday as well, you cannot do any any noisy drilling, anything on a Sunday in a, oh, wow. in a building. Okay. It's, it's it's just not a thing. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way. Um, Thinking about Daryl's uh, issue here, uh, one of the things, I mean, Arrow 400 is a bad request, right? Um, one of the things I would suggest you look into it is that where is the request coming from? Is the request being changed? Or I mean, Steve mentioned this, is it being modified? Is what what request does it receive when it throws an Arrow 400 compared to what it gets to where it doesn't get a 400 error? That would be uh, my first troubleshooting step. Um, my second uh, uh, um, suggestion here is like, use AWS support. Now, if you are a member or if you are if you your company has paid AWS premium support, use it. It's so valuable because the folks that can support you and I used to work in support. A lot of great engineers work there. It's not just somebody who's going to answer a phone and just, you know, read you the documentation. Those folks have excellent knowledge. They have subject matter experts and they also have insight into some of the things in your back end that may show why this is happening or not. So uh, use support as much as you can. You're paying for it. Uh, it's 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 very valuable. It's very valuable. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So I'll need, I I want to address this thing. Um, um, J plus C plus M. Uh, one of the challenges suggesting folks to go all in on CDK and by extension cloud formation is the length of time it can take to do things. Ignoring runtimes that is unavoidable due to the underlying components being modified. Is there anything in the pipeline that we can keep an eye out in that space? Um, uh, hmm. I'm not sure what... Uh... I think the, the question here is that it does still take time to actually build out the actual infrastructure yeah. you want to do with CDK. And um, my take on that is that, yes, it does take time, especially because you're learning something to do yeah. it in a new way, and that always takes time. Um, but I can say, and I mean, I, I'm a big Terraform user, and I used it um, for, I think, five, six years. Yeah. In total now, already it's like I started version 0 0.6. Initially, if I don't want to do something, it would take me two, three days to actually just figure out how it worked. But yeah. now, five years later, it's faster for me to do things with Terraform than it is to even spin things up in the console by clicking, even though I know both really, really well. Yeah. Um, it's just you get to that point, it takes practice, um, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. And and one of the things about CDK here, especially compared to CloudFormation, is that it, it gives you the ability to take your existing knowledge of a language and tooling in the language mm -hmm. to build out your infrastructure code. Mm -hmm. And now, if, 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 if you're talking about the length of time it takes to deploy that thing, mm -hmm. now that's... Um, that is something else, right? That is, um, depending on how you're deploying it is, it, is it through a pipeline? Is it through like CloudFormation? I mean, it mm -hmm. still takes some time to spin up, unfortunately, especially if it's not serverless, right? If we're talking EC2 instances and, and clusters and whatnot, so those, thing, those things take a long time. And I would agree, uh, it takes longer to do things, uh, but um, this is a question. What's your KPI? Is it how fast you do it or how, I would say good, but how how properly you do it. I, I would mm. say that pr a proper infrastructure should be written, right? Um, and Kobus and I had this discussion this morning. Uh, it's not about the, like okay, writing things down. Um, I find it very useful, and I've started doing this recently to instead of talking about things, writing things down, right? And I would I would say that you can apply the same thing to infrastructure deployment. Instead of clicking mm -hmm. things, because clicking things is very at atomic. It happens once, and then. It's gone, right? Write it down. And if, like, when I write my infrastructure, when I do my write my infrastructure, it helps me because I open up my text file, I open my CDK project, whatever, and I just have no code in there. I just make a big comment section and start writing down what I need and just keep on plugging things in there. I basically write a little description of what I need to run and then just build it out. So hmm. I, I would say that's a, that that helps yeah. you out. It, it is slower by far, <laughs> but. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You do not think I'm out of block. It will... Go ahead. Oh, sorry, have I gone? Sorry. No, we had a blip there. Go, Stephen. All right, cool. I was just saying CDK is a little bit more opinionated than CloudFormation, so it does speed. Whilst you kind of have to be mindful that it is being opinionated with some of the constructs, right? Like a VPC, for example, you can deploy with a few parameters or attributes, whereas in CloudFormation, you need to specify like everything and all the subnets and yeah. everything else. So CDK can speed you up a little bit, but you have to be mindful that we are making some decisions for yeah. you. It's opinionated. It has, as we like yeah. to call it, sensible defaults, which can be overwritten, by the way. Um, and this is 
anything that cloud formation can do, CDK can do. And you can you can literally write CDK as you write cloud formation with all the defaults as well, because CDK supports cloud formation constructs, which in, in essence enable you to write CDK properties and everything else within CDK. So super easy, super super simple to do that. And I see a, a comment on 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 this from J J J plus. Uh, J plus plus, let's call it like <laughs> that. Sure for me, plus C plus N. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's uh, see if CloudFormation's runtime latency, and I agree, CloudFormation takes a while to deploy, right? Mm-hmm. But um, uh, because it just runs a whole bunch of calls and it waits for the calls to come back, and especially when you're launching, I think like I, I saw this example where you run a SAP HANA uh, stack. Uh, mm-hmm. and there's a, there's a solution on AWS that you can run a SAP HANA stack, uh, SAP HANA, sorry. Um, uh, it takes like three hours to deploy or something like that. Mm. So because there's a lot of things, right? Um, so mm. and, and I agree, there's a latency. And but let me give you this thing. Um, uh, uh, why I like CDK? <laughs> like I try something, and I deploy. Then I have like five minutes of procrastination time. So <laughs> it's my procrastination timer, exactly. Or get a coffee or do something. I love. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like that little XKCD comic. Like uh, you know the developers and it's compiling. Oh man, it's oh, like, yeah. that that that's my thing. <laughs> I can use it for CDK. Oh, it's deploying. So yeah. <laughs> but okay, if you're in a rush, it's not the best thing in the world. It takes a moment, but I would I would argue that clicking takes longer. So <laughs> um I, I a comment from Bram. On a, on a note, a note of CDK advantages, since we have been building more and more microservices in our company, CDK has helped us to do to easily create a template that we can configure and run new microservices. Thank you. Uh and again. I started with CloudFormation. I have not used Terraform before. I started with CloudFormation. Ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> exactly. I need to. I need to change this uh, comic. And I actually use this comic in my uh, my presentation. So uh, I need to change this instead of programmer. Well, actually, well, I can use pr- programmer. Right? My code is deploying. So, um, mm-hmm. so um, <clears throat> I've I've started with CloudFormation, and CloudFormation is very easy because it's it's um, okay. It's it's readable. Um, but it's more readable to people who are not developers because you don't have to constrain like loops and, and objects and whatnot in, in your head. Uh, but um, it is it depends, yeah. But it is it is um, it is a thing that um, that that enables you a lot. And CDK gives you even more. Like typical example that well, I will always mention. It takes a single line of code to deploy a VPC in CDK. It takes a hundred possible lines of code in CloudFormation to do the same. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. one thing that kind of helps me a lot. I, like I do a demo. I think that's a good point, though. The, the developers prefer CDK, in my experience. Like yeah, infrastructure yeah. people prefer writing JSON and YAML, or DevOps people in many ways, because they're not familiar with, you know, the classes and all this kind of stuff they may have to worry about oh, if they. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. And, uh, <laughs> DevOps in YAML. Oh, sorry, DevOps in YAML has been a meme, right? You know what is. Yeah, I saw a meme online on Twitter some a few days ago. Like somebody, oh, I bought you DevOps in like a bo- box of YAML, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it was a Forest Brazil comic from. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But but I must say that um, you know um, this is where where you know the development in operation or de- development in ops comes comes into play where your uh, infrastructure folks need to learn some Python and and. Point of advice, if you are an administrator in 2020 or a sysadmin or DevOps engineer or whatever you would like to call yourself, learn a scripting language, please. You mm. know, don't rely on YAML. Don't rely on, um, you know, don't even rely on Bash and Batch. Learn something mm. more higher level. Um, uh, it will help you immensely do things. I, I got this book last week, last week or this week. Uh, it's uh, If you ever want to learn Python, it's a great book. It's called... Uh, Automate boring things with Python. Um, it is just a, it's yeah, it's a it's a 500 page book on how to do random things with Python, and it's intended for people who do not use Python. Like it's intended for somebody. I don't get that. Who, yeah, it's it's intended for somebody who just like does, not even not the developer, not even an admin, as somebody who who does like spreadsheet. It, it tells you how to do spreadsheet magic with Python, right? Those kind of things. So it's really cool to to learn Python. So uh, yeah. Very, very cool. Sounds like the thing that I built in Python where, where I, when Lex was announced, I built a, a Facebook Messenger bot for my neighbors to ask yeah. when the bins would be collected. So it would scrape the local authorities' uh, website and give them the bin collection dates. Because I was getting frustrated that everyone was always asking on our Facebook group, 
when yeah. is it the recycling today is it the yeah. garden waste which bin needs to go out so i wrote a bot <laughs> so they could ask the chat bot there you go there you go so uh they they took that kind of thing to a next level here in south africa because we've got this thing called uh load shedding which is when it's um rotating the uh, whether or not you'll have power so it's controlled brownouts effectively um and there's a uh a developer or uh, two of them are actually build a mobile app that scrapes the different municipality sites because they obviously how it works is that we've got one uh, electricity provider they then sell that electricity to the local municipalities but they also deliver it directly in some cases and then between all of that there are lots of different schedules and we also have different stages between yeah. stage one and eight so the schedule also can change depending on what stage you're on and that stage can change in the middle of the day so they took all of this information and then built multiple scrapers to actually get all of the info from everywhere put it inside an app and then set it up to do push notifications and if you want to know about storming that's a very very good example because what will happen is that they'll announce we're starting with load shedding at this and then they send out um a, a few million messages in a few minutes and it's like everybody just logs on and doof, hits the app nice yeah yeah, the uh, problem is the web scraping is the worst thing ever. So, oh yeah, like, my my bot doesn't work anymore because the council changed their website Aww. and how they how they present mm. their dates. This is the book. I see somebody asking on YouTube. Uh, please paste the name of the book. Uh, it's called Automate Boring Stuff: The Boring Stuff with Python. It's made. It's mm. written by Al Swigart. It's like a big chunky book, uh, but so good, so good. I would suggest it. Jonathan wants more dogs. Do, Kobus, you need to show dog. Uh, I will in a moment. Oh, no, no, she's just a small she's... dog. Uh, there's the link actually to that book. I found that oh, it's in your URL as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Now, see what's happening now is it's it's lunchtime, so the kids are getting food. So now she's running around and wants to go out to go get the food. Um, she's a little, she's a little rescue, a uh, Jack Russell, something. It's a proper multi generation um, uh, crossbreeding. So many things in there but there's definitely yeah. some pointer in there don't ask me how they got it this small because when she sees something like a squirrel thing she goes like leg up yeah. and points yeah <laughs> just but let me quickly let, let out of the room i'll be back in a second yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, oh you're welcome kev on twitch did you see the cloud line okay cool um it's been a while since we showed the cloud line but uh yeah uh you're welcome uh, on that on that topic um mm. All right, uh, so gentlemen, until uh, people ask us more questions, ask us more questions. We don't want to. We don't yes, want to. Yeah, we don't want to try to invent questions here. But uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can answer answer some questions not related to our sessions. Ooh. I'm looking at something I've got, here. Go I've ahead. got one from, from my session that I want to do, which was a question around the. So I spoke about being able to use spot instances in how to use them as part of your scaling um, uh, systems. Um, and one of the questions that came up was, can you scale down to zero? And the answer is yes. You can actually set up the capacity providers and allow to scale to zero, especially when you are using, for example, AWS uh, Fargate to launch your containers, which means that if there aren't any requests coming in, there's no load, just scale down to zero. It's You can definitely build your system through that. It's one of the most efficient ways also to save money. Yeah. Um, because an example I normally use is if you have a development environment that's running um, the whole time, that's 100% cost. If you run right. it for eight hours a day, um, sorry? eight hours a day, uh, sorry, 10 hours a day. So from eight in the morning till six in the afternoon, and you think that's kind of like a typical um, workday, Mondays yep. to Fridays. What do you think percentage wise it is of the total cost? If you have to thumb up quickly, don't do too much math. 29 point something, 29 okay. point something percent. So it's more than you can save with reserved instances or savings plans just by switching it off. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. definitely look at that, yeah. That, that is fair point. Mm. Well. Um, uh, one of the things somebody asked, I think somebody mentioned on our, on our Q and A yesterday. Uh, somebody was trying to uh, challenge us when I was saying that I was I was mentioning that everything, a lot of things are serverless. You know, Fargate is serverless mm. and the code stuff are serverless. And somebody said like, "Oh well, Fargate is not serverless because you you need to have a single Fargate task running all the time." I'm like, "No, <laughs> you don't have no. to have a single Fargate task mm. running all the time." No, you can get on and also, I think an interesting thing with Fargate is that, and with any containers, you can you don't have to say keep the container running. There is actually a flag that you can set that says just run to completion. So you can fire off a Fargate container, for yeah. example, let's say batch processing, do something and shut down. Yeah, Done. yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Uh, Bram, don't be sorry for the questions. No, please, please ask us questions. We are here to answer questions. Yeah, if you don't question. ask us questions, <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's literally bored. the the. And also, look, <laughs> I'm with the AWS Summit. You're not yeah. close. Summit has not happened. <laughs> well, uh, yes, we this, had a virtual summit. 
<laughs> this was from my uh, from last year, 2018, 20, what's last year, 2019's um, Cape Town Summit, actually. What's your What's your T-shirt about, Steve? My T-shirt is uh, about a documentary that was released this week. Rumboys. Uh, called uh, Rumboys, 40 Years okay. of Rad, which is about a bunch of old boy skateboarders and BMXers that are part of a there's a skate park where i grew up called rom skate park which is which i spent my teenage years at which is okay. the only grade two listed english heritage skate park in the world really um, wow. it's like a concrete kind of 70s built thing and they listed it as a as a protected landscape wow, and uh cool. but it's gone through some financial difficulty skateboarding's gone down and up bmx gone down up scooters have come in so they've made a documentary to try and get they had a fire there so they made a documentary to try and about the history of the park and this uh it got launched this week and actually this weekend i went to the drive-in cinema at the skate park to see the premiere uh, wow. on saturday which was really cool yeah they kind of lit it all up and everything and it was really kind of nostalgic to go over there so this is where i picked up this shirt oh um never, it's never Boys. i'd recommend it so if you it's Rumboys. a really cool film the history of skateboarding and like every all the most famous skateboarders and bmx in the world no yeah. Royal skate park is kind of crazy that i grew up five minutes ride from there but it's um it's like a really kind of world famous place it's a really cool documentary interesting if you're into skateboarding then. oh no definitely i mean um also if you want some entertainment go read up i think tony hawk published an article on all the things he's had to deal with in his life when traveling um and it is hilarious to read so things like his plane ticket has, has been cancelled before because i thought someone was making a joke by using the name um <laughs> he you carried his skateboard on uh, as a carry-on luggage and then it got snarky questions like who do you think you are tony hawk and he's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and things like yeah. that like well, he's, he's just, quite funny on twitter if you follow him on twitter he mm. he often like posts about how someone's like oh dude you look like tony hawk he's like oh really yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i've been told right <laughs> yeah he's quite um, funny on twitter but uh but no this yeah. park, like the guy who founded gumball 3000 oh okay grew up riding and skating rom skate park wow that's amazing mm. he's in the documentary yeah, it's like it's really well known kind of uh, history to it. Yeah. Okay, so a question mm. from no Nocturnal Chic. I think Nocturnal was already here on the on the stream once. I think I remember the name. Mm. Um, so um, cores issue on a website is really through S3 or developer Ooh. configuration issue. <laughs> yes, that's very broad. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah. uh, cores I, or maybe. cross origin <laughs> requests. What does cores course mean? Uh, cross origin requests uh, something. So. Uh, you can you can enable or disable course on on uh, on uh, on S three so that's one of the things one of the configuration items you need to set up in in, in S three but also your application needs to be able to support course right so um, they're, they're, the answer here is yes so <laughs> without without any more it's resource in, uh, sharing by the way cost origin resource sharing okay 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 yeah, mm. okay. yeah. basically so this is not for something yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I, I I would I would like to make an I would like to make an acronym that just the S stands for something, <laughs> just to just to just to just to just to just to freak people out. Uh, but yeah, uh, cross origin resource something. Uh, so course is basically used that you allow or deny um, resources to access other resources from different origins. So from for example from a different S3 bucket or from a different web server. This is a security feature that you uh, can potentially prevent somebody from. Uh, man in the middleing you or how is it called um, i'm not sure what exactly mm. would the, would be the case here but somebody uh somebody representing um your to be your server but be something completely else yeah. mm. uh, so uh, quick question bram's got a follow-up question for us here um let me quickly just pop it on the screen here which is uh oh apologies steve um you're now hidden no no it's fine I'll um you can yeah. So we're in the process of merging two companies. One domain is a company's A's account. The other domain is in company's B's account. We want to redirect subdomains of company A's domain to company B's services, etc., etc. But also keep the domain of company A linked to the services in company A's account. Would you step to a domain uh, or give access? Uh, Darko, you've got an opinion. I can also follow up because I've done this. Um. Wait a second. Uh, when I see, when I hear domain, I, I think Active Directory domain. Uh, no, no, no. The, this is I'm assuming my root fifty three domains. Yeah, yeah domain yeah. names. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, remember, because I, I, would say, I, would, I would say having a central central domain um, account, right? I would have, I would, I would, I would avoid having multiple quote unquote sources of truth. I mean, especially for domains, you cannot have that. Um, uh, the, there's a little caveat. 
So okay. what you can actually do is you can set up root 53 on a subdomain. So you've got your main, let's say example.com, which is in account A or company A's account and has redirect to specific services. Okay. So you can actually enter, um, set up uh, name service records for subdomain.example.com and have them point to a second ah. root 53 zone inside the company B's account. And then okay. from there, they can control it. So I've set this up in the past specifically to make it easier for yeah. these scenarios where the subdomain is an entirely different account with entirely different things running and you've got full control over it, which means they can do whatever they want with the anything before the, they can do a sub subdomain if they wanted to, um, but anything. So they control that space, but they don't control the overall example.com yeah. space. That's how we that's how we have it in premium support. In premium support, we would get like a an, an e, a, a domain that we can use in route fifty three registered to our AWS account, and it's myinstance.com. It's basically my username dot myinstance.com, even mm -hmm. though that myinstance.com is managed somewhere centrally, but the subdomain is managed on my own account. So yeah, okay, fair point. So that's something you can do, uh, Ram. In this case, uh, I would say. Carlos, what about from a migration perspective? Whilst I'm like whilst I'm migrating, so I've got some stuff in the previous account for the subdomain, some stuff in the new account. Um, like, for that migration, you definitely want to go ahead and set up um, the second set of uh, root 53 or the, the, the second zone with all of the domains with the current values in there. Yeah. Um, and then what you want to do is when you do the name server switch and configure that subdomain, then obviously that'll take time before everybody in the world's DNS servers agree that that's now the new yeah. place. So set everything up in parity. Then do the switch over, then wait at least 48 hours, because even though you've got TTLs set on DNS records, not everybody honors them. And 48 hours is like the thumb suck where most maximum TTLs tend to expire. Some are even longer than that. But um, use tools like Dig, and there are um, a couple of online tools where you can actually check DNS from different places across the world. Run those kind of checks to make sure that things are uh, working properly before you do that. And then only do you start making uh, actual new subdomains and new changes to them, point them elsewhere. But there may be some kind of, um, if I've still got some services in company B's account and some in company's A account, they both access that same subdomain. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm using uh, aliases. Ah, uh, okay. I'm going to have to maybe not use aliases. In one okay, so gotcha. So, yeah, just point to an S3 bucket or an ELB. Um, no, what you can do is point, yeah, like you mentioned, I was pointing to um, an application load balancer because then you can do path-based routing. And what you can do there it does get a little bit tricky, but you can do VPC peering to have the two different accounts have a private network between them. Um, so you can actually, from the load balancer sitting in account A, to request and route them directly into services sitting inside account B without having to go over the internet. So that's another way of doing it. Right. Um, and then especially if you want to move that load balance to spin up a second load balance in account B, have DNS, um, that one configured to point to account B as well as account A. So you've got this, they can both serve traffic to both. And then you can set up DNS to point to both of them, wait till you see that propagate and then switch off A. But there's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do there depending on the scenario. Yeah, yeah cool. And uh, Thanks, Robert. Um Yes. And on that note, quickly, yes. Hey! <laughs> Hello. Hello, Marcia. Wait, wait, you have to do your football intro quick. Yeah. Hello, I love that word. word. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody hey, was Marcia. sleeping, now they woke up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we've got lots of coffee. We got lots oh, of coffee. I'm drinking water. I should get a coffee here. But I have a how coffee long bar. have you been streaming now? Uh, three hours. Two, uh, three hours. Almost three hours, just below. So, uh, wow. Uh, be yeah, welcome, Marcia. And uh, since you just joined us, please do a quick introduction. Uh, see Darko alone. <laughs> I'm not Darko. I'm not Kohus. I'm not Steven. I have hair. You have hair. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. <laughs> I'm also a developer advocate for AWS. Um, I'm gave a talk yesterday. Maybe you watch it about CI CD for serverless. So I'm happy to answer questions on that or serverless in general or life of the kangaroos as well. Do tell us about your talk. What What is your talk about? I mean, CI CD well, for serverless, but... My talk was a very, I think, deep dive talk. There was a lot of cloud formation and, 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 and some display on screen. So okay. it was something to, to do when you are very tired and you should watch that and you will fall asleep immediately. <laughs> uh, but but I think it's it's a, it's a talk I would love to hear. Like two years ago, when I started to build my first pipeline using SAM and and all these uh, code tools that are available in AWS, mm -hmm. there is a lot of tricks 
on how to work with multiple stages because that's something most of the demos they always have one stage and they yeah so i try to show you how you can use the parameters of cloud formations the mappings uh conditional so a little tricks here and there on how to apply it to different use cases from building the pipeline from scratch so from your code uh from your infrastructure as code until you deploy and you test and where you can test so quite a lot of information <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, I, I mean, one of the things I learned from your talk, uh, or if it's similar to something that I've listened to before, it's is that... It's something I've been evolving a lot, so I'm yeah. sure you have heard it. But one of the things that I like from it... Okay, I have, I have some uh, audio back in my back. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but... Uh, uh, so one of the things I, can, I heard from your, I learned from your talk is that uh, using a Lambda function for uh, integration testing is just yeah. so on point. Uh, so and easy. I've actually... I've adopted that to test my infrastructure. I just basically have a Lambda function that will invoke, uh, up, um, uh, it uses uh, Python to uh, test like an endpoint. Is it live? And yeah. if it is if it is live, it, it just phones back to, to code pipeline saying, yep, the test is good. It uses the SDK. Love that. It's a great yeah. feature. Uh, and so, you can pass parameters to that Lambda function from your uh, CI yeah. CD. So code pipeline can send some parameters like the endpoint and then you can get it in your Lambda and then run your test, make sure that the, the endpoint is up and running and then continue. So it's a really easy way to do it. Uh, I think uh, this kind of feeds into the question here uh, from somebody from uh, Mr. Matt Chart, Matt Chart Production. Uh, the question here is, uh, can you give me a tutorial to define multiple Lambda functions inside a single SAM application using AWS uh, Toolkit VS Code? I'm not sure about the exact that thing, but... The last part, I don't know. But the first yeah. part, that's the way that you should do your uh, applications. Yeah. I would recommend you to have a SAM template for uh, all your microservices. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, I think, a good practice when you're building your uh, serverless applications to define what is the microservice of these Lambda functions and then create a SAM template that has all those functions that belong together that are sharing code and are sharing uh, functionality. So your life will be so much easier. Correct. And I've, I've and basically also, did, I saw yeah. a quote on Twitter yesterday yeah. that said, uh, you don't deploy a Lambda function, you deploy an application that includes Lambda functions. Oh, yeah. True. Right. Yeah, yeah. Lambda functions are part yeah. of uh, a whole deploy a single thing. Lambda function. Well, so, you can yeah. do it. But it comes Isn't with resources, it comes with policies, it comes with a bucket if you're using some, because that comes out of the box when you're using some. There is a lot of things that are hidden there. So <laughs> if you write a cloud formation for all of that, it's quite a lot of things you need to have in order to have that Lambda function working. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the, the question then becomes, if you deploy a Lambda function and you never call it, did you actually deploy it? <laughs> That's a very fair point. That's a, 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 that's a um, philosophical question when it comes to serverless applications. Mm. Do elements of a serverless service applications that are never invoked, are they actually mm. there or not? Well, um, you're not paying for them in general. So. <laughs> but exactly. here's a fun little segue while we wait for our next little uh, questions. Um, what is the biggest chunk of code or feature that you've written and actually had deployed that was never, ever used? Because uh, I'm sure that <laughs> That has happened to all of us at some point because oh, of various different reasons. I did many migrations that never went through. So I write a lot of code that never saw its lights because some reason the migration was not finished or something went wrong and the company went bankrupt. <laughs> I'm always very afraid every time I start a big project and it's not very agile when things like, we will start coding this and then I see you in six months, what happens? That's never a good thing. I always want to have, like, we need to deploy this next week and have users there. That's a good thing. <laughs> but if it's like, let's start migrating and see what happens, you will write a lot of code that nobody will use ever. Mm. <laughs> It so, so, many times. so okay, I, I'm actually, um, um, Marcia, I'm looking at the questions. I have a list of questions that came into your session yesterday, right? Oh, good. Um, there's a question here. That, uh, maybe... I have to drop off on the hour, okay. so I'm going to say bye to everyone. Thank but you, Steve. Thank you for coming, and it was a pleasure one. having you here. And <laughs> enjoy the rest of the AMA, or whatever we're calling it. See you later. Mega stream. Bye. bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Oh, even the dog said hi. So. The dog said hi. <laughs> Did that actually come through? <laughs> yeah. It's actually surprising that it came through. It, it, it understands that it's a dog. So. <laughs> uh, so Was it your dog? Yes. 
It's good. It's my little dog. Uh, <laughs> trying to get a banner up here fast. There we go. For those that don't want to finish this, cap, 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 cap. Let me get the dog quick. Okay, so you need to see the dog. But um, maybe maybe you can explain this to the audience. Uh, uh, the question came from somebody and asking you, um, uh, but, 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 what is the difference between canary and linear deployments? In oh, service? yeah. So That's maybe, a great yeah. question. And I confuse maybe. it all the time until I use this memo technique rule. Okay. You know, canary, these little birds that are yellow and they were used in mines. mines. They were put there. Uh, and when the canary died, then everybody has to leave because the canary has very uh, sensitive lungs. So yeah. something mm. was really wrong and the canary died. That's why they are called canaries. Canary so birds, yeah. with this memo technique, you can remember how canaries work. So canaries is, <laughs> canaries is first you deploy, I don't know, 10% of your application and you see if it dies. If yeah. it doesn't die, then the whole 90% comes up. So you will have 10% of your application for 10 minutes. If no alarm is triggered, then the rest will come through. With and linear, just, yeah. Sorry, I just want to quickly clarify. When you say deploy, what you mean is the actual application is deployed in parallel next to your current running version, and you're yes. redirecting a portion of the traffic to it. You so don't. This um, is yeah. called deploy. So basically, the whole thing will be deployed. Uh, at the first run, so uh, not at the first run. The moment you say deploy, it will deploy. You, this is Lambda, so it will deploy version two. Mm -hmm. And then your traffic will be shifted. You see in the code deploy tools, it will start shifting 10% of your traffic to the new uh, version. And if no alarm is triggered, then the rest will come to your, mm -hmm. to your new version and the old version will disappear eventually or it will stay there depending on how you configure it. And, and with linear, Sorry, sorry, get to Lydia. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Please finish first. It's okay. I'm not, you know, I'm used to interruptions. I don't see it as bad. <laughs> it's like you're paying attention to me. Yeah. Uh, but linear is, is the other way. It's just you deploy 10% in 10 minutes, then the next 10% in the next 10 minutes, and then the next 10% in 10 minutes. So it can take you 90 minutes, 100 minutes to deploy a whole application. And then the alarms are going to get checked during that 100 minutes that everything is being deployed. So it's a very different uh, way. One is like, well, I, if in my first 10% work, then would. If not, the other one, I just want to see how the traffic really affects my application. And the interesting thing with code deploy that a lot of people don't know is that if you deploy a full stack of lambdas, then each of the lambdas will have maybe a different code deploy uh, yeah. thing in place. But if one of those fail, then all the lambdas roll back. So that's why it ties to the previous question on how you should define your SAM template. That's why it's so important to have your microservice in the same template. If not, you are tying all the deployments so together and you are coupling everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, I mean, I mean that's definitely definitely the thing. Uh, uh, code deploy prevents bad code from entering in, into production. And one one of the one of the examples I use in code deploy is like roll back. I think it's not even the, the complexity of deploying code. It, it is very complex, mind you, but complexity of rolling back bad code is 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 far worse because, hey, if a single element fails, what do you do? Like, do you manually delete code like I did a long mm -hmm. time ago? Uh, or, you know, you rely on a system. So I think... Uh, and like you can have alarms for all kinds of things, not only yeah. for how your Lambda is operating and if there is any issues, but if latency is added to your application somehow, yeah. you can check that. You can check business alarms like custom metrics. If something, for example, if you have a linear deployment that takes four hours and yeah. your sales decrease, that can trigger an alarm if it's something critical for you and you can roll back your deployment. Mm -hmm. So you can be as creative as you want when you're designing these, these uh, alarms and, and how the, the whole system will roll back. Yeah. And, and especially when it comes to Lambda functions, because they're all individual things that do a certain thing, uh, it's very important that when you monitor for, like uh, when you do canary deployments, uh, you need to monitor for outcomes as well, right? Your alarms should be, and not just alarms, but making sure that uh, your your application is working. It's actually serving the traffic it should. It's mm -hmm. performing, it's, it's, it's giving tasks, given tasks. So uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a very cool thing to do. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So. And I, I mean, think that um, was a whole thing missing from my talk uh, yesterday, but it's only 30 minutes, the whole observability part. And right. for that, we are having another event. I think uh, Adrian put it in Twitter. I will look for it. That yeah, we yeah. are going to talk about cost engineering and observability, like only talks about that hmm. because that's super important. And we can talk uh, as well. Yeah. Oh, you're I, feel, as well. I, feel, I feel left out. 
Yeah, I didn't well, get Kobus. They can um, only have two bald bearded persons there, so that's I don't know. the limit. Um, but what I want to say with uh, Marcia's chat now about code deploy and canary deployments, just to clarify, this is literally a drop-down menu that you go <laughs> and say, select canary deploy with all of these different options that we just spoke about. So yeah. if you're deploying a Lambda function or if you're deploying your normal code, there are ways that it actually does a lot of this for you. Uh, well, no normal code caveat, there are, I do believe it is integrated with application load balances. I will have yeah. to verify that fact. Um, but yeah, it's actually, yeah. Um, it does, it does, so, it does integrate, it does integrate. So, um, so I mean, uh, code deploy integrates with load balancer, so it can actually replace instances and add instances to a load balancer. So mm -hmm. that, that and this works for instances, for containers, for correct. Lambda. So what I, we were sharing now, if you're not using Lambda, it still works. It works yeah. a little different for containers and for instances, but it's the same idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think uh, Kobus had a great example a long time ago. Uh, I've, one of the th first times I've seen his talk is this thing with uh, with containers um, um, that he uses code deploy to actually do blue green deployments on containers. Mm -hmm. And blue green deployments is the other way of deploying code um, <laughs> uh, as well. Which uh, you don't do blue green on Lambda because it doesn't make to make sense to do blue green on Lambda. But in code deploy, <laughs> when you look at the the console, it says blue green, but it's not. Blue it's green. not. Yeah. It's not, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. No. Blue green is this thing where you have, uh, you know, uh, version one of your code running in production, and then what happens? You you introduce version two of your code, and then uh, you s you test if this version two works, and if it works, you just switch all network traffic from one to two yeah. and just throw one away. So, yeah, but I mean that, that that does come with a lot of risk because that's literally like doing that with yeah. a, a fire hose as things are going. So the first problem is that you you better have your new servers warmed up because let's yeah. say you've got a mass amount of users, it's going to be like thunk. Yeah. Um, so I would highly recommend looking at uh, uh, Canary and incrementally sending traffic over yeah. because yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, did you an application load balancer has these weighted targets? Mm. I have not tried, but Wait, yeah, I think weighted target. Yeah, you can do that. Something can... some very useful for my previous life when I was doing this migration so yeah. to have a way to migrate from I/O service endpoints to my newer service endpoint. <laughs> Uh, we can. There's. A, did you did you answer the question to math math chart production? Can you so use cloud call alarm? To, so use cloud <laughs> watch alarm. Da, 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 where we should put. So use cloud alarm or cloud watch alarm to notice the problem, <laughs> then stop canary to roll back the deploy. That That's happens automatically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to worry about it because if you set up a cloud watch, uh, sorry, a canary deployment, uh, and an alarm is triggered, it just goes back. So yeah, and that is a, a very um, and you also have, deployment. when you're using code deploy, you have what is called uh, the pre-traffic hook and the post-traffic post hook. Traffic so basically how it works, you deploy the version two of your Lambda function. It Before passing any traffic, it will run an integration test that you define mm -hmm. in this post-traffic uh, post hook. And if it, that fails, then it will roll back automatically. Nothing happened, the deployment stops. If yeah. that passed, then you start putting, I don't know, 10% for 10 minutes yeah. or whatever deployment strategy you want. And then if no alarm is triggered, then it will run the post traffic hook. And if that fails, then you can even roll back there. So there's right. so many opportunities for verifying that everything is working. That is amazing. Yeah, exactly. And it's very important to be paranoid on code deployments, especially <laughs> at, 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 at serverless scale, right? So um, you do not want bad piece of code into your in production, right? Um, because yeah, <laughs> it can hurt. Uh, mm. So <laughs> uh, you want to make sure that uh, you only push good code to production, and it's better to fail your deployments ten thousand times than to than to not fail it that much and have it something in in production mm. that's bad, right? Uh, oh, yeah. And when and, you learn to do the automations, it's so easy to add them, and then you can have this deployment that doesn't have any manual interaction because you yeah. trust so much your automations that you can deploy twenty million mm. times to production a day every commit you do because you know. There is so many checks yeah. in the middle that nothing that is broken will go through. So, mm, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. okay, we are on the three-hour mark, three hour wow. and seven minutes into this into this mm -hmm. stream. Yeah, so we have less than an Can hour. I get a high five? Yay! Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> so when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, um, the stream, we have like. 50-ish minutes remaining. I just want to make sure, I want to reiterate to all the people who have joined in the between, this is a follow-up stream from yesterday's Modern 
application dev day. We had a modern application dev day yesterday with 12 sessions delivered by all of us. Uh, sessions were on how to build modern application, how to build and host modern applications on the cloud, uh, various deep dive technical topics. And today's is a big old four stream, uh, four hour mega stream where we answer mm. questions we got yesterday. We got all the speakers that, come, that were yet, well, we got some of the speakers that were delivering talks yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we also answer your um, your uh, questions in the chat. So feel free to to mm -hmm. submit questions within the chat and we will be happy to answer them. Uh, by the way, somebody's wonder... asking for a tutorial, go and mm -hmm. watch the talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go watch the, the talk. For yeah. the applications. Everything yeah. so is there. I think that talk is available mm -hmm. somewhere online as well. Uh, because I believe you did it before. But if you have if you have not registered for this event, uh, the videos will be available sometime soon. So uh, mm -hmm. if you have registered for the oh. day yesterday, the Later videos today. will come up. Later today, yeah. The yep, video should be available. Yep. But also, um, and just quick, sorry, quick call out before we go away from the on the hour four hour session today. Just for those that do enjoy the session and find it useful, we've got this running every Wednesday at yeah. eleven a.m., so an hour earlier than this time, yeah. and also every Thursday um, at twelve, so at, on the hour that you just started um, as well. So you can always come back Wednesdays and yeah. Thursdays, and then we have additional ones as well during the week. So definitely go have a look at our Twitter profiles. We normally talk about it there, and yeah. we literally have many sessions where you can come ask us questions. So we want you to come bring those technical questions to us. Correct, yeah. correct. And that's the uh, idea of this to have, usually I think every day of the week there is someone coming and answering yeah. questions <laughs> at midday kind of ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm. ab absolutely, that, that's, that, that's for sure. Um, one thing I would also like to mention, especially for people asking for tutorials and, and, and how to use uh, Marcia's uh, YouTube channel, which we posted before this one. Uh, mm -hmm. She does a lot of serv serverless stuff. I mean, you can introduce it, but uh, make sure to check it out. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of neat serverless things uh, are there as well. So mm -hmm. I'm poor today, so I don't want to self promote myself and put it in the shower. I lost my money already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promoted you. So this is a, this is a life hack. I promote Marcia, so I don't have to pay because I'm not promoting myself. I'm promoting somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah. There is a lot of content. Around 300 videos of serverless materials. So. There you go. There you go. I'm sure you will find something there. I think it's a Okay, uh, yeah. uh, promote promo jar. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, uh, so a question from Log Lost Algorithm Is there a central place to find good technical write ups of successful migration projects? Mm -hmm. I, We've know got a lot of a, I know a place for great technical write ups, but yeah. not sure if there are migrations there. So if you have a mm -hmm. chance to look at AWS Builders Library. So it yes. is. Uh, if you can go, can you just find a link while I explain? Yes. Um, so it's a it's a it's a place where we, when I say we, I mean Amazon, the ing engineers, developers, technical folks at Amazon, make these amazing write-ups of how to do specific things. Now they're very highly technical documents that describe you know how to do an, a, a master propagation or, or primary node propagation into whatever whatever right. So it is very powerful, uh, very uh, well not powerful. A lot of very great content. So I, I would I would highly advise everybody who's interested in, in, in technical content and, and the way that Amazon does things, check out the builders library. So let me actually pop it on the screen quickly for a second just to show people because okay. like I said, if you just look at the topic titles in here, let's see if it's over there. There we go. Cool. So you can see you can search, you've got ability to search on, you can see here uh, avoiding uh, overload with in distributed systems. Um, that one's quite there was also one on there we go, going fast with continuous delivery, which is very specific to this one. And I think to put that into context, um, I can't remember offhand the last public stat on how many deployments AWS does a year, but I think we're on, is it 14 million? Uh, in, um, in 2014, it was 50 million. Wow. Okay, 20, okay, yeah. So I think we are, it might be 140 million. Or so. I'll, I'll see if I can find that number for you. But it, yeah. basically, on average, we deploy every six seconds, I think. Um, <laughs> and remember, that's on average, just put, yeah. putting it into context, how many deployments we have going. Yeah, um, so, so, yeah. And thank you, CICD, for that. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just quickly, why I'm mentioning this is not as a bragging point, but it's a we've learned things going at that speed and building at this scale. And we've taken those and we're distilling them into these articles. So, please go read them. They are super interesting. Can highly yeah. recommend the rollback safety. There we go. Rollback safety in the, yeah. the during deployments. Very very important yeah. to 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 um, to roll back safely during deployments. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, feel free to pop in the questions in the chat. Um, 
we're here, on, here until uh, 1 p.m. Central European time, mm-hmm. which is in 45 minutes. Uh, but also feel free to follow us on the social medias. Uh, we tend to answer questions there. Um, and it's not all, only questions. If you have feedback regarding specific database services mm-hmm. or uh, if you would like something to be maybe addressed or improved, uh, all of us um, have different connections in AWS uh, so we can potentially not I would mm-hmm. say influence but we know how to get to people so uh, our job is basically to try to amplify your voice within AWS so uh, mm. um, we would be happy to do those things and, and I think I think I think in 2020 it was very difficult because we couldn't see people directly so getting feedback on services was usually a personal thing like somebody would approach you and, hey hey you know uh, this and that oh I'm very nice. excited I finally yeah. got Chris on the stream yay what? welcome Chris Wow. I would like to say that only a man with no hair would think that a woman could just instantly jump onto a string. I would just like to put that out there. Chris, you know how long it takes to get this beard? But I mean, I'm joking. Um, yeah. This I was is... sitting here in my pajamas with my glasses on. I was like, what are you talking about? What are you? <laughs> yeah. I would start Welcome expensive Chris. my makeup to AWS. I'm using exactly. it so much. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, no, we're not going to get into politics, but um, quickly, um, Chris. Introduce yourself while I go behind the scenes because my first light is flat. I need to replace it quick. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you, everybody. For those I haven't met yet, my name is Chris. I've just joined the AWS uh, European Developer Relations team about a month ago. Um, but I've been working for AWS for more than two years. Uh, I was in Sydney, Australia, managing a solutions architecture team. Um, so I decided what would be fun would be to move internationally during a pandemic and Absolutely. start a new job in a new city where <laughs> I have only minimal language faculty. So it's been fun. I'm in Munich and the weather like challenges. is... We can yeah, say I do. that. I do. <laughs> you moved to Finland, so you love challenges. Absolutely, Marcy. <laughs> And the weather yeah. is nice in, in is, is the weather nice in Munich today? Uh, no, it's have... terrible. It's been okay. gray and rainy and awful. Which means I've just been in my house watching Netflix and talking to people on video conference, which kind of I could have done from Australia. So exactly. <laughs> what else do you do on a, on a, on a pre-winter in, in, in Germany? Well, it's the same thing in Berlin. I knit. That's the you only knit. other, you know, I knit. That's it. So, <laughs> so, so we Chris, are all getting sweaters that say Ada. Them well. I have. I will. I will admit that I have tried uh, looking into doing a pecky design for a jumper. So you just hold that thought. And you do like twenty of them, and yeah. Yeah, that'll, that'll paint me a good year. <laughs> By the way, Chris, can you tell us what you did? What your talk was about yesterday? Because your talk was one of the big ones. Uh, so um, mm. yeah, explain I, to the folks. I was a last minute ringer on there. We had the topic, and unfortunately, the speaker who'd proposed it couldn't do it. So I stepped in. Um, I ran. I did the building and running microservices on AWS. Okay. Um, and so I was very nervous. It was my first one for the team. You're all going to be looking at me, your new colleague. I wanted to not. I didn't want you to look around and go like, "Why did we hire her?" Oh my god! So, oh my god! This? She's terrible. <laughs> so. And, and of course, I've got no, this is why I'm sitting at my dining room table, because all my recording equipment is still on the boat from Australia. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's good. It's good. It was it, a it, challenging, it was a challenging thing to do. And I got a lot of nice feedback afterwards from people. Mm-hmm. So it seems like it landed well. You know, yeah. um, I, I will improve as I go, but I'm very happy with how that first one went in the end. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a uh, great. I mean, um, so any 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 anything outstanding from your talk? This is something we have that we we ask that we can ask you on Marcia as well. But uh, is there any addendum you would like to add? The thing you couldn't mention during your recording of your session that you would like just kind of add on top of what you were talking about? Well, I had an incredibly broad topic to try and cram into 30 minutes and to try yeah. and, uh, and, and the demo was the interesting one because I actually had, mm. I wanted to do a lot more in the demo and my original recording of the demo was even longer. And that's why I was flying through it. I really had to cut a lot out. So I would urge people who wanted to go through that in more detail to go to the getting started link that I provided and go through it because it's a really good, it, I, I learned a lot just going through the steps and seeing what changed. And, and my impulse was to then take it a bit further, as I said at the end of the recorded demo, to, to look at implementing Fargate or even replacing some of those containers with, uh, with Lambda functions. So I think it, it's a nice exercise left for the reader to, to extrapolate further from what I did. Um, I, I don't know that there was much I didn't cover that I wanted to. I think I covered everything I wanted to. 
Okay, okay. Yeah. Marcia, how about you? Did you? Is there anything you missed on your talk that you would like to add? Because I did miss something on my talk. I think the whole observability part, as I said, that's some. Um, I, I I have the agenda for my talk was the release uh, steps for delivering software, and I have like the source, then uh, build, test, production, and then when I got to production, that was the last one. Hey, you know, you need to use CloudWatch and X-ray, and yeah. I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that as well, because I, when I did best practices at the end, and yeah, I had like 30 seconds on observability too. So. And, and this is something I think we should, we should, we should think about moving forward because um, we do like, especially in 2020 with the virtual thing and virtual fatigue and people cannot concentrate for a long time on a, on a, on a webinar, we boil it down to 30 minutes and uh, we still approach it to like, oh, I have an hour to talk my wisdom at you. Um, uh, but we especially need to talk about, hey, let's let's try to focus down on a specific, like my topic title was deep dive on AWS developer tools. You can't do that in 30 minutes. So I left the topic title to fool people, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I really focused down on two things. Uh, so I think that's a, that's, that's a point, like you have to, really pinpoint this is what i'm going to be talking about in these 30 minutes this or is then you can learn. do as i did with kobus that he invited me for a whole week in his uh south africa region and i there had you go. five se four sessions on serverless from getting started and then i was able to explain everything i did the, my observability oh, nice. part i did my ci cd part i did my workflows mm -hmm. and I explain everything and took time and mm -hmm. i think it's important to 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 be concise, but sometimes you need the full picture and, 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 and teach yeah. everybody everything. So I mean, I struggled with my talk because my one was on uh, spot instances and how to blend them into your order scaling groups and uh, also use AWS Fargate Spot. Um, and the talk itself was, I think, 26 minutes, which went, left me three and a half minutes to yeah. do the actual demo. Now, luckily, oh. I can say that I was able to scale up to 50 instances with my order scaling group in that time and also demo the other side. Um, sorry. It's nap time. Kids are running up and down the corridor. Um, and um, yes, uh, note to self, set the reminder. I actually forgot and left them up and uh, running uh, overnight. Luckily, there were spot instances and very cheap. So it's only yeah. a few dollars. Oh, your kids but, uh, were running overnight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. They do that the whole time. I mean, my, my, my favorite story there is getting back from a business trip or from one of our you know events. And my daughter waking up at 3 a.m. and deciding, oh, Daddy's home. Let's play. But yes, so they do run all night. Yeah. Uh, okay, a question for all of us uh, from yes. uh, J++. Ooh. Which services tech are you most excited about or looking forward to? Who mm. wants to go first? Kobus. I, 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 so my background is automation, uh, DevOps, a lot of containers. So pretty much the way the container ecosystem is moving at the moment and all the automation around there is super exciting. And the thing that I would be the most excited with, and I think it was recently, is that we released, uh, or Terraform has got a uh, Kubernetes provider that's in alpha or beta at the moment. And then there's also the CDK for uh, CDK TF, which allows mm -hmm. you to write a CDK code that actually then transpiles into Terraform um, uh, HashiCorp configuration language to manage that. Because the thing that makes me excited here, this is why I fell in love with Terraform years ago, is that it does state management for you. So it knows that I created this resource, this is the state. If I need to delete it, I can take it away. And when I work with Kubernetes, whenever I see someone using kubectl and just piping a YAML file into it, that's the equivalent of going bash curl from the internet script somewhere. It's like yeah. something goes in there, you hope it's there, and if you have to go clean up, there's no state tracking of what did I deploy and what didn't I deploy and how do I clean up. So it's a very manual, almost going a couple of steps back saying, let me just throw some things out there. I'm going to go click and clean it up later and rename it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So the fact that there are solutions coming to this makes me like super excited and happy. I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think, uh, I think um, that's a, that's a, that's a great thing. Uh, one of the things I, I'm a fan of is uh, um, the, uh, the democratization of all the things, right? So, by using uh, different frameworks for infrastructure deployment, using any kind of compute platform for whatever you're doing, right? When it comes to containers, even using different uh, CPU architectures for those things. I like the fact that you you are not getting, you know, uh, uh, tunnel vision into one thing, and that's the only thing your application can run on, and nothing else, right? From serverless to containers to EC2 instances to different types of platforms. I just a big fan of that, and that's something that kind of excites me going forward. And Cobus is away. Cobus oh. went dark. Okay, so Cobus, Cobus, I know what's the problem. I think his camera died, right? 
if you're a yes, I was about to answer. I'm not trying to swap out with a backup camera. So the answer is okay. three and a half, three hours, forty minutes is my battery life. I will be back oh. in a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you, what's your comment on this question? Um, well, we I don't know the people. Do people think that we know everything coming down the pipe? Because we don't. That's that's I guess what a big misconception is that we know what's on Fair the point. roadmap. And and Very we good. often don't. Yeah. Um, I am excited about reInvent. Uh, reInvent. This will be the first one I've gotten to really take take part in. And I am um, helping out with Jenna Peterson. We're doing a, a deep dive on something new. Um, okay. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what it is yet. We've got the ticket for it, but I'm very interested in the front end space and okay. it's come through in that space. So I can't wait to see what we unveil. I have no idea what it is. So I'm, um, that, that'll be cool. This is the going to be the biggest rain band ever. Yeah. Three I weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no yeah, I'm, I'm just generically excited. Not about yeah. anything specific yet. <laughs> oh my, yeah. no, uh, I think rain is going to be massive. Like, wow, so many talks and so many people giving talks. Yeah. It's just mm, blow my mind. I already told my husband, imagine that I go on a business trip for three weeks. You are not going to see me much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I'm here, I'm not here. The, the, <laughs> I will the, be the, in a the, different time zone. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, we're going to be doing a lot of, like for all everybody here. Reinvent this year is from November 30th to December 18th. It's yes. online. It's free. Go ahead and register, right? We're going to have a lot of great talks. It's going to be just just amazing. Uh, and we're, we developer advocates are going to be doing a lot of live streams during that period. So expect us, expect us online, not just talking between each other, but talking with uh, the audience and also talking to service team members about new features, new services coming out. So uh, we're going to try to answer all the questions you may have or may not even think of um, uh, for the new services and features out there. So um, please stay tuned. And I know this is going to be a big thing for me because... I'm going back to Serbia during that time, and I'm bringing my entire recording equipment with me. <laughs> You're not taking the, the old monitor, are you? No, not the old monitor. This is going to stay here. Uh, I, well, luckily, Serbia is my graveyard of computers, so I have all the old computers there, so yeah. I'm going to set something up <laughs> nice. for sure. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, do expect us uh, during the reInvent. It, it should be pretty fun. Um, and while we're waiting for this black void of Cobus to go away, yeah. uh, <laughs> still well, wait, what's, Marcia, have... what's Marcy excited about? Yeah, I think everybody knows what I'm excited about. Lambda. Lambda. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you think Lambda is going to take over the world? No, but yes. No, I think there is. It's such a new service that yeah. there's so many things that are coming out. Uh, all the time and i think rainbow will not prove us wrong yeah. on the new launches that uh, they will be not only around lambda but around the serverless ecosystem yeah. so i'm really excited about that and, and and all the things that will be possible to do because every rainbow they give a kick forward to to the uh, serverless ways of making applications uh, this that i think the team of lambda is really listening to what customers are asking for and giving things even like for example i think one of the funniest things is the efs support that's something yeah. a lot of people that are hardcore serverless <laughs> users like what the fuck you're giving state <laughs> yeah, to lambda yeah, yeah. but people in production really need the state they in do. their functions and in order to adopt the lambda they need that and the serverless team even Maybe they are hardcore serverless fans. They listen to the customers and they give what the customers are asking for. Then it's up to you to use it. Yeah. So, or not. But but I think that's the greatest thing of this team, of the, the, the product team of behind Lambda, that they're all the time listening to customers and coming with the most amazing launches that try to make everybody happy. And I, I really enjoy that. So... But that's a very fair point. So sometimes we, especially sometimes the service teams, can be in a, in a, in their own little bubbles, right? Oh, it's only serverless, it's only Lambda. I don't know what everybody else is doing. And and one of our jobs as developer advocates is to make your voice heard and make sure that your needs are presented in front of develop in front of service teams. So um, even though somebody say, oh, it's an anti pattern to use state and EFS, people need it. Uh, people need it to run their services. So yeah. And also, what is an anti pattern of what? Because this is so new. It's so it's good. something that we have decided that is an anti-pattern based yeah. on what, and then on we can start a, a philosophical conversation on what serverless is 
and, and what Lambda represents in the serverless uh, concept. And there we can get to a discussion, but I think it, it's, I believe on, as you said, on the democratization of tools. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that can take us to the path that everything is very overwhelming. And I think that's one of the biggest things with AWS when you're starting, everything is there. There is so many options, 16 databases, 20 million times of deploying applications, 17 type of places to put your applications in EC2s, on Outposts, on Fargate, on Kubernetes, on ECS, Lambda, uh, Elastic Beanstalk. I, I don't know. It's so overwhelming, but that makes it so powerful when you are uh, doing your applications to find the right tool for you and find the thing that it works for you. It's hard. You need to study a lot. And that's where we come to play is we try to make a uh, path of, of, of finding solutions that we think are right and we, we use our opinions and our expertise to try to help you, but it's not the, the, the final truth. There is as many options as customers are there. <laughs> I, I like your point, Marcia, that they, they bring out things that maybe aren't relevant to every use case, but somebody wants them. Somebody I saw, wants them. I remember, you will blow your mind, I saw a talk in Sydney at a meetup group, or Melbourne, many years ago, um, where someone used Lambda and to run Haskell. They yeah. figured out how to hack Haskell executable and get Lambda to run it. Um, yeah. And then it was like, I was sort of thinking, well, this is this is a fun science experiment, mm -hmm. but what is the point of this? And then the next reinvent, we had custom run times, you know, yeah. so you yeah. can do that now. And it was like, whoa, yeah. okay. I, I always make the funny. joke in all my conference, like about custom run times, like you can even deploy COBOL. And yeah. one day I got a message from somebody Oh, I have a library to run COBOL in lambdas, and I was like, Phew. "Yeah, yeah." Somebody mm -hmm. did it. <laughs> Why? Today, somebody, today, somebody commented that there's a Pascal runtime. You can run Pascal, pas, uh, Turbo Pascal, on 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 Lambda functions. There's even a Commodore 64 Basic runtime of for Lambda functions. Of course, you know that. So, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But but for sure. Uh, now, Marcia, this is a question from before, and I would like to hear your opinion as you okay. are the serverless person here. It's also from J but uh, from a different account. Is over what time scale do you see serverless becoming the norm in app dev? Mm. Um, I think the problem with serverless, and I don't know if it's a problem with the thing with serverless, is that it's a different way to develop applications. So yeah. adopting Lambda is easy. It's Absolutely. super easy to get started with Lambda. Adopting a serverless mindset is hard. It's, uh, it, it takes a different way of thinking on how to build your applications and how to structure responsibilities in your uh, developer team because serverless yeah. is a mindset. It's not a technology. It's a way of doing code. It's how to life. architect your application. But I think serverless is cloud 2.0. And don't quote yeah. me. Don't quote AWS on that. You can quote <laughs> me. Uh, but I think that's the, the, the path that uh, cloud providers are taking by creating yeah. more managed services that are event driven, that you can build distributed applications easier. So I think in some point, because money talks, uh, yeah. making faster applications to market will be the factor that people will say, okay, there is this mature technology that is a new paradigm. Like when we happen with DevOps and Agile, people start yeah. adopting it because it starts solving a lot of problems that we had in the past that now, well, serverless is solving a lot of problems that we have in the development of applications and, and, and thinking about distributed applications, super high scale, how to manage multiple microservices, how to do all these kind of uh, problems. I think it's something that will happen eventually, but it takes time because people need to adopt their chip in that uh, event-driven application and asynchronous development. I agree, I agree, I agree. Um, what is your opinion, um, Chris, on this one? Uh, have you, I mean, you've been working with solution architecture in the other side of the world. And um, I mean, my experience in Germany was that uh, it's more difficult to adopt serverless, especially in one, I'm not sure which one, uh, which which segment did you work in? But I did work in something called the Mittelstand in Germany, which is the small to medium businesses. And it's yeah. adopting serverless with a traditional German company is a, it's a bit difficult, let me call it that way. Yeah, in Australia, I was working with the small to medium businesses okay. as well. I mean, we had a fair number of startups and I don't think it's a problem with startups. You know, no. people doing greenfield development, they're very happy to start out that way. Yeah. It's for people who've got existing legacy stuff and, and are reluctant to sort of, uh, take that that hit of pain of going through and refactoring. Yeah. Um, that's that's the biggest thing I see I see stopping people really. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a thing that people need to um, 
And it um, takes time because yeah, adopting takes, containers for developers is coming from on-premise to virtual machines to containers. It's the same path. It just makes life easier on the infrastructure side, but it just you develop applications the same way. You put them in boxes. Now with serverless, you have to decompose those boxes and distribute your uh, ownership between your cloud provider, your third party partners, uh, even inside your development team, your developers have a lot of more ownership and operation has to share that. So there is a lot of power being shifted around that it, 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 it really makes people afraid of in so many different ways. So I think it, it happened with DevOps the same when people start adopting new methodologies. I will lose my job. And, and I think it's totally fair to have those thoughts. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think mm. it's not just the serverless transition as well. Like one of the All areas things. I saw it was... Um, mm. Sassifying applications. You know, there were companies who wanted to sassify a legacy app and they didn't want to go through the pain of properly uh, making it cloud native. So the good thing is, yeah. you know, we have AppStream, we have solutions for that, but you know, uh, it's it's never going to be quite as great as as doing it um, using the cloud native services. I think. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I think it's all only a matter of like it. it it's it's very rarely that somebody just switches to serverless, like wakes up one day and like let let me shoot all my servers, right? No, it, <laughs> it takes takes time. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process, and and it's yeah. also like I had a discussion with, it, with this with somebody's like, uh, how do I how do I install DevOps or how do I convert to DevOps? Like you mm. never convert to DevOps. That being DevOps. <laughs> So where do I DevOps, a DevOps? Being the, exactly being DevOps <laughs> is a continuous process. Like it con constantly changes, and and whatever you would like to call being DevOps is. But yeah. Um, well, like they said, if someone's trying to sell you a DevOps tool or oh, Cobus something, looks like in um, the in the past now. So yes. <laughs> So uh, the thing even wobbles. So sorry, just just quick on that. Also, the reason why this is cropped is this is actually a very very hacky thing that I started out with. This is my old Canon. 700D camera. So this is not a DSLR. Um, this is the same lens, however, but you can see there's a slight difference between the body of the camera and the previous one. And also this one does not do uh, widescreen ratio. So this is actually a 3-2 ratio that's wow. cropped. And the other fine one is I might also disappear again when the memory card goes full because if Why I don't... Why you don't use your that, Mac camera or your computer camera? Because my Mac camera is over here on a on a oh. stand. I, you can't even see my hands. Wow. How am I supposed to talk? Now I'm a T-Rex. I'll talk like a T-Rex. My Mac is over there. Um, and yes, that's why in case you're wondering why T-Rexes are always lonely because when they go in for the hug, they can never get the hug so they'll yeah. be lonely forever. Yeah. Um, that joke. You can use your deep racer. You can place your deep racer in front of you and have that. It has a camera. Oh, oh don't joke. Okay, so we touched on this before. I have got many ideas because I have got six of these deep racer little cameras and I'm working on a setup to add multiple USB cables in my office. I've ordered the cables yesterday to set that up so I can actually put multiple points of view everywhere. So we can see you from all things. your angles. <laughs> That's amazing. 3D covers. 3D covers. There you go. <laughs> Holographic covers in my living room. <laughs> when I packed up, when I packed up my like house, <laughs> <laughs> when I packed up my Australian house, I found one of the old eyesight cameras, the Apple ones. Wow. And I was like, oh, can I get that working? But um, it, it was, uh, it was a no, it wasn't lightning. It was, th was Thunderbolt. Like, okay. I'm like, I don't even think I have anything to plug it into anymore. It, it, it could be Firewire. If, if oh, yeah, it was Firewire. Fire fire it wire. was Firewire. That's what it was. Oh. <laughs> okay, a, a question from Marcel Romani. And this is all... <laughs> That's it, Kobus. Just stay that way. It's better. <laughs> uh, uh, this may be some... Uh, Marcel, you can answer. Uh, concurrent pr provisioning uh, with Lambda functions. Is provisioning yeah. a single uh, Lambda function uh, would save the cold star problem? No. One no. is not enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, unless you have so little traffic, that means that there will be one Lambda function warm. The moment that that's used, that's yeah. running, then you will have to wake up another one. So yeah. cold stars are a question that so many people are afraid of. And I think, again, you really need to understand, is it a problem? Because sometimes, uh, because it's a trendy word to talk yeah. around. People are cold stars, cold stars, but is it really a problem? Yeah. If it is, then uh, provision concurrency helps, but not one. You need to think about how, uh, what is your initial load and start doing some analysis on how many you need to have up and running. Uh, you can have as many as your account limits on number yeah. functions, but remember if you have 
your account limit is a thousand and you have 99 running, that means that you can run one Lambda function that is not that. <laughs> so be mindful, but you need to have more than one. But then you can do tricks around your, your call start, uh, depending on what uh, runtime you're using. Some runtimes are faster than others to start. Uh, what kind of, uh, and here we come again to the serverless paradigm. What are you doing in that Lambda function? It's like a little monolith. It's a small function that's also a problem. Are you calling 20 million dependencies that that takes longer to load in your mystical container that is getting loaded in the back end? Uh, I don't know. There are so many questions that, that you can ask in order to improve your cold starts and, and make it a little bit better. If you do have the problem, then get provision concurrency on. I want to see the, your answer to the second part, Marcia, because it's a an issue I had. I built this little serverless app um, that depended on a downstream API that was really heavily throttled. So if I yeah. just pointed Lambda at it, it might not an exhausted all of my API calls very quickly. So how do so you, you can limit use, it from doing that? You can use the, the amount of concurrent uh, Lambdas that you have at the same time. That's one way. And you can limit it to one. And mm -hmm. that's the, the one that is handling the right the kind of state or then you can do something more stateful and use like a dynamo table to make sure you know how many connections you have open so you know how many calls you can do per minute so it depends on 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 how you need to do that also you can use something more like step functions or something that is a little bit more controlled but i think if it's an easy call just have one or two lambda functions calling and then you will not kill it depending on how many if you have 10 then maybe it's hard <laughs> if you have 10 per second but if you have I don't know, 100 or 200 per second. Then that's Ooh, this is a party now. Oh, oh. <laughs> we need a bigger screen. Hello, everyone. Hey, Ricardo. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. I've, I've just been listening and uh, uh, I've been commenting in the uh, Twitch chat, but uh, it's been great so far listening, listening to how you've all been asked, answering the questions. So I'm also a serverless fan as well. So it's a great, uh, great to learn from the experts like you, Marcia. <laughs> so, Ricardo, tell us who you are and what are you doing here? So, hello, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Ricardo Suarez. I'm an advocate for open source. So, why, am I, why I'm here? Uh, I'm here because I've got uh, insatiable curiosity and I wanted to find out what people were talking about, what questions they had. And if anyone who's watching has got anything, any questions uh, around open source or any of the open source services we've got or just open source in general, then please ask away and I will try and help you. Yeah, so, so Ricardo is our developer advocate focused on open source. Uh, so any, anything regarding AWS and open source or open source projects or how can you, uh, how can AWS open source help you? Because I believe we have a thing, um, I, know, I don't know the name, how we can help open source projects on AWS, right? There's a, a, pr a program um, that can do that as well, right? That's right. Yeah, it's the yeah. AWS promotional credits for open source. And if you just do Google that, you'll find the blog post that gets, gives you all the links mm. and, and everything to, to yeah. so that, yeah. Absolutely. Good call there, Darko. Or is it Cobus? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we may never know. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> but also, uh, we uh, uh, Ricardo does a weekly uh, blog post uh, on open source, basically what's new on open source on AWS. So um, dev.2 slash AWS uh, is the blogging platform, uh, and you can check it out uh, there. You, well, besides Ricardo's post, there's a lot of other things there as well. So, but uh, make sure to check it out. So, um, uh, yeah. so, oh, we have Martin in the chat as well. Okay, Martin says so far. Do you want to show him, Martin? Are you bored? Do you want to join us, Martin? Yeah. Okay. Have a mic on. Join. We're going to invite Martin as well. Like, give me a yeah. second. Martin, come join us. Uh, this is this is a proper party line right now because yeah. we have twenty, well, nineteen minutes remaining. Uh, so join in, and uh, uh, Martin is our .NET uh, developer advocate. And he has hair, so mm. it's easy to know who. And he has hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, so far we're outnumbering the hair people. You know so. exactly, exactly. Yeah, Just get the we, had, out. We, had, we had Sohan. Sohan was a mix of two. Sohan both had a beard and hair, so mm. um, it's uh, we we try to we try to balance it out. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But when I showed it was Darko, Kobus, and Steven. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> and and she hit us with, I'm not Darko, I'm not Kobus, I'm not Steven. I've got hair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry, on that quickly, you will love this. So my nephew, when he was about two and a half, three, we were playing and there was a Batman mask. So I grabbed the Batman mask and I'm like, haha, I'm Batman. He looks at me, mm -mm. <laughs> Bruce Wayne has hair. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> That's how it goes. 
<laughs> I, I was on a, a meeting with Kobus, was it yesterday? And I was wearing my glasses and he texts me, Kent. And I was like, Kent, what does Kent mean? He goes, yeah, you're Clark Kent, you're Superman. It's like, what are you talking about? You superhero obsessed. There we go. <laughs> uh, Ricardo, did you uh, have a chance to watch our Dev Day yesterday? Because I, I recall that you didn't deliver a session yesterday on Dev Day, but uh, did I you didn't. have a chance? I didn't, oh. and I'm sad about that. Um, mm. So I, 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 I didn't see any of the sessions. I did, I did watch the um, the tweet. So, um, uh, okay. and I'm really keen to check out your Dev Tools uh, session, actually, Darko, because okay. um, Dev Tools is is, is, a, is an area that's quite. Yeah, I'm not a developer by background, right? But I've been mm -hmm. exploring and experimenting with some of the Dev Tools in the open source space, such, yeah. such as um, AWS CDK, and I've really fallen in love with CDK. It's um, it's I'm finding it so so addictive and. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, what, what I'm finding really interesting is um, uh, how the community and how our customers are taking it in completely uh, different and unexpected directions. So we've got, um, you know, valid. yeah, from CDK, we've got, uh, you know, CDK8, which allows you to, you know, synthesize Kubernetes configuration files, Terraform uh, uh, yeah. configuration files with uh, TF. CDK, so it's, I'm I'm kind of like quite into that at the moment. So yeah. I'm looking forward to checking out your session as well as the other sessions, of course. I must say, when it comes to CDK, Don't one of the best things is now. yeah, one of the th <laughs> best things about CDK and op open source is the CDK patterns, which basically gives mm. you enables you to build yeah. specific patterns of your infrastructure of things you build and share it with the wide audience. I think that's just a great thing yeah, yeah. I, I like about that mm. big shout out to matt for that matt coulter who's uh been driving a lot of that stuff he's yeah. doing he's doing a fantastic job matt, matt yeah matt has done a great job on that thing and i'll say uh when it comes to my developer talk my developer talk my talk uh it's called, it's called developer tools but i i talk about the least thing you expect because when you talk about developer tools people are like oh well it's cicd I don't mention CI/CD once. I Good. mentioned in the beginning that I'm not going to talk about CI/CD, so I talk about your text editor and I talk about uh, X-Ray and Code oh. Guru a bit. So, it's, but, but those I think are developed. IDI tools. is a great part of your development pipeline, hmm. so it's great that you have some. That's concepts. the that's the place you, where you begin. Where do you start your development in your editor? And one point I like to take across, and this has been this is not my idea. This is somebody has mentioned it before, but you need to fail fast in a positive way. So failing in staging environment is bad because you had to wait X amount of time for fail. Failing inside of your text editor is the best way to fail because you can fix it immediately. So having all the tools and bells and whistles inside of your text editor or IDE is the thing that helps you uh, debug troubleshoot and you do, want, you do not want to debug Lambda functions once they're deployed, let's call it that way. So, <laughs> so can I ask a question then, uh, Doc, on, on that? When when you're talking about you know shifting that left, okay, where where do you kind of draw the line? Because obviously you know that you, you can mock um, some AWS services. A lot of them, in fact, there's some tools out there to do that. But how, how when do you take the decision, okay, as to what you you set up locally so you can mock any any dependent APIs you're you might be calling that kind of thing? So is there a is there a way to approach that? Uh, you know, is that, are there any best practices that any of you guys have um, have can share? On that, mm, hmm. where would I draw the line? Uh, I would say that I would say I would draw the line um, in convenience, right? Where convenience ends. I, I find it very mm -hmm. convenient to test my Lambda functions and API gateways locally. I wouldn't like to spin up local virtual machines that do some complicated things like emulating mm -hmm. queues or something like that. I would have a even when I say locally. Now, the term locally uh, has shifted. When I say local development, I mean development inside of your local AWS account. So yes, you're doing it on a workstation, but you're working it in a sandbox account where you can just play around with things. Oh, okay. uh, so I would say that, that I would have a, I would, I, I advocate for an account per developer uh, and having an account where you can just burn things, right? Uh, and try to do, try to replicate as much as possible as for production as you can. Um, and Fun fact, that's how we do it in NBS. Every, every developer has an account. Um, so uh, you basically, that's that's somehow how it, and then when you have to do integration, that's where you, uh, I would say, move up the chain and do integration. Yeah, but I think also, that's kind of super interesting to have in one account per developer. That's something, because infrastructure is ephemeral, and if you do it as infrastructure as code, you can remove it after you finish. So awesome. it doesn't cost anything. It's not like in the prehistoric no. times that you need to have give things to the developer. Now you give the account, and in that way, you empower the developers to learn and to feel confident. So it's all games. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. But I, again, I, I, one of the thing, one of the one of the experiences I have from my customers is that sometimes when developers work on on like a, a common account, they're afraid. Uh, they're afraid to break something, or they're afraid. Oh, somebody's gonna see me mm. launch an easy to instance, woo, and we're doing serverless, like those kind of things. And having a kind of a freedom to just mm. uh, ravage your account and do whatever you want that gives you this um, um, unfettered way of, of 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 just playing with things. And I think playing is. Uh, uh, as kids learn stuff while they play, as cubs learn stuff as they play, developers should also mm. learn stuff as they play. So, and you but know I mean, better than me, but I'm pretty sure cool. that when you are organiz- uh, creating an organization and having all this account, you can put wire rails on how oh, yeah, yeah, what yeah. the developers can do. So it's not that you are giving the free credit card to all your developers to do whatever. There is limits that are kind of controlled by the organization. So it's. Freedom with boundaries. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Guardrails, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's I, 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 mean, I, was, I was learning about service catalog yesterday, actually, and how how people are using service catalog in conjunction with things like AWS organizations to uh, effectively give give their developers these accounts with kind of pre-configured uh, sort of toolboxes, right? So just the services that, that, that an organization thinks you need to use and the right guardrails to make it really easy and to scale that to you know, lots of developers rather than doing it, you know, individually um, uh, for each one. I would and say I, the, sorry, so I, got, go ahead. Sorry, Chris was going to say something. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I love, I love going back to your point about spinning up real resources because, you know, I've worked in teams where you, you go to a lot of trouble of mocking up stuff and just spin up a, a DynamoDB and then just actually connect to it and put yeah. data into it. Why not just, it's just so much easier. Mm. I, I agree. I, like I agree. That. I agree with that fully. Yeah. Tear it down afterwards. Yeah, and I think that's why I, I love, I, you know, by experimenting with, uh, you know, CDK and this whole move to immutable infrastructure means that it's super easy to do, right? You can just take the script, put it in your account, and then easily, you know, bring up your your environment so you can test against. Mm. It's actually one of my favorite interview questions is when I chat to people, I um, used to ask them, well, pre AWS because we do interviews a bit differently, is like, tell me about something that you broke, um, yeah. because. If you can, if you can't, don't have examples, I immediately know that you aren't experimenting yeah. and you aren't actually really building mm-hmm. code. Because I mean, even if you're just writing code in the same system day by day, you would have made a mistake somewhere. Yeah. Um, and then it's okay, cool. Tell me what you learned from it. How did yeah. you fix it? What 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 was the issue? And like, because that's how you figure out someone's thought pattern as well, which is sometimes more important than what skills do you currently have. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Uh, and 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 like my favorite feature, my favorite feature of infrastructure as code is the ability to destroy things like the ability to roll back <laughs> because yes it's fine to it's fine to deploy things excellent but it's much more difficult to clean up things so yeah. um, and and by you know having a system where you would like i i come from a, you know i used to learn stuff by running virtual machines on my laptop and a bunch of computers and it was always let me set something up new and you launch a bunch of virtual machines install all the software it takes you a day to do that and then it takes a day to find what you need to clean up because you don't need all of that, uh, or you need it maybe. <laughs> if you want to run it again, that's a problem. So uh, the ability to just run CDK delete or destroy or just delete a CloudFormation template is just the thing that gives you the ability like, okay, I broke something, wait, 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 just destroy, launch again, and let's see how it works. So experimentation is good. <laughs> and if you have any questions, we have 10 minutes left, so. Yes, yes. feel so free to ask us. Until Monday. That's why we're currently doing oh, yeah. random chat yeah. So as I, as I, you know, sort of recapping yesterday's um, your sessions because I, because I missed them. What were the highlights then? What, what, what you know, if, if I'm, if I'm watching this and I, I need to go and check out the sessions, can you give me a, a quick overview of what sessions we had and, uh, you know, what we covered? The first one was what? Oh, Martin! Oh my gosh! We got the yes, we got yeah. the piece online. Hello. Now we've made it. We've got a celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> You wish, Darko keeps you wish. getting smaller and smaller. I keep getting smaller. <laughs> you just move away further away. Oh, no, wait, that's Cobus, but it says not. Oh, it says not, Darko. Got you. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, now it's confusing. Darko Now Darko. it's confusing. Exactly. And if we do this, you know. Um, oh. So who wants to answer? Uh, first of all, before we answer Ricardo's question about what is the highlight of yesterday, um, Martin, can you introduce yeah. yourselves to the wider audience here? I'm also a developer advocate. Um, I am one with hair um, from. <laughs> one of the one with hair. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fading, but I'm not quite. So I'm not quite as uh, I'm not quite as um, senior yet. As I lose the hair, I become more senior, and then yeah. hopefully one day I'll I'll mark I'll be 
Darko or it not It migrates Darko. to this part, really. <laughs> it migrates. It needs yeah. to migrate. That's the thing. So, so, so I, I, since you're saying senior, I just have to point out that someone this morning said Darko and I look the same, except Darko looks 10 years older or looks older <laughs> than I am. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but to, to be fair, you don't actually know if he was talking about you. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> So Martin is our uh, .NET developer advocate. So he yeah. does all things related to .NET. Um, so yeah, um, welcome. Yeah. We have never had you on stream. No, it, it's a first time for me. It's a, and it's wonderful to have joined this with uh, five minutes notice. I was like literally setting up my <laughs> webcam, trying to set up my system, which I've not used for like a week and a half. So yeah, I finally got there. So it's good. This is good, by the way. This I like this StreamYard thing that you're using. It's, yeah. it's so easy. Yeah, we it really it, is. We, yeah. we use it quite often, and you can, you know, one of the things we have here, we can uh, pop in like questions like this, and you can see it on screen, and there's no 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 complicated requirements, and you have six people on at the same time. Ten or ten. Wow. We can get up to it's ten. Like, yeah. oof, mm. Party. Wow. Five minutes left. Five minutes yeah. left. <laughs> <laughs> so time to time to ask all the questions. Uh. Is, is, Jeff, if, is one of the Jeffs from AWS available just to jump on stream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, party line, as they call it. Okay, so Andy as well. Andy, yeah. <laughs> so one of the questions Ricardo had, uh, what's the highlight of yesterday? And uh, Martin, I'm not sure if you watched uh, our dev day yesterday uh, because I know you didn't present, but uh, um, if you had a chance to view something on, on, on that thing. But... Um, yeah, so Alex, Alex is, um, I, I watched uh, a few of them. Uh, Alex's uh, talk on step functions was really good. I, I'm, I must admit that I'm not that big. I'm a, I'm a relatively large user of Lambda, but not step functions, to be honest with yeah. you. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, some of it I knew already, but it's nice sometimes just to hear someone else explain it again. It kind of helps with my understanding of something. So yeah, I, I thought Alex Casablani, he's a great speaker anyway. So that was a great yeah. uh, talk. Same for me when it comes to step functions. Like step functions for me, I know how they work and the, what they should do, but never ever have I used them. They're like, amazing. Yeah, I know what they can do, but like I have not had a chance to to implement them myself uh, as I have not built built complicated things enough on on on, on serverless uh, before. Um, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. Remember, the big benefit there is that it auto uh, it abstracts away the error handling for you because you literally okay. in the JSON file when you define how your state machine works, it says on success call this. On failure, call this. Retry okay. logic. Retry three times, then do this. It's literally that's the big benefit. It's like instead of doing all of that kind of coding okay. in your, your code, it's mm. yeah. It's like and remember, you can call other things. It doesn't have to be lambda yeah. functions. You can call SageMaker. You can call a codable job. There's like a million things you can do there. One I of think... my favorite things from step functions is the way that you can parallelize lambda execution mm -hmm. and then grab all the results and put them to the next mm. function. And that's so simple to do with some functions that if you want to do that manually, you will just. Mm. I, I, I wrote, a, I wrote a, a system one time where I had to, I had a big um, audio file and it was like about 30 minutes long. And I needed to to, um, to send it to get, uh, to, get uh, to an AI service, to get, uh, you know, the words out of that audio stream. And to do it, thank you very much someone <laughs> telling me. <laughs> But that's a good control. that's a good new name to get oh, the, the service that to get the audio the words uh, yeah if only we had the service called that yeah so anyway uh, <laughs> transcribe, if we uh, take transcribe so uh, but i i had this big massive audio file and at the time the transcribe so service didn't last for up to 30 minutes so i needed to like split up um my files and as soon as so i had to like take a big long audio chunk i had to split it up into 30 different chunks i had to put that into an s3 bucket i then had to go in um, event that that had taken place, then transcribe each file individually, and then bring it all back together. And the app, the, the job of trying to manage all of that was just yeah. a nightmare. And I did all this before I'd ever looked into step functions. But now looking at step functions, I'm thinking that would have been such a simpler process. The transcribe is now capable of doing 30 minutes long, so it's uh, not a problem. But yeah, yeah the amount of code <laughs> I wrote which I didn't need to write. Yeah. But also step functions do does things not related to the technology. You can actually assign manual tasks like test in like just generic workflows. Like you can create a workflow that somebody needs to send out a package and it, it lasts like, one year. The exactly. Workflow. It can last for one year. Like if you have a workflow that lasts one year. Mm. Yeah. 
<laughs> rethink things uh, unless you're oh, growing yeah. crops or Maybe something. you have some other type of workflows that are not only technological. That's kind of Fair the point. thing with set functions. But... The thing is, I don't like to say that something's possible unless I've tried it myself. So have you actually yeah. tried uh, this one year delay on a lab? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the longest demo. Like, I'm going to demonstrate the one year <laughs> delay function on a step function, right? On a Twitch stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on a Twitch stream. <laughs> uh, Awesome. So, um, okay, Ooh. we. Oh, I'm gonna have to drop off. Folks. Yeah, yeah, we're all gonna have to drop off because it's it's the top of the hour. Uh, it's yeah. been four hours on stream. This has oh been the, the it's mega like a stream telethon. here. <laughs> yeah, telethon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, send your money uh, here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all for uh, for joining the stream, and we can see that Mo Mo Kobus has stopped his movie recording. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I warned you. This is old camera. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a clue. It's not really real. So actually, yeah. it's it's Darko's got a feed. A Kobus exactly. Feed. <laughs> <laughs> With AI. Yeah, yeah Kobus is using that AI yeah. thing that makes faces. Yes. Uh, so, um, <laughs> thank you all for joining. Thank you all for the questions, and thank you all for, for uh, lovely our developer advocates for joining us mm. and, and contributing. Um, yeah. Mostly, thank you to the audience uh, for well bearing with us, watching, uh, well listening to our bald people jokes and um, and and talking talking about AWS. And thank you all for joining the AWS Dev Day yesterday. Now, if you have registered, mm. the recording should be out later on today. So make sure to monitor your email as it may come in a wave. Um, mm. So if you're interested in that, do check it out. If you want to hear more from us, every Monday and Friday we have a stream at the same-ish time at 11 a.m. C Central European time or South African time on the same place. Um, and also, well, yeah, uh, follow Wednesday us. Wednesday 11. Wednesday 11. Thursday, and, uh, Thursday yeah, mm. a lot. Every day of the week there is <laughs> every someone day of the week. live streaming around yeah. midday. Exactly. So uh, thank you all. And um, I wish you all... Uh, Lovely weekend because hey, it's the weekend. So, <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.